Um, otherwise, I want to welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. I haven't done one of these two and a half day workshops in quite a while. I, I shouldn't say I haven't done. I haven't done one that wasn't, let's say, marketed to the general public. I've done many that are that are for you know trading companies and brokerage firms. One of the reasons why uh, I like the idea of videoing this is because um, I don't really plan on doing this maybe again for a while. Uh, there's other other areas that I want to move off into, mostly just to concentrate on my own trading. And um, so having this videotape will make it. Uh, easy for me to just direct somebody to this. In other words, they call, they want a workshop, and I say, "Hey, that's great. Get the video, and you know, you you'll get what you need." And speaking of getting what you need, I want you guys to first of all understand or know that uh, there's plenty of time built in to this for to answer your questions. So I am encouraging you to make comments and to ask questions. As a matter of fact, I mean, I'm looking at this as a creative experience in the way that all of you came here for a specific reason, maybe many reasons. You have your own purposes for being here. I presume, based on how the workshop was marketed in the first place, that your primary consideration or primary purpose for being here is to create greater degrees of consistency with your trading. This is what this workshop is all about. It's about creating consistency. And as all of you well know, that's not an easy task for what we've chosen to do. I think all of you also probably know, and I don't know what the experience level is of this group. I mean, I know some of the people in this group have been in the business for a long time. There's other people that I've never met before. But I assume that, that all of you have experienced what I'm going to call this kind of reality gap between what you realize as being possible from the market. In other words, what we're looking at is this kind of unlimited potential to, let's say, enrich ourselves. And the difference between what we can perceive and see as unlimited potential to enrich ourselves and what we end up with on our bottom line. And there could be a huge gap there. And so what I'm going to do in the next two and a half days, and it will go very fast, it really will. But what I'm going to do in the next two and a half days is give you a very detailed and comprehensive blueprint on how to close that gap. At the same time, it's, I want you to keep something in mind that because you're here and because you're exposing yourself to this information, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to utilize it or utilize it right away. You may find that a lot of the stuff that you're going to hear in the next two and a half days, you might not really want to act on or do anything about for quite a while. And uh, like an example I can give you in my own personal life is that there are many times that I felt compelled to buy books and you know just kind of just you know just kind of just skim them a little bit see the potential that may be in that book and yet not be ready to read it for several years later. That's happened many times in my life. And when the time was right, it's like I found myself reaching for that particular book and, and, and got into it and stayed into it until I, you know, gleaned whatever it is that was in it that I needed out of it. And you might find that to be the case with this workshop. So just keep that in mind that you don't, just because of something that you're going to hear this weekend, that, that may, you know, may excite you even. Because there can be a huge gap between what we desire and what we're capable of manifesting for ourselves. And that's, and that's basically what this really is all about. And it may take years. And it's what, it's, I guess the way I like to describe that particular, I guess when I say it may take years, is it's like, it's like it's what I call psychological distance. Psychological distance is very abstract and it's extremely difficult to measure. Meaning that if um, there is an ideal mindset that we're going to talk about, that this is the blueprint I'm going to give you. There's an ideal mindset for creating consistent results as a trader. That's our goal, let's say. Our goal is to, to get to that ideal mindset right here, okay? 
And what am I? And, and even when I when I say consistency, what am I talking about? Am I talking about never having a loss again? Uh, what? Appar no, apparently no. I'm not talking about never having a loss again. But I am talking about an equity curve that basically, you know, that that you get this nice. Nice gentle rise, or even even you know, let's put it this way: a nice slope on an equity curve that doesn't reflect trading errors. We're going to have losses, but that's a lot different than an equity curve that looks something like this. Okay, and then you work on it a little bit more, and, and you got one of these again. These kinds of huge dips or drop-offs in our equity curve are always going to be the result of trading errors of one way of one type or another. I know it's very easy to say no, it was the market conditions that did this to me. But if you investigate these situations much closer, you're going to find that they're always going to be the result of a trading error of some sort. If we just eliminated our trading errors from our trading probably with the kind of experience levels that, that, that exist in this group. And what I mean by experience levels are just the, you know, your ability to read the markets, your ability to identify an edge. I would bet that if you went back and really, truly scrutinized your trades and eliminated or had a way of at least having, let's say, having the kind of, uh, having the kind of diary or information about your trades where you could go back and say, you know what, if, if I didn't make this error, this error, this error, and this error, instead of my equity curve looking like this, it would look like that. Now there is an ideal mindset to create this. This is the blueprint I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a blueprint for that ideal mindset. But we're talking about, the problem here is that we're talking about psychology. We're talking about mental makeup. These are not things that we typically grow up learning how to work with. We don't go through grade school getting psychology courses. We don't even really get, you know, probably good psychology. Maybe today they, the kids in high school might. I don't really know. I didn't in high school. And I don't even think the, the psychology courses in many colleges are probably that good because they're perpetuating what people did 100 years ago instead of really, in many cases, being creative and, and finding things that work, really work today. So since we're talking about our mental makeup, we're going to have to learn some skills. We're going to have to learn skills to bridge, let's say, this gap between, let's see, where someone might be here and this distance to this psychological, let's say, this is the psychological distance to this particular mindset that they're trying to acquire. In essence, they're saying, I, I need to reinvent myself in some ways. Now, what does that distance mean? Well, it's very abstract. There's really no way to say that it has anything to do with linear inches or centimeters or whatever. It's more, I would say, it's more like software code. It would be, it would be saying, like, if I, had, if I had a software program that was consisted of a million lines of code, and that code was virtually perfect, except that it had one period out of place in one line, and that, and that, and let's say, and that, particular software program ran perfectly under virtually all circumstances except one particular circumstance in which that one period that's out of place caused the whole thing to shut down and, and a catastrophic and, and cause a catastrophic shutdown. Okay? Now you could say, if you want to equate this to psychological distance, you could say that that what's the distance between between, let's say, where that person's at and the ideal or most perfect mindset, just one period away, right? The problem is finding that particular line so, and knowing how to fix the error. It would be, there's, there's a, uh, there was another analogy where, um, that I read many years ago, I don't remember what book it was in, but, uh, you know, there, there was something wrong with, uh, some, uh, the plumbing in, in a hospital, okay? And so they called the, the hospital called the plumber. And the plumber went down to the basement of the hospital and he was looking at virtually acres of pipes. 
and he, you know, and he's walking, he's touring, touring the bottom of the, you know, this, the, you know, the, of the hospital, and he's looking around, and he takes out his wrench from his, you know, from his belt, and he starts, you know, tapping on a valve here and tapping on a valve there, and you know, and he, and he, he thinks about it a little bit, and, and then all of a sudden he takes this one valve and he just gives it a whack, and everything runs perfectly. So, he went back, sent the hospital a bill, and he sent him a bill for a thousand dollars. And the hospital administrator called him up and said, hey, what's going on? <laughs> you know, you're only down here for a half an hour, and, uh, you know, I saw you. You took, a, you took a, a wrench out of your belt, and you wrapped, you know, you, you whacked this one valve, and, and, you know, and everything ran perfectly. I mean, come on, $1,000. He said, okay, I'll revise the bill. So he sent him a revised bill. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> $10 for whacking the valve. $990, $990 for knowing where to whack. <laughs> okay? What we're dealing with here is a lot like that. You could only be, there could be a person in this room, and I know Jake's hoping he's that person, but there could be a person in this room who's only one period away, just one flaw away from that ideal mindset. But fly, finding the flaw and fixing the flaw could take a long time in terms of the kind of expertise that you may need to acquire to be able to do it. Just because you have to get used to working inside your own mental environment. It doesn't have to be hard. It really doesn't. And there are the things that we're going to talk about and techniques that I'm going to give you that make it as easy as possible. Most of it just has to do with your willingness. Most of the reason why people are even willing to come to a workshop like this is because of the extreme frustration that they experience between that reality gap that I mentioned a little while ago. That reality gap of, I know these, I know these unlimited riches are available. They're possible. They're here. I smell it. I taste it. So I'm so close to it most of the time. But I still can't get it, you know, I still can't, can't bridge that gap between what I know is there and, and the reality of, of, you know, the bottom line of my, my, uh, my statement. So I am assuming that's why you're here. Am I, did I assume correctly? Everyone's here for the same reason then, right? Okay. So if you've got questions, I want you to ask those questions. If you've got comments, I want you to make the comments. There is only, there's just one thing that I ask of you, and that if I'm on a roll delivering material, just wait until I'm done, and then ask the question. Because a lot of times, once I get on a roll delivering material, and if you break my train of thought, and sometimes it's really difficult to get back to where it was. And the other thing, too, is that when we take breaks, let's break okay let's take a break don't ask me your question on the break one because we're taking a break because I need the break <laughs> number one okay <laughs> number two most of the time people ask the best questions during lunches and during breaks they make the best comments during lunches and during breaks and so what I wish that you would do is is save it and share it with the rest of the group and share it with the people who are going to be watching this video. Because I'm sure that we've got, you know, a, a relatively uh, uh, good cross-section of people and your questions are probably going to be the same kind of questions that, that people, you know, are going to be asking about how to get through this material and how to understand it. And so not only will you be doing yourself a favor, but you'll be doing them a favor, too. Go ahead. Well, well I can't see your name. John Daggett. John, you don't have to give me. That's all right. Okay, John, go ahead. Uh, do you find in going through this process that people will get an aha moment of where that period is, that within that training mentality, within that blueprint, that I can be tracked back to outside of the training environment? I'm not sure if I know what you mean by outside of a training environment. What do you mean? Oh, absolutely, and sure. Yes, 
as a matter of fact, that's what you're going to find anyway. You're going to find that, that when it comes to creating consistency, it has to do, it, it really has to do with, with how you live your life. It has virtually, I haven't met anybody yet, and I'm not saying this kind of a person doesn't exist. I've met people who are close to it. I, I don't know, I can't tell you how many traders I've actually worked with as a trading coach since I started doing this in 1982. And, and back then, uh, I, was, I was mostly working with floor traders in Chicago. I was, I was hired by uh, clearing firms to, um, um, clearing firms to, to work with their floor traders. I mean, these are, these are guys that traded in the, uh, you know, like uh, in, in the grain pits and the T-bond pits and in the, the S&P pits and the meat pits at the Chicago Board of Trade, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. They trade for their own accounts. And what would happen, especially back in the 80s when things were a lot looser back then, it's not like what it is today. Well, uh, a lot of these clearing firms were like families. And, um, and since these guys were trading their own accounts, uh, if they went debit, the, the people that owned the clearing firms would usually carry them. So they'd let them carry a $50,000 or $100,000 debit, and you know, the guy would work the debit off, and you know, he might get profitable and then go debit again. And, and that's, that's basically the way the cycle ran until you know, I kind of came along, and you know, they found out about me, and they hired me to, to help these guys you know, work their way out of their debits and to stay out of their debits. And that way, everyone, everyone was benefited because not only the trader, but the clearing firm you know, theoretically had less risk. So I've worked with a lot of traders. I have yet to really meet somebody who had the kind of, let's say, mind that was so comp compartmentalized, that was so divided, that under, let's say, probably the psychiatric industry would call like maybe a true schizophrenic, where they were so compartmentalized that, that what they did in their personal life didn't affect their trading. Did you get what I just said? That what they did in their personal life did not affect their trading. And it always astounded me, as a matter of fact. What really astounded me was, was, was how many traders didn't think that there was a connection. I mean, it was just, just, it, it just amazed, it amazed, it amazed me, you know, working with these guys who would literally, you know, walk out the front door, be screaming at their wife and their kids, kick the dog, you know, <laughs> and, you know, go down to the pit and have their worst, have their worst day, you know, in a year or whatever. It just, and, and they didn't make the connection, you know, it, it was bizarre. To me, it was so obvious that, you know, but it wasn't to them. And that's one of the things I help them do is make that kind of connection. So a lot of, a lot of what you're going to find that, that it takes to just create consistency is, is developing an, an increased awareness, an increased awareness of what you're thinking in any given moment. And having a way to gauge your state of mind. Having a way to gauge your state of mind so that you know if you're in the best state of mind to be trading in any given moment or any given day or any given hour. Because if you had a way to gauge that, and let's say you, you weren't addicted to trading in ways that would prevent you from tra not trading, put it that way, not trading, because in many cases you're going to find that not trading is like putting money in the bank. Literally. Let's say this again. Not trading is like putting money in the bank. Because there will be times, there will be times that you will be in a state of mind that I could virtually guarantee that no matter what your system, no matter what your methodology says, no matter what your system says, it won't make any difference. You will lose money. You can recognize these kinds of states of mind in advance. And that's one of the things you're going to learn how to do this weekend. Well, at least I'm going to give you the tools to learn how to do it. And like I said, if you're not addicted to trading in ways that would prevent you from not trading, then what you do is just not trade. And you're making money. You're not trading and you're making money. Yeah, exactly. Right. Did everybody hear? Can, can did you guys hear that on the tape? That was one of the problems with overtrading, where, where there's no action. You're trying to force a trade. See, there are. And I'm sorry, I didn't. I can't see your name. You don't have your John. Another John. Okay. Um, yeah, John. Uh, 
See, there, there is a way that you can learn to recognize when you're forcing a trade. Instead of after the fact, you can learn to recognize it before the fact. But the problem, again, is that, is that there, are, there may be, if you're, let's say, if you have a tendency to overtrade, your, your, your tendency to overtrade may have something to do with some other aspect of your life that really doesn't have anything to do with trading at all. And so when I, so when I made the comment earlier about, about what consistency really consists of, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's again, the, there's these underlying principles that you're going to have to integrate into your mind so that you can create those kind of consistent results. But, but in essence, it really boils down to how you live your life. And what the interesting part about all this, this is the great part, okay? Not the great part. The interesting part is, is that, is that you don't have to, all this stuff that we're going to learn in the next two and a half days, all this stuff that we're going to go through, you don't have to know any of it to put on a winning trade. Do you? Absolutely none of it. None. Zero. You can make all the mistakes in the world from, let's say, from, from the things that we're going to learn and talk about, we would call categorize as a mistake, and you know what? You can do it, and it can still turn out to be a winning trade, right? That's the problem. See, the problem is, in the, that's the problem with doing this work, is that this work can be difficult. And you're just always one trade away, one win, winning trade away of convincing yourself that you don't have to do it. <laughs> that's right that's right you can be making every mistake in the book and still be winning you don't have to know anything about yourself you don't have to know anything even about the markets to put on a winning trade I've worked with many traders who started their trading career, and I, when I say they knew nothing, I literally mean they knew nothing. It just so happened that the first trade they put on was a winner. They said, okay, I'm going to buy. And it went up. And they had like, I've seen streaks of 15, 16 winning trades in a row from people who knew nothing. Now, you can put on one trade and not know anything. You can put on two, you can put on three. But eventually, the streak's going to end. And we know that it's going to end. It's because eventually, what's going to happen is that person's going to make an error. Generally, it's going to be a money management error, meaning that if I'm on a winning streak, I'm going to get to the point where I think I'm invincible. And as a result, instead of trading, let's say, 1,000 shares, well, next time I, I decide to trade, I'll put on 10,000 shares. And now, if the market just even goes against me a little bit, a tiny, tiny bit, it, you know, I can go and stay into a state of mind freeze, which is something I've never experienced, right? And all of a sudden, whack, you know, wham, I'm just like, I'm totally paralyzed because this is just something I didn't anticipate or expect, and then lose a ton of money. And then say, well, okay, well, gee, gee, if I could make money and I didn't know anything, just think about, well, if, if I learned something about the market, how much money I could make? And so I start buying books and start buying trading systems. And start going to seminars, trying to learn all about the market. In essence, trying to, trying to keep from, trying to learn about the market in a way that would keep that from happening again, when it never had anything to do with the market in the first place, ever. And that's what's really frustrating about all this, is that, is that why, that's why you see people who are absolutely wonderful analysts that can literally call market moves with, with uncanny accuracy, but make the absolute worst traders imaginable. <laughs> so that was kind of just the, the beginning house, housekeeping stuff, okay? I, just that I want to encourage you guys to ask questions because your questions are going to shape this experience. It, it really is. This, it's your questions and comments that are going to shape this. And, and I, like I said, I've got, we've got a ton of material to get through. I've, you know, I've got this, this organized or, let's say, structured in a way where we will get through all the material no matter what. That's why I usually start on a Friday night and, and go for you know, two and a half or three hours just to make sure because, uh, because sometimes it can get a little tight on Sunday afternoons if, if I didn't do the Friday night thing. 
and again, depending on how much, how many questions people have and, and how much they participate. But I do encourage it, but like I said, if you would just, if I'm on a roll and, and you wanna just wait until after that, after that's over with, uh, that, that I would appreciate. So anybody have any questions right now? We're all set? Okay. So basically, what, what I've kind of boiled, what I've kind of done is, is, is boiled trading down. Uh, by the way, guys, is, can I walk back there? Can I walk? Yes. Okay. How far can I walk? You tell me. You're still good. Tell me. That doesn't look that great. No? Okay. <laughs> so no, about, from, about right here, right? Well, you just, if, when you get in front of the projector, it's not the greatest. Okay. Right about from here to here then? Yeah. Okay. So you can keep going to the right as far as you want. Oh, okay. Good. Like about right here. Yeah, your left. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, see, uh, see, the other thing about the other room is that I wouldn't have these bright lights in, in my eyes because they had higher ceilings, but I wanted you guys to have these good chairs. I really did. <laughs> yeah, it really does. It, it makes a huge difference. So I just, you know, I thought, okay, I'll put up with the lights. They get the chairs because they won't move the chairs. I mean, this, these chairs belong in this room, and that's it, okay? And they're, all the hotels are like that. I, I, we, I, we run this kind, run this kind of crap all the time. Anyway, so... Um, Okay, so, so pretty much I boiled or, or, or kind of distilled trading down into four general skill sets that you have to acquire to be a consistently successful trader. First of all, you have to know how to identify an edge, don't you? Go ahead, John. Are you, where we're starting here, is there a page in the book where we're starting off? Yeah, that's, I'm, just, I'm in the introduction right now, and, and I will follow, the presentation will follow we just put this up there so they could, you know, they could, we're not here yet, okay? Oh, right. that, that, so don't worry about that. Um, however, I don't know if we should take a few minutes or not, even before I get going. Do you guys want to do that, that? There's only 13 questions on that attitude survey. Do you guys want to take about five minutes to do that? Just right at the beginning, right in the beginning of the book. Introduction. Introduction. Yeah. Yeah, attitude survey, right. Oh, second section. Sorry. New new workbook. Okay, so what I've done is basically I, I've broken this broken it down into into four general categories of skill sets. The first is learning to identify an edge. And that's the, that's the easiest part of this whole process of becoming a consistently successful trader and therefore the one that most people gravitate towards. Meaning they'll spend most of their time learning how to do that as opposed to the next skill set which is probably the most important if not the most important and that's learning how to think in the market's perspective or learning how to think in probabilities. And, and I would say that there isn't anyone in this room that doesn't understand the nature of probabilities. And I've, and I've worked with people who have um, who've, who've even majored or have degrees in, in probabilities in college, from college, and yet they still don't know how to think in probabilities. Because when you can think in probabilities, you will stop making, automatically stop making the kind of errors that will detract from your ability to be consistent. In other words, when you've effectively learned how to think in probabilities, it won't even occur to you not to predefine your risk. It won't occur to you not to cut your losses. It won't occur to you to even hesitate when, you're, when your edge roll, whatever you define or whatever criteria you use to define an edge shows up in the market. It won't even occur to you to jump the gun. Uh, it won't occur to you not to take profits or have a systematic way of, of taking profits. These things just will not happen because when you have effectively integrated into your mindset this ability to think in probabilities, it is completely inconsistent to do these things with this thinking methodology. The two are, are completely inconsistent with, with each other. This mindset won't let you behave that way. And that's basically where we're going to get to in this workshop. But, the other, but there are other problems, there are other areas. The other area, the next area, so we've got defining an edge, learning how to think in the market's perspective, and then the third one is um, learning how to identify and neutralize self-sabotaging beliefs. This is big. 
Here's the problem. The market represents an unlimited, literally unlimited opportunity to enrich ourselves. We all see it. It's there. It really is unlimited. Maybe there are some practical limitations, but for the most part, it's pretty unlimited. But that doesn't mean that the kind of things that we've accumulated, meaning the kind of beliefs that we've accumulated throughout our lives that exist in our mental environment are in complete harmony with our desire to create consistent results or to, or to tap into, let's say, that unlimited ability to enrich ourselves. In other words, not everything that we've learned will be, would argue for increased or vast riches or prosperity. Not only would it not argue for, it might argue completely against. These are things that we might be conscious of. In many cases, they are beliefs that we are not conscious of at all. But what we're going to learn tomorrow is that just because we're not conscious of something that we've learned at some point in our lives, it doesn't mean that it's not operational. It doesn't mean that it still doesn't have an effect on the way we perceive information and how we behave. And this, you know, th this is the area, learning to identify and neutralize self-sabotaging beliefs is an area that, that can take quite a bit of, bit of time to master. Um, can take quite a bit of expertise, as a matter of fact. Now, you might be saying to yourself, does that mean that I really, I mean, uh, what you're saying to me is that I, I really have to, have to, you know, kind of tear apart my identity or personality to be a consistently successful trader? No, you do not. You don't have to go through that process. But if you choose not to go through that process, then you're going to have to do something to compensate for it. You can create consistency without having to go through and identify every belief that, that might argue against increased prosperity or being, you know, accumulating more and more money as a trader, put it that way. But if you don't, and these kind of beliefs do exist, you will have to, have to adopt a trading regimen that compensates. And we'll talk more about that later on Sunday. Are you guys kind of with me on this stuff? OK. And then the next area, the fourth area, is euphoria. Euphoria is big. Euphoria is big. Now, just briefly, euphoria. Euphoria, let's say, is a, we know, there's, a, there's probably many ways that, that we can describe euphoria. The easiest way for me to describe it would be it's a riskless state of mind. So think about that. It is a state of mind in which we are, in which we have no ability to perceive risk. Okay? In a state of euphoria, nothing can go wrong, as far as we're concerned. Nothing. Now that, that's, Think about the implications of that word. Nothing can go wrong. Nothing. However, we all know the market may not agree with that. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the problem is that when you're in a state of euphoria, certainly you're it's, it's the least likely, you're least likely, it's virtually impossible to set any limitations on your behavior. Everyone seems, at least from my experience, everyone seems to have a different threshold for entering into that state of euphoria. And there is a threshold there. It's like there's, there's definitely a difference between confidence And euphoria. Okay, there's a threshold. Well, what's that? Confidence. C O what? Con? Yeah, that spelled it right, didn't it? I'm not a good speller, so you can you can get me on this real real easily. <laughs> anyway, there's there's a uh, 
there's definitely a threshold. I've worked with traders who can, who can flip into a state of euphoria on, on the first winning trade. Really. For most people, it takes more than just one winning trade. However, like I said, once you flip into that state of mind, and it is chemically based. I mean, it, you know, scientists have found that, that the chemicals that are in our brain when we're in a state of euphoria are, are very different than, you know, the, you know, the kind of endorphins that are, or not different, it's just that you've got an increased level of endorphins, I guess, that, that, are, that are flowing through your brain that cause you not to be able to perceive risk. And so what you're going to have to do, again, is, is develop or institute a trading regimen that compensates for this, meaning that you have to be able to recognize when you have flipped into a state of euphoria and then, what's even more important, be able to stop trading. Stop trading. I don't know of any other way to handle it. I really don't. After all these years of, of, of doing this and thinking about it, I mean, euphoria is a great place to be. There isn't any other state of mind that, that would be, let's say, that would be better than being in a state of euphoria. You just don't want to necessarily be in a state of euphoria while you're trading. Because the tendency would be to overtrade, it would be almost impossible to keep yourself from putting on a much larger position than what your money management, let's say whatever whatever money management guidelines you use, or wh whatever money management guidelines would call for in your particular situation. And if you do, and, and then of course as your size increases, then the market just you know the amount of distance the market has to move against you to cause you to flip in from euphoria into complete terror or mind freeze is just very tiny. So you go from this, you go from heaven to virtual in a state of mind that's heaven to hell in one instance just by having the market move a few ticks against you. And the problem is that this can create an enormous amount of psychological damage that's really hard to recover from. It's extremely difficult to recover from this. Not that it can't be done, but see the way most people look at this, most, most people look at this as like, like a supreme betrayal. It goes into a category in their mind where they were betrayed. And some people would even say that they were betrayed by God. Or even think that. It's very possible for people to think that. It can really be damaging. So you're kind, of, you're kind of all looking at me like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> so I'm going to give you some. I'm going to give you a framework to be able to recognize this. And if you think when, and now, when you think about this, if your objective, if what you're saying to yourself or me or whatever by being here, is that my objective is to create consistent results that depending on how strong that desire really is, will, will in essence be part of the tools that you will use to be able to recognize when you have actually flipped into that state of euphoria and say to yourself, you know what, I'm going to enjoy myself and the money that I've made getting there some other way other than trading. I'm going to stay in that state of mind, but I'm just going to be doing it with my friends or my family or my kids or whatever. Or maybe you guys are all looking at me like you, you know really what I'm talking I'm about. Trying here. To get you. <laughs> I'm what? trying to get to you for you. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to focus on in this workshop is we're going to focus on those last three skill sets. Okay, the question is, is there a psychological profile that would suggest that you shouldn't be a trader? 
Um, well, when you say psychological profile, I guess you're going to have to be more more specific. Do you mean personality types? Yeah. yeah. See, the problem with me answering that particular question is that I, I've never looked at personality types as being relevant. Yeah, I don't see. To me, personality. When 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 psychologists categorize people in personality types, to me it was like what they're doing is just making their job easier. They kind of pigeonhole people and, and sort of pigeonhole people in, into certain categories so, so that they don't really have to think about what it is that they need to do to help this person. So I never really, I've never really categorized anything in personality types at all. I categorize everything in terms of what people believe. Because, because from the way that I think and, and the way I've developed this material, you know, what we believe determines how we perceive information and how we behave. The decisions we make, how we feel about the results, and uh, you know, it's it doesn't really matter what kind of personality type that that psychologist would say that you have anyway. But is there? I mean, is there? Are there people, for example, if maybe to answer your question, are there people that I've met that seem to be more predisposed to being successful as opposed to say people that I've met that are predisposed to not being successful? Sure, people who are really rigid in their thinking really black and white, uh, you know, they have, you know, just have difficulty in terms of, of flexibility are, let's say, predisposed to not being able to think in probabilities very well. When people who are, let's say, predisposed to make money are those people who don't give a shit about money. In other words, uh, some of the best floor traders that I've ever worked with are floor traders that uh, it's just a game. The money is virtually irrelevant. And so when they put on trades and they put on the kind of size that they're putting on, it, it, it isn't, they don't think about it, the, let's say, the way that a normal person thinks about it. What's that? That's right. I, yeah, I was going to say that. And they love it. Yes. Absolutely. Because when you really get right down to it, you really got to love this. You really have to love it. People who are also predisposed to being successful are people who genuinely enjoy this. And enjoy it in a way where they're not, they're not necessarily addicted to it. There's a difference. Because when we talk about addictions, what we're really saying is that whenever we're operating out of an addiction, we're operating out of a state of choicelessness. All addictions create choicelessness. Not choice, but choicelessness. All addictions, we're, when we're operating out of, a, out of an addiction, we're operating out of choicelessness. In other words, the addiction will dictate how we see things and how we behave. And as traders, we have to be supremely flexible in terms of, in terms of what, we're, what we can do or not do. In other words, we always have to be acting in our own best interest at all times. And addictions will definitely cause us not to be, not to act in our own best interest at all times. Because we'll have to satisfy the addiction. What we, what, what we might have to do to be acting in our own best interest could be diametrically opposed to what our addiction says we have to do. That's what I'm saying. And so what's going to win is our addiction. So what we're talking about is, is, is really is thinking patterns that are, that are, let's say, extremely flexible. Extremely flexible and not caring about money. And not caring about losing. See, because what we're talking about is, is, is developing a carefree state of mind. A carefree state of mind with the kind of psychological resources where we're still at the same time always acting in our own best, always acting in, in our own best interest. So in other words, can I, can I interact with the market in a way where I don't need to use fear, think about this, I do not need to use fear to limit my behavior. Because that's the way it is with most traders. They have to use their fear of the market or their fear of what could happen to limit themselves. 
And that's exactly what we want to, what we want to eliminate. Is this ideal mindset that we're talking about doesn't have any fear. There's no fear of the market at all because it's really not the market anyway, it's ourselves. The reason why we fear the market is because we can't trust ourselves. Any fear that we have of the market is just simply a reflection of the fact that we can't trust ourselves. We can't trust ourselves to do what we need to do when we need to do it without hesitation, you know, without reservation or internal conflict or argument. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so I said before, we got those full, four broad skill sets. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to focus in on the last three. Learning how to think in probabilities, learning how to identify and neutralize self-sabotaging beliefs, and setting up a regimen so that you can recognize when you flipped into a state of euphoria. Now, um, and we're going to do this all within the context of the four developmental three developmental stages of a trader. Trading mechanically, trading subjectively, and trading intuitively. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all this information that, that, that we're going to go through tonight, uh, all day tomorrow, and then, and then part of the afternoon on Sunday, or part of the morning on Sunday, and I'm going to put it all within, all within this context. I'm going to put it all together within this context of trading mechanically, subjective, and intuitively. Because, and the reason why I do it this way is because Again, I don't know, I don't have a profile of, of people who attend this workshop, and I've gotten people who are novices all the way to people, the, the biggest trader I had was somebody that had a billion dollars under management. And uh, so, you know, everyone's at, at, at different levels of development in terms of what they need. And so there may be traders, you know, there may be people in this room that are, that are let's say, you know, uh, at a point where they can trade subjectively and are now, you know, getting really, are getting, you know, let's say a high volume of intuitive impulses about the nature of what the market's going to do. And so what I do is, is, is give you this, these skill sets for each one of these levels of development. Or these skills within each of those levels of, uh, levels of development. Chances are, however, if you haven't completely learned how to think in probability, you're going to end up in the mechanical stage of trading, regardless of how many years you've been doing this. And the reason why is because we're going to use, I'm going to teach you how to use the mechanical stage of trading to actually integrate all the principles of what it means to think in probabilities into your mental environment in a way where it becomes who you are, so that you no longer can make any trading errors where it virtually becomes impossible to make a trading error. And I really mean that. It becomes impossible to make a trading error. It's just not part of your identity. It's not part of who you are. So the only mechanical What's that? You mean financially? Well, well, I mean, oh. in, in being successful, well, it, you're implying that mechanical set of rules are such that you can use those successfully while you're trying No, I'm not necessarily. No, I'm not saying that you're trying to accomplish. I'm not saying that you have to try to do anything in terms of subjectively or intuitively. All I'm saying is that we will use. I will teach you how to use the mechanical stage of trading to integrate all the trading skills, mental skills that you need, so that you can become consistent. Whether it's trading mechanically, subjective, or intuitively, I'm just saying you're going to. We're going to look at trading in a very different way. We're going to look at trading in a way like how am I going to use my trading and what I've learned about how to identify an edge to actually create certain skills inside my mental environment. That's what I'm saying. And then once those skills, one second, once those skills are, are, are set, then you can do anything you want. If you want to trade subjectively and you want to trade intuitively, then you, know, then you can do that. But, but there, are, there are some constraints there. Because remember when I said if you don't want to get into don't want to get into identifying and neutralizing self-sabotaging beliefs? Well, when you start trading subjectively, uh, a lot of those things start making a lot of money. A lot of those beliefs, if they exist, will start working on the way you see the market and how you behave. And therefore, one of the compensating factors is to go back and trade mechanically. 
And I'll, and I'll explain all that tomorrow. Okay. That's, that'll do. What does it mean to think in probabilities? To really learn or understand what it means to think in probabilities, we really have to get at the very core or the very foundation of what makes prices move. This is really critical. And what, 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 what amazes me is, is how many times, you know, I, I've, over the years, I've done these kind of presentations, especially in, in huge conferences, where, where you know, people have, have trade, and they've been trading for a long time, and they really don't understand what makes prices move. At the very, I mean, the very fundamental reasons why prices go from one price to another. And it, it is, it, it, it's of paramount importance. Not only, like I said, in, as a foundation for learning how to think in probabilities, but also for learning how to read the markets. So for an example, if we've got 12, 11, 10, 9, 08, and the last price was 10, what does that mean, first of all? When the last price is 10, what does exactly that mean? Yeah, that's fair value, right? In other words, it's what someone's willing to pay and what, what, what someone's willing to sell for and what someone's willing to buy for. Now, if you look at trading, when anybody puts on the trade, no matter what kind of trade it is, there are only two outcomes to every trade, are there not? Right? I, I, I need you I need guys to, to yeah. nod your head, okay? At least tell me that you're with me on this, okay? There's only two outcomes to every trade. What is it? One of those two outcomes. There's going to be a winner or a loser. So every trade that we put on <laughs> has only two possible outcomes. Well, it could be, well, it be a break. I mean, you know, but how long is it going to stay break even? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Say you could put on a trade at 10, and how long is the market going to stay at 10? Okay, that's what I'm getting at. And all I'm saying is that yes, a trade, yes, you can scratch trades. But, but look, as of yet, I have, I have not met somebody. Well, let's put it this way. And everyone trades. We only got two outcomes to every, every trade, and everyone trades for the exact same reason. And what is that reason? To make money, right? And, and I have yet to meet somebody that actually consciously put on a trade before they put it on, thinking it was going to be a loser. I have not met that person yet. Now, I'm not saying subconsciously they, didn't, they you know, didn't hope that it was a loser for some reason or another, but at least consciously everyone trades for the exact same reason. Now, so we've got everyone trading for the exact same reason. We've only got two outcomes to every trade that you put on. It's either going to be a winner or a loser, and there are only two ways to make money. You have to buy something low and sell it back at a higher price or sell something, sell something high and buy it back at a lower price. Those are the only two ways that you can make money. Now, if that's the case, and the last price of something was 10, where everyone agreed, at least in that moment, two traders or more agreed on the value of something, what is going to cause the price to go to 11 or down to 9? OK, you say an imbalance. That is correct. That's right, OK? That, that is absolutely correct. But let's, get, let, let's, let's be a little bit more detailed here. More demand than supply. Well, OK, you could, you could, I'm not going to argue with that, but that's not the answer I'm looking for. More buyers and sellers? That's not, the argue, that's not the answer I'm looking for either. Perceived value? Perceived value, yes. OK, that's close. That's, that's trend. What? Trend. We'll look at it this way, guys, OK? If, if for, for someone, if the last price of something was 10, for the price to go to 11, it means you've got a buyer and a seller, right? You've got someone, you've got someone who sold it at 10 and someone who's willing to buy it at 10. Now, someone who was willing to buy it at 10 is doing the exact opposite of what they need to do to make money relative to the last price. Now, think about this for a second. The last price was 10. Low, if I've got to buy low and sell high, or sell high and buy low, low is 9. The last price was 10. Low is 9 relative to the last price. If I'm willing to buy at 10, what does that say about what I think 
that where prices are going to go. What? Yeah. Yeah, when you say perceived value, exactly. In other words, let's look at it like a football game, a basketball game, a prize fight, or whatever. We look at, we, everyone talks about, let's say, the word momentum. Who's got the momentum on their side? If you take these two traders, the guy that's selling it at 11 is doing exactly what he thinks he needs to do to make money. He is selling high relative to the last price. He is being passive. This is what's critical. He's being passive. Remember that everyone trades for the same reason. Go ahead. Well, let's put it this way. I'm not saying that the seller has less of a conviction. He could have a very strong conviction and think he just got a deal, right? All I'm saying is that we can say, and that, and that could be really be the case, and that, and that, and that kind of conviction can, can stop prices on a dime, can it? Okay, so, so that, could, that could be a reversal right there. All I'm saying, David, is that, is that if you look at these two people, you could say that, that, that the guy that's willing to step out and step up and bid a price up, would, it, let's say, you're right, he doesn't have to have a stronger conviction, but we're gonna, for prices to keep on moving up, then we'd have to say that the buyers have a stronger conviction than the sellers. They have to, because they're willing, because one, not only are they willing to bid the price up, but, there's, but that the conviction itself might not be as strong in this case, there might just be more buyers than sellers. So it's a combination of two things. It could be either there's a stronger conviction or there's more buyers and there's not enough sellers to absorb the buyer's orders, right? And when and if there's enough one at the point at which there's enough sellers that come into the market to absorb all the all the buy orders, then what's going to happen to price is going to reverse. So it could be a combination of two factors. It could be just numbers or conviction itself. But to make the point, what I do is I just usually say conviction. Because really, all price movement is a function of what people believe about the future. That we can say for sure. There's only two ways to make money. You have to buy low and sell high, sell high and buy low. And for the price to go from the last price to this price, someone has to be willing to step out and bid it up and pay more than, do the exact opposite. That's the, that's the important part. That's why I say more conviction. because. Because he has to do the opposite of what he needs to do to make money. If I'm only doing this to make money and I've got to do something that's opposite, opposite relative to the last price, then that, then that is an indication, okay, that let's say that's an indication that there must be more conviction, at least in that moment probably. What's that? Okay. Okay, so what we have is we have now a group of people that are trading with one another and as a result this collective group of, now we look at it from a collective level, this group of people that are all acting, let's say, in their own self-interest, trying to make money for whatever reason, by bidding prices up or offering them, low, offering them lower, they create behavior patterns. They create group collective behavior patterns. Just the same way individuals will act the same way under certain circumstances over and over again, groups of individuals will act in ways or let's say characteristic ways over and over again. And so what technical analysis does is basically identify these patterns for us. So we can use any number of tools that we've learned. We can use trend lines. We can use you know, uh, uh, moving averages, Fibonacci relationships, uh, you know, stochastics. All these technical tools 
that we've learned about, all they really do is categorize and organize group human behavior in a way where we can identify what we're going to call an edge. An edge is simply a higher probability of one thing happening over another. So when we talk about an edge, we're talking about simply there's a higher probability of one thing happening over another. Now, now the problem is that even though we've got this, we've got we, technical analysis creates or identifies these patterns for us, patterns imply consistency, do they not? So in other words, if I've got, if I can identify a pattern that repeats itself over and over again, it implies to me that I'm going to get a consistent outcome. But do I get a consistent outcome? Well, yeah, I do. But it depends on what level you're talking about. At the macro level, over a large sample size of outcomes, it will be consistent. Just like the flip of a coin. If I flip a coin a thousand times, and I have, let's say, if I have sample sets, if I have to do ten sample sets of one thousand flips, what are my results going to be? They're going to be consistent, are they not? Is that a pattern? I'm going to get a 50-50 outcome, or close to it, if I have a large enough sample size. That's at the macro level. I can get a consistent outcome. But at the micro level, what about each flip in relationship to each other? Yeah, in other words, independent and random. So for an example, if I, can, if I know that out of a thousand flips, I'm going to get a 50-50 distribution between heads and tails, am I going to know the exact sequence of heads to tails? No. So I could end up with, you know, so I can end up with streaks of, of 10 heads in a row, 12 heads in a row, uh, you know, uh, and if I get 12 heads in a row, what's the, what are the odds that the next flip's going to be heads? It's still 50-50, right? And so at the micro level, there's a random distribution between heads and tails. At the micro level with trading, or using technical analysis, there's also a random distribution between wins and losses. So you could develop a trading system that you could test and find that you know, over a whatever sample size of trades, you could have 60% winners or, or you know, 60% winners, 10% scratches, and 40% you know, uh, losing or 30% losing trades, but you wouldn't be able to tell me the actual sequence of winners to losers to scratches, meaning which trades were going to be the winners and which trades were going to be the losers. Which means what? Random outcome. Random which means that I'm going to have to adjust my thinking in a way that allows me to compensate for the fact that there's a random outcome when my mind will tell me something different. Because it doesn't feel that way. So for an example, if I get four winning trades in a row, what are the odds that the next trade is going to be a winner? Yeah, I don't even know really what the, when you get right down to it, I mean, it's just like there's almost no way to, to really put odds on it in some cases. I just don't know what the next trade's going to be, no matter what. But is it going to feel that way? If I've had three winners in a row, what the next trade, what, and, and my edge is now present in the market. My ne you know, the way I define an edge, the variables I use is now present in the market. Is it going to feel like that next trade is going to be a winner or a loser? A winner. And that's because of the way our minds are wired. If I've had three or four losers in a row, 
and now my edge is present in the market, what's it going to feel like? What's that? Yeah, I'd be scared to put it on. When in fact, there's a random distribution between, between wins and losses. I have no way, really, no way of knowing whether that next trade is going to be a winner or a loser. Now, if I've learned to think in probabilities, I wouldn't even hesitate to put that next trade on, regardless of whether I've had three, three losers in a row or three winners in a row. And once I've learned how to integrate, or once I've learned to effectively think in probabilities, I, if I've had three winners in a row, I also won't break my money management rules. But getting to the point where I can think in probabilities can, can really present some problems. There are two basic areas that we have to deal with. One is our social upbringing, and the other is the way our minds are wired. Which I'll get into in a little bit. Let's see. So basically, what, what I'll get into that, get into this, this stuff in just a, just a little bit about the way our minds are wired and our social upbringing. But uh, what th so what technical indicators don't do is they don't tell us what's going to happen next on a trade by trade basis, and that and that really is a problem because in essence, what we have to learn how to do is we have to learn how to keep our minds focused in the now moment, meaning like. What is going on now in this moment relative to my objective to be a consistently successful trader and not allow our minds to, let's say, tap into a memory of a previous moment? And the problem is our minds are automatically wired to think that way. Our minds are wired to do two things that we have to be concerned with. Our minds are wired to associate and our minds are wired to avoid pain. And yeah, right. And, I, and, and if you do the exercises, as I'm going to give you on Sunday, it won't be that hard. The exercises themselves might be a little difficult. But once you get through it, it'll work. It really will. Because what those exercises are going to do is they're going to actually cause your mind to disassociate what's happening now in this now moment in terms of an opportunity to do something with some previous trade. And also at the same time, not cause you to define and interpret market information in painful ways. Because that's basically what ends up happening. So when you look at it, when you look at, at, at what this, if you look at what the market does at its most fundamental level, is it gives us up and down ticks, right? I mean, think about it. What does the market gives us? It gives us up ticks and down ticks, down ticks and up ticks. The up ticks and down ticks form into patterns. Technical analysis helps us identify the patterns and, and so that we can and help us define them as edges. Edges meaning there's a higher probability of one thing happening over another, meaning ultimately meaning that if we know how to know how to um, how to execute our edges properly, we can enrich ourselves as traders. That's simple, right? Because when you get right down to it, putting money in your account is a function of execution. It's not a function of analysis. Think about that. It's a function of execution. You cannot get a dime in your account from just analysis unless you're a newsletter writer or, you know, or offering analysis as a service. As a trader, the only way you get it in your account is by executing properly. And there are all kinds of psychological factors that come into play when we have to behave as opposed to observe. Analysis is a function of observation. Trading is a function of execution. Observing something and acting on it are two completely different ball games. So what we have is we have up and down ticks, right? The up and down ticks, like I said, form into patterns. Now, do the up and down ticks in and of themselves uh, have any charge associated with them? Yes? You think there's a charge? I mean, I mean by like negative or positive charge? You do? Why? I think that at certain times, depending on which way the market's going, you associate different feelings based on what which way the market's tipping, whether it's up or down. I think people, mm -hmm. some people can have a tendency if they're in a kind of losing position to focus much more on the up ticks that go in their favor, the charge ticks that go in their favor, as opposed to the ticks that go against them. 
Oh, I agree completely with what you're saying, but I think you might have misunderstood my question. From the market's perspective, is there a charge to these up and down ticks? No, they're just, they're just neutral, right? So that's the, you, what you said is basically exactly what I wanted to get to. You say it's not the market that causes us to, to be euphoric or feel fear. These up and down ticks, that's all they are, just up and down ticks. There's, there's no intended, in other words, they don't exist they don't exist from the perspective of causing us to feel any particular way. It's just information. So for example, when we're interacting with people, the, the intent could be to cause us to feel in some, cause us to feel some particular way, right? We could be interacting with someone who, who is being very affectionate, that wants to share that affection, and, and if we interpret that information in a way that's consistent with what they intend, then we will share that experience. At the same time, if someone's hurling insults at us, what's the intent? In other words, the environment can generate information that has an inherent charge to it, a positive or a negative charge. Are you guys with me on this? I'm kind of getting faces that, you know. So the environment can generate information that has a charge. But market information is neutral. And as a result, for us to experience market information in any kind of painful or threatening way requires an interpretation of that information. So we have two basic, we have two basic kinds of pain that we deal with. We've got physical pain and we've got information-based pain, which I'm going to call emotional pain. All of us understand the nature of physical pain. And we pretty much share the same things. In other words, our physiologic, physio, our body physiology, physiology may be different. So that if you know, if I punch you in the arm or you punch me in the arm, we might feel a little bit differently about. It. I mean, how much pain we experience is hard to measure, but we're both going to experience pain. But there's no. Is there? Is there a universal definition for betrayal? Do you think there's a universal definition? So in other words. What, may, what might cause you to feel betrayed and what might cause me to feel betrayed could be vastly different in terms of the, the, the kind of information that I would need and the kind of information that you would need. So the market generates information from a neutral perspective. But we don't perceive it that way. That's what we want to get to. We want to get to the point where we, are at, where we are actually perceiving market information from a neutral or objective perspective so that it doesn't have the potential to cause us to feel threatened in any way. So that we just see the patterns for what they are. Simply an edge indicating it's time to do something. And do something in a certain manner. But go ahead. Exactly. And and why and why would people why would people gravitate towards having more and more more and more indicators? Because they're trying to avoid losses. They're trying to use you know, every possible filter to help them filter out that, the possibility of a losing trade. Because see, basically the typical trader does not really accept the risk of trading. Only the very best traders truly accept the risk. Now think about what I just said, accept the risk. The, the, the key word is, is accept. What does it mean to accept something? And when you think about what it means to accept something, it means to be completely reconciled, to be at peace, where well, there's no internal argument. Most traders like to think of themselves as risk takers because they're involved in an endeavor that's inherently risky. And so therefore, they think of themselves as someone who takes risk. But the reality is that most traders are doing everything possible to avoid the risk of trading. And how do we know that to be a fact? I know that to be an absolute, undisputable fact. 
because most traders still make the mistake of not predefining the risk of putting on a trade. What's the connection? To predefine your risk of putting on a trade, you have to gather evidence for why the trade might not work. Most traders don't put on a trade until they've convinced themselves 100% that the trade is a winner. Why would I put this trade on if I didn't think it was going to be a winner? Right? To predefine my risk, I have to start gathering evidence that it might not work or why it might not work. And in the process of gathering that evidence, I might talk myself out of the trade. Right? Now, see, someone who's thinking in probabilities, that wouldn't even occur to them to think this way, but we'll, we'll get into that in a second, okay? So, so, if I gather too much evidence, I'll talk myself out of the trade, and many times it feels worse to not have put on a trade that ultimately ends up being a winner, as opposed to putting on a trade that ended up being a loser. And so to get around that whole you know, that to get around that, that, let's say, that whole rationalization, what we do is basically just convince ourselves that I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think I was right. And so, therefore, there really is no risk. Or I wouldn't be putting on the trade in the first place. Now, that's easy to do. And this is what I'm talking about, like, like when I say that there's two inherent problems, is that our minds are wired to avoid pain and our minds are also wired to associate, we've got some real problems here that we have to get around and compensate for. Because what, what is my mind going to associate with putting on, with let's say a losing trade or being wrong? All of us grow up learning to be wrong in very painful ways. I don't think there's anyone in this room or anybody that I've met that hasn't grown up learning about what it means to be wrong and learning it in ways that isn't inherently painful, both physically and emotionally. Now, if I have the tendency to associate a losing trade with what it means to be wrong, basically what happens is that losing trade taps me into the accumulated pain of every time I've been wrong in my life. It isn't just a trade. It isn't just one in a sequence. Or all the losing trades you've ever had. Yeah, exactly. Or all the losing trades I've ever had. Or anything that I've ever lost in my life. And that could be vast, I mean, in terms of the implications. Losing loved ones, losing pets, all kinds of things like that. So if these things aren't reconciled, meaning we're not at peace with it, then, they, then they, they definitely have a way of filtering right into our trading until we learn how to truly think in probabilities. And then what we've done is put trading into a completely different category in our mind that takes it out of a right or wrong category and takes it out of even a loss category because loss has just become a part of, part of the cost of doing business. You know what? Let's just take a little break then. We're all, yeah, this is good. This is fine. Exist in every time frame. In other words, you can take the same patterns that exist on a daily chart, and, and you'll see them on an hourly chart. You'll see them on a 10-minute chart. You'll see them on a 5-minute chart. You'll see them on a 2-minute chart. Now, what this does is, is, it, is it turns the market into this never-ending stream of opportunities to enrich ourselves. But like I said before, patterns imply consistency. And based on the way our minds are wired, this becomes a real problem. And this is what we have to overcome. We have to overcome this inherent natural, that's it, inherent natural tendency to associate what's happening in this now moment with something that's already in our mind as a memory about some previous moment. Because the two do not have a relationship. 
because again, the patterns at the macro level, just like, just like that's how casinos make money. Casinos make money because they know that based on the rules of the game, the odds are eventually in their favor, meaning that you can take a bell curve, typical bell curve, of, which would represent extreme winners, extreme losers, and everyone in between. But the bottom line is, based on the rules of the game, over a large enough sample size of hands played, of dice throwing, or, or spins of the wheel on the roulette, that they will come out net winners by, an X, by X percentage. And each of them is different. Now, the problem is, how do we train our minds to think like a casino? Because essentially, it's the same thing. When we, these patterns roll around, our minds have the tendency to assume that what happened the last time will happen again this time, when the reality is there's a random outcome. And how do we know there's a random outcome? Even though the pattern exists, and we see it, and like I said, the same variables can, identify, can, can define it, and they can be exactly the same from one occurrence to the next. You can have the exact same mathematics, the exact same measurements. It can look exactly the same. But the problem from, from the market's perspective is that each pattern is made up of what? Different traders. Or some of the same traders. It could be some of the same. But the point is, is that they're, they're in every case, there are always going to be different traders. And as a result, each of these traders has different expectations about what's going to happen in the future, compelling them to either step up and bid, or accept a bid, or step up and offer, or accept an offer, in a way or at a price that they might not have done the last time around. And so as a result of the way our minds are wired, So we can take these up and down ticks, okay, that form into patterns. Get a nice symmetrical trading range going here, okay. This is support, this is resistance. Now, all this really means when the market, when the market came up to this point right here, what really happened? Just, a, just at a very simple fundamental level, what happened? Yeah, there was, it doesn't have to be exactly more people in terms of sellers, but at least there was more selling volume, enough volume to absorb all the buy orders with enough left over to cause this to happen, right? In this particular time frame, whatever that is. This could be any time frame chart, by the way. It wouldn't make any difference, right? Okay? And so we've got, so, so, what happened? The exact same thing happened here, only the opposite. Enough buy orders to absorb all the selling with enough left over for the market to do this. Now, when the market came down to this point again, we have what's called an edge, right? Right, we've got an edge. If you, if you, you trade support and resistance, that's an edge. An edge is a higher probability of one thing happening over another. Do we know what's going to happen in this case? Do we know that the market's going to stop here and go up? And why do we know that? Why do we know that we don't know? Okay, but why do we know that we don't know? Ba based in based in the context that we're we're talking about right here. Okay, but uh, why the still? Why do we know that we don't know? Yeah, we don't know if the same guys are here that were the same the same people that were that bought that bought here. Are they in the market? They could be out to lunch. Right? What? Or what mood they're in? Right? Exactly. We don't know. And in essence, it really only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of your edge, whatever it is. Now think about that. It only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of your edge. Just one. So in essence, when we say, well, we're going to find the risk of this trade, well, what is the, what is the risk, OK? What, we don't even. You know, we don't have a scale here in terms of dollar value, but we can say that how much distance, how much room am I going to get to let this price move against my position if I'm a buyer right here to tell me that whoever was buying here are either in or they're either going to come in or not come into the market. That's basically all I'm really saying. 
And that could be what we call an educated guess. E D G E. Edu edge E D G dash U dash Cated. Educated guess. That's all it is. However, let's say for an example we're operating out of the typical mindset of the typical trader. And the typical mindset of the typical trader, he's operating out of four basic fears. The fear of being wrong, the fear of losing money, the fear of missing out, and the fear of leaving money on the table. Now what's going to happen in this case? First of all, the market's coming down to what, what he defines as an edge. Is he going to put this trade on even? Is he even going to get it on? There could be all kinds of factors that would come into play that he may not even get this trade on. But let's say he works through whatever, whatever fears or hesitations, or he convinces, it doesn't work through. I'm going to say, take that back and say, let's just say that he convinces himself that this trade is going to work. Because basically, that's the only way he's going to get it on in the first place. And if he's convinced that this trade is going to work, it's unlikely that he will predefine his risk. Basically, just go through the same, the same kind of thought pattern that we just went through to say, hey, look, it only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of my edge. <coughs> Therefore, how much room am I going to give the market you know, against my position if I take this trade right here to tell me that people are either going to come in and buy it and support this price or they're not? He doesn't do that. So he gets into this trade. And the market does something like this. Now, one thing I haven't said that you're going to have to keep in mind for tomorrow and, and Sunday is that, remember I said that our minds are wired to avoid pain. It's, this is a natural way that, that our minds function. There are two kinds of pain, physical pain and emotional pain. Physical pain we talked about, okay? hit somebody, come into contact with the environment in some way, and, and our physiology will cause us to experience pain. Emotional pain is different. It's information-based pain. Information can cause us to tap into something that's inside of our mind that is made up of, let's say, negatively charged energy and put us into a negatively charged state of mind or fear. And what is fear? Fear is just telling us that there's something out there that we need to be, we need to avoid. Okay? Our mind has pain, our mind has automatic pain avoidance mechanisms. So for an example, if I set my hand on this table, it turned out to be a hot burner, I don't have to think about moving my hand. It happens automatically, subconsciously. There's no argument, there's no internal conflict, my hand comes off. The same kind of mechanisms exist for information. In other words, our minds can cause us to experience information in ways that are very different than what was intended from the environment's perspective, based on what we might be afraid of. It can actually distort and alter that information in ways that are consistent with keeping us out of pain. So for an example, everyone in this room has learned enough about the nature of the market to say that you can recognize a trend, can you not? Is that a distinction that you've learned about the nature of the way markets can move, that the markets can trend? And we're, we're going to define the trend as simply a series of higher highs and higher lows or lower lows and whole lower highs in whatever time frame we want, right? Okay. And one thing we've also noticed about a trend is that once a trend starts, it usually it can keep on going, right? In other words, we can assume that you know, once momentum gathers on one side of the market or the other, in other words, one side gets the advantage, one side has a stronger conviction about their belief in the future than the people that are taking the other side of the trade, that that trend will continue until the people's conviction changes. It's that simple. Okay, and a trend is an easy way to make money, right? Catch a trend, and that's an easy way to enrich ourselves, right? Okay, so, now, if I'm operating out of a fear of being wrong, and my mind is wired to avoid pain, now think about this, my mind is wired to avoid pain. 
the up and down ticks that the market's giving me will take on a certain quality in relationship to what's going on inside my mind. From the market's perspective, these are just up and down ticks forming into patterns, patterns that represent opportunities. I'm going to say that again. From the market's perspective, these are just up and down ticks forming into patterns, patterns that represent opportunities to enrich ourselves. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to interpret it that way. So if I'm operating out of a fear of being wrong, the principle that I'm going to give you right now is that the principle that, that you're going to learn about is that fear causes us to focus on the object of our fear so that we end up creating the very experience we're trying to avoid. Did I need to say that again? Fear causes us to narrow our focus of attention, put it this way. Fear causes us to narrow our focus of attention onto the object of our fear so that we end up creating the very experience we're trying to avoid. So if I'm operating out of a fear of being wrong and the market's giving me up ticks and giving me down ticks, what ticks am I likely to focus my attention on and put greater significance on? The up ticks. You say it louder. The up ticks, right? Why? Because the up ticks take me out of my pain. So for an example, if I'm getting one uptick in relationship to the downtick, one uptick for every four or five downticks, the market is in a downtrend, is in a downtrend. But what I'm going to do is my mind is automatically going to narrow my focus of attention so that I place an inordinate amount of significance on that information and categorically ignoring or or either ignoring or are placing a lack of significance on this information right here. Because this information is being defined and interpreted as threatening because it's going to cause me to tap into my fear of being wrong, meaning I have to admit that I'm wrong, which in, which in many cases might tap us into the accumulated emotional pain of every time I've been wrong in my life. And so therefore, this takes on an, an enormous amount of significance. And so what I do is I categorically ignore this information in relationship to this information because every time I get these upticks, it feels like relief to me. And I can say, well, it's finally all over. It's coming back in my direction. Now, this isn't the only fear this trader is going to be operating out of. He's also going to be operating out of a fear of losing money. But that fear is going to be sort of in the back of his mind and coming to the forefront the more the market moves against him. In other words, in other words, the more the market moves against him, the more he has to acknowledge the fact that he is losing money. And there will come a point at which there is a relative balance in, the, in this trader's mind in terms of these two energies. Now think about this. Think about this in terms of physics. There will come a point at which there is a relative balance or then an, a tipping of an imbalance, let's say, between what is more painful, admitting that he's wrong or losing one more dollar? What hurts more? They'll look, at some point, and everyone is different, you see. Every, for every trader is different. At some point, there will, that point will be reached in which losing one more dollar will be one degree pain more painful than admitting that he's wrong. That's the way I like to say it one degree more painful than admitting that he's wrong, and that's the point at which he'll get out of that trade. Some of those that you add when you have bad solutions, mm -hmm. is that just another affirmation that you're right again? Well, yeah, put it this way. You couldn't <coughs> add to a loser. You're John, right? Yeah. Okay, John, you couldn't add to a loser unless you're convinced, correct? You have to be. You, just, you couldn't take that action. And the problem is sometimes you're going to do it and it'll work. And, and, and hopefully that will never happen because if you do it again and it works, and I mean, if you do it again and it doesn't work, it, it could be a catastrophic loss. That's why in the way that, you know, in, in over the years when I've worked with traders, especially floor traders, 
Um, there are very few people that I've worked with that are nimble enough to add to a losing position. I say nimble enough, I mean nimble enough mentally to be able to add to, or not add to a losing position, but add even to a winning position. I'm not saying there aren't some people who can't do it, but it's rare. It's a rare person who can do it. Because you add to a winning position and you, are con you literally have to be, unless it's part of a money management regimen that, that, that's objective, put it this way, that, that there's, there's an objective money management regimen there. For most people, it isn't. They add to a winning position because they're convinced it increases their average price, which means that you know the, the, the smaller the distance the market has to go against them to put them into a losing trade. And they end up not with any profits at all and usually a catastrophic loss. <coughs> Whereas what we're going to do on Sunday is we're going to we're going to you know you're going to see how important it is to actually scale out of your winners instead of adding to your winners and taking away from your winners. Anyway, let's get back to this. So now, what happens when the sky finally blows out of this trade? Obviously, the market always does this. I mean, that's you know, I mean that that's what that, that happens every time. But really, what else is he going to do? But I mean, what's he going to do? Not what the market does. What is he going to do when he gets out of his trade? He gets a clear head, and what's he going to say to himself? This, this is universal, by the way. This is universal. What's he going to do? What have you done? Come on, what have you done? No, forget the market goes up. Forget this. You get out right here, and you're going to look at this chart, and what are you going to say? Well, okay, but besides that, okay, what are you going to say? No, but besides that, what are you going to say? What? What? You're going to blame? No. How could I miss that? Look, come on. It's like, yeah, yeah, exactly. In other words, look, look at that nice trend. You're going to hit yourself in the head and say, why didn't I just sell? Why is it that as soon as you're out of that trade, you can now make this distinction that it was a downtrending market. Whereas while you were in the trade, you could not make that distinction. Fear is gone. Yeah, the fear is gone and it opens up your perception. Fear narrows your focus of attention onto the object of your fear so that you end up creating the very experience you're trying to avoid. He was trying to avoid being wrong and made himself wrong based on his interpretation of market information. Most traders will blame the market. And you can see that the market had nothing to do with his loss. Nothing. Yeah, whatever. And so what we have to do, of course, is learn how to trade without fear. Learn how to trade from a carefree state of mind so that we no longer have this potential to define and interpret market information in painful ways. The information itself is not threatening. It's the interpretation that makes it threatening. And there is, there are internal mechanisms that control how we interpret information. That's what we have to get at if we want to create consistent results. We have to get at that mechanism that, that, that causes us to interpret information in certain ways and change that mechanism. That's basically what this whole workshop is about. Just as, a, just as a side, before I go any further with this, is that is there anyone in this room who has not at some time felt betrayed by the market? Is there anyone in the room who at some time or another has not felt betrayed by the market? So uh, what I'm saying is that everyone in the room at some time in their trading career in some way or another has felt that the market betrayed them. Daily. Daily, okay, good. It, you have not or have? Oh, and the specialist. Okay. Okay, now think about this. Now think about the, the now think about the, the, the relationship or the stance, the psychological stance you are taking towards the market when you feel betrayed. Just think about think about the implications here. How often have you woken up in the morning and said to yourself, I wonder how I can or might fulfill someone else's dreams? Of, of financial independence today. How might I contribute? Yeah. How how might how might I contribute to someone else's dreams of 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 
of acquiring wealth and financial independence through their trading. Because that's exactly what you're saying to the market when you feel betrayed. That's exactly, that's exactly the stance you're taking. You're expecting the market to do something for you. When the reality is, you already know the reality. Everyone trades for their own self-interest. <coughs> Everyone who puts on a trade, at least when they put it on at that moment, thought it was going to be a winner, or they wouldn't have done it. The market is not there to give you money. You can take the money if you've got the, the appropriate psychological resources to do it. But it isn't there to give it to you because everyone else wants it too. And we can give it to ourselves based on how clearly we can perceive it's the possibilities from its perspective. That's why I say that thinking of probabilities is synonymous with thinking in the market's perspective. What's possible from its perspective based on the patterns that it's displaying in any given moment? <coughs> Take this same trader and put him into a winning trade and look what happens. Now, in this case, the market's giving him exactly what he wants, okay? He's not in a losing trade, now he's in a winning trade. But what do you think, typical trader, what do you think, what do you, what kind, what, now, he's giving him up and down ticks that are forming into patterns. What do you think he's gonna focus on, the up ticks or the down ticks? Yeah. Now he's gonna focus on the down ticks, why? The yes, the market's gonna take his money away. And in the process of believing or thinking or fearing that the market's going to take his money away, what is he doing? He's taking his own money away, right? So instead of, instead of, you know, letting this trend, letting this trend fulfill itself, chances are he's maybe out, oh, right here, or right here, probably most likely he's going to be out right here. Right? Because who hasn't been in a trade we're in a winning trade where they didn't take any profits, the market came back to their entry point or below, and you know they ended up with, with no money or a loss. So therefore, fear causes us to foc narrow our focus of attention onto the object of our fear so that we end up creating the very experiences we are trying to avoid. The point is, if we are going to create consistent results from our trading, we cannot have this potential. We cannot have this potential to define and interpret what is, inset, what is essentially neutral information in painful ways. We just can't do it. Other than these kind of self-sabotaging errors that we might have the potential to make as a result of, of not, let's say, believing that we deserve the money, because in essence, remember that third category that I talked about you know, a couple of hours ago? You know, we've got defining an edge, thinking of probabilities, self-sabotaging beliefs. Self-sabotaging beliefs fall into the category of, in essence, saying, saying, it isn't right to make money this way or I don't believe I deserve the money. And there are a lot of people who grow up with beliefs saying that it isn't, it isn't appropriate or right or, or you know, let's say, uh, uh, Christian or spiritual or whatever to make money as a trader. Some of the more difficult traders I've worked with are, are people who were brought up in, in, as Southern Baptists. Because, because a lot of the people that I've worked with that came from that kind of a background, you know, it gets, it gets pounded in their brain from a pretty early age that, that gambling is evil. And it's very difficult not to look at trading as gambling, or not to find it that way. Or if you grow up from a background that, you know, that you, uh, you were taught that you have to render services, you know, uh, to be, you know, to be paid appropriately, you have to render some sort of worthwhile service. Now, certainly as traders, you're providing liquidity for other traders. That's a service of some sort. But a lot of times, that's a real, that, that's a real difficult one to uh, put into the, put in, you know, and reconcile their, their belief that they're providing a worthwhile service. You're bringing up specialists who have Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly, right. But what I was, what the point that I was making was this, is that I kind of got sidetracked, I'm sorry. The point that I was making is that, is that 
virtually every error that you have the potential to make as a trader, every error that will detract from your ability to create the kind of equity curve that we were talking about in the very beginning when we started, is all going to be a function of your inability to think in probabilities. Objectively think in probabilities. What, and well, first of all, let's look at what those errors are. These are just typical errors. Well, you know, this, this thing, really. Okay, what are the consequences of thinking or assuming and believing that we'll know what will happen next? This is exactly, th actually, this is, this is exactly what our minds cause us to do. In other words, in, when, we, when we get or we have an edge that comes up where we have not learned to think in probabilities, our minds have the tendency to cause us to think we know what's going to happen next because of the way it feels. Remember I said that we had three winning trades in a row? What's it going to feel like? It's going to feel like the next trade's got to be a winner. It has to be. If we've had three losing in a row, what's it going to feel like? It feels like the next trade is going to be a loser, when yet we have no idea what the sequence between winners and losers is going to be. This, our pain avoidance mechanisms and this, this inherent tendency to associate causes us to believe that we know what's going to happen next. Now, are you with me on this? Is everybody, I'm just kind of getting, I, I, you know. When in fact, our mind has to be open to the fact that what, anything can happen. And so here's what happens. We have a lack of objectivity in other words, the inability to perceive the market's potential from its perspective, like what happens here, where what we did is we were completely blinded to the fact that the market was trending against us. It's really amazing how this works. It's li like we are literally blinded to our own distinctions. As a matter of fact, if I were to kind of define the nature of objectivity, which we're going to go into later on tomorrow anyway, is that if, if you looked at, like, this is, if these being all the possibilities that exist in terms of all the number of distinctions that the market can make in terms of behavior patterns, if someone, if we could, if someone actually was able to learn every possible pattern that the market could express, every possible pattern, let's say is represented by that line. That's erroneous to think this way, but this would represent 100% of the patterns, okay? Let's say the typical trader learned, I don't know, 20% of those patterns. Okay? Now, it means, in essence, what I'm saying here is that if you've learned tw to recognize 20% of the patterns, what about the other 80%? What are the, what are the implications of what I'm saying? They're invisible, aren't they? Yeah, you can't perceive them. Now think about this, they're invisible. They exist, it's just like the very first time you looked at a price chart. Now the very first time you looked at a price chart, what did you see? You saw lines. But you didn't. You, you may even sit, may, may may have seen some patterns, but you didn't understand the relationships between what was going on with the line. Certainly not like what you see now. So if I could magically reproduce the very first chart you ever looked at in your life, would you see something different than the first time that you looked at it? You'd see opportunities that were literally invisible the first time, right? So what you're seeing are the patterns you've learned about, whereas they were literally invisible before that. So what I'm saying is that out of all the patterns that the market can express in terms of its behavior, there is some finite percentage that each of us have learned. Finite. And the ones we haven't discovered yet can be occurring, but unnoticeable. Okay? So this would be if you and I could perceive 100% of what was available, then we would be experiencing an objective, let's say, an objective state of mind. If you could even say, define an objective state of mind as having simultaneous awareness of everything going on at once. Because that's basically what it would require. Simultaneous awareness of everything going on at once. Which would also be like maybe part of the definition of God. Simultaneous awareness of everything going on at once. If you don't have simultaneous awareness of everything going on at once, 
then you are experiencing something less than what's being, what's being made available in any given moment in terms of the way either the market or the environment is expressing itself. Now, what we want as traders, is we don't necessarily have to have, have to be able to perceive the full repertoire of all the patterns that the market can express. But what we do want is we want to be able to perceive what we've learned. We want to be able to get whatever percentage we've got. And the more fear that we operate out of, the less we perceive. So we go down almost to zero. We can get to the point where we're almost down to zero, down to nothing. We're only perceiving one possibility out of the many that may exist in any given moment, based on how much fear we're operating out of. Fear closes. In other words, an objective state of mind for each of us as individuals would be to be able to perceive 100% of what we've learned. 100% of what we've learned. Since all of us in this room have learned to recognize the nature of a trend, then we don't want to be in a position where we have the potential to define and interpret any of these up and down ticks in painful ways because we will lose that ability to perceive that trend in that moment until we're out of the trade. So here are the typical errors that we can make. Won't predefine the risk in advance of getting into a trade. And it's amazing. I mean, it's just like, you know, I, it, it's amazing, uh, you know, that, that everyone in this room has, knows from every book you've ever read, from any great trader you've ever heard talk or you've talked to, that how essential it is to know what your risk is, right? And yet, we will continually make these errors over and over again. All that's really telling you is that you haven't learned how to think in probabilities yet. You haven't really learned to think in the market's perspective. Why? Because from the market's perspective, what does it take? It only takes one, one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of your trade, right? That's all, just one. Now, once you really believe that, now think about this. Once you really believe that, will it be possible for you to ever get into a trade without predefining your risk? It's very difficult, it's very, very difficult to act in a way that violates what you believe. It takes an enormous amount of energy. Think about this. How often can you act in a way that contradicts what you believe to be true? How often or how often have you or what would it take for you to behave in a way that contradicts what you believe to be true? It's, it's extremely difficult, isn't it? It takes an enormous amount of energy, depending on how strong the belief is, put it that way. Do people go around violating their beliefs? No. People fight wars over their beliefs. We fight for our beliefs. We get into arguments and conflicts based on what we believe. If you believe that it really only took one trader just one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of your edge, would you ever get into a trade without predefining your risk? No, you wouldn't. You couldn't. Is, there is no absolute. I said it was an educated guess. Where? <laughs> okay, well, what would you define your risk as? educated, okay? In other words, how much, how, when you look at these kind of patterns, and depending on the time frame, if this were a daily chart, as opposed to a two-minute chart, would you have to, you'd have to risk a little bit more, wouldn't you? The distance you'd have to give the market, in this case, on a daily chart would probably have to be more than what you would on a two-minute chart. But what you do is, all you do is you look at this chart, and, and and it's just something that, that you know you get a you get after years of experience or, or years of looking at charts, and not even years, but at least enough where you say, you know, what would you, David, where would you put your where would you put your risk? You know, your uh, how much you risk on a trade like that? In a pattern that looked like that? Eight quarter points. 
an eighth or quarter of a point because what kind of charts do you trade? One minute charts. You trade one minute charts. Now, if you were trading a daily chart, where would you, how much would you risk? A couple of points. Yeah, a couple of bucks, right? Okay. Something called money then. Yeah, that's so yeah, it's just it really, it's just, it's just, you know, you've got to give on a, on a long-term <coughs> chart, you've got to give the market more room than on a, than on a short-term chart. In other words, on a short-term chart, this, this trade should work right away. And if it doesn't work right away, it's probably not going to work at all. It doesn't matter because even if it doesn't, you cut your loss and get right back in again. Well, that's, yeah, that's something, that's yeah, yeah, that's a whole other <laughs> skill set you've got to learn. But are you with me on this? Okay, but it really is an educated guess. Now, you can mathematically determine this based on past previous experience. In other words, you can run all kinds of back testing on this kind of a pattern and say that based on, you know, based on what you have here, if you can duplicate this pattern over and over again, you know, how often did the market come to this point and not quite stop you out and then go back up again, maybe go a little bit beyond and not to go back up and not, you know, after you've been stopped out, and how often did it stop you out and just keep on going? I mean, these are things, you know, just based on, on, on people who get into really sophisticated uh, uh, system testing that, you know, I don't, I don't particularly do that. I just eyeball it and say, how much room am I going to give it? How much, what's the dollar value of that distance? And if, and if I can accept the dollar value and I take the trade. So did I, John, did I answer your question? So did I, John, did I answer yeah. your question? Yeah. Okay. Give us an educated guess as to what you'd said is your tolerance for those uh, down ticks in the uptrend. Huh? The, well, the other direction, when you've got an uptrend going, how much tolerance would you We're going to do this on Sunday. Oh. Well, I'm going I'm to give you a way to handle this on Sunday so that you can stay in this trade. If that's what you're asking me. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Another error, define the risk but won't take the loss, it turns into a bigger one. You know, <laughs> you know you, you, okay, a, a perfect example. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a money manager that many years ago that, uh, that came, to this, uh, came to a workshop just like this one, and uh, he went back home. And in fact, I, 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 it's an example I even put in trading in the zone. And he, um, he, was, uh, he, he was waiting for a belly trade. For quite a while, as a matter of fact, and he had all his analysis done, and he was waiting for the market to get up to a certain point. And he was going to sell, and and so so as someone who actually had a degree in probabilities, he said, "Okay, you know, I think in probabilities, and therefore, as a as a good trader, I'm going to put my stop in the market." So he did what he needed to do, right? But does that mean just because he went through the motions of putting a stop in the market? that he truly accepted the risk of the trade? See, if someone can put a stop in the market but still not be completely reconciled <coughs> to losing the money. Now, what did I say? What did it mean to accept something? To be completely reconciled, to be at peace. In other words, there aren't any competing and conflicting mental forces inside of his mental environment. So he put his stop in. The market started you know, moving against him, you know, past his entry point. And uh, you know he, he, he just he just that he convinced himself at that point that he was going to get stopped out. He never would have gotten stopped out. He blew out of the trade. The market completely reversed, and it turned out to be a huge winner. He never got back in. And he called me up and said, "Hey, what's going on? I did what I was supposed to do. I put my stop in the market." You said he adjusted. It. But yeah, but he he took it out. I mean, he, yeah, he took it out because he never really accepted the risk. <coughs> It's almost as if he was shocked when it didn't. Right, exactly right. He was exactly he was shocked because it didn't re immediately reverse after he got in. That's what it really amounted to. And see, here's where and see the thing is here's where where we're really you know where we also have this potential to define and interpret market information in painful ways is because is there really we talk about emotional pain, all of us want our expectations fulfilled. 
And see, when you think about what an expectation is, an expectation is simply a belief projected into some future moment in the environment. Now think about what I just said. We can't expect something that we don't believe or that we don't know about, put it that way. So what I'm saying is that an expectation is, is something that I either, either expect to see, hear, taste, smell, or touch in some future moment. And if the market shows up exactly the way I expect it to, now this is universal, by the way. This isn't just Mark. This is a universal. If the market, if the if the market or the environment shows up exactly the way I expect it to, how do I feel? Before. I could, depending on what the situation was. <laughs> yeah, satisfied at least, at the very least, satisfied, right? A sense of well-being, correct? Is this not universal? And to whatever degree the environment does not show up the way I expect it to, how does that feel? Yeah, pain. Emotional, it has the potential to cause me to experience emotional pain. So when you really get right down to it, to think in probabilities, we have to learn how to manage our expectations. Our expectations have to be in line with the realities from the market's perspective. But I'm gonna, before we get into that, just, let's, let's just finish up these errors. Okay, I hesitate as a result of an internal argument, get in too late or not at all. Jump the gun, anticipate an edge that never develops. Getting out of a winning trade too soon, leaving money on the table. Uh, move a stop close to your entry point, get stopped out and the market goes back in your favor. Let's see if I had another one. Okay. Anyway, these are all the, um, not all the errors that people can make, but all the typical errors that people make as a result of not thinking of probabilities. So what exactly does it mean to think of probabilities? It means believing at the very core of your identity that, one, anything can happen. <coughs> Two, every moment is unique. Three, there's a random distribution between wins and losses on any given set of variables that define an edge. And four, you don't need to know what's going to happen next to create consistent results. That's it. Now think about those statements. just for a moment. If I believed that anything could happen in any given moment, and I believe that every moment is unique, now think about, think about the word unique. What does that imply? Right. Now think about it. Every moment is unique. That means not like any other moment. Unique need means not like any other moment. If I believe that, that this moment is not like any other moment, then what does my mind have the capability to associate that moment with? Why put the trade on? I can accept any outcome. I can accept any outcome then. We say, why put the trade on? Because you've got an edge. No, bearing not having an edge. Oh, no, yeah, you, no, you've got an edge. You've got an edge. Okay. You've defined your edge. But, but, okay, this moment, there's a pattern, and this moment is like, let's say, we'll put it this way, just so you're not confused about this, that you've got an edge, and you've got, you're basically trying to develop or a two-tiered belief system. One, we're at the macro level. You know that patterns exist, but at the micro level, the patterns have a random distribution in terms of outcomes. So that I've got a pattern, and that as a result, that pattern has a potential to, to cause me to, let's say, by behaving in the appropriate ways, to enrich myself. But that the outcome to that pattern is unique in relationship to anything that happened in the past. 
So, but I was just talking about the concept of uniqueness itself. In other words, if I, once I get that trade on, if I believe that, that, that each moment that it's on, that each moment is really unique in terms of what the market is telling me in that moment, then I'm going to keep my mind open to what it's telling me from its perspective. What I want to do, the whole objective, is to disassociate what's happening now with any other outcome that you had. To disassociate. <clears throat> Because the reality is there really is no relationship. That, that really is true. Our minds don't look at it that way, but it really is true. Same thing, there's a random distribution between wins and losses on any given set of variables that define an edge. Now if you think back to those errors, those kind of errors that we, that, that we have the, t the, the capability of making, or I don't need to know what's going to happen next to create consistent results or make money. If I have those five beliefs installed in my mental environment in a way where they're functional, and we're going we're gonna to get into what that means to be functional tomorrow, then I have basically eliminated my potential to define and interpret market information in a threatening way. If I've eliminated my potential to define and interpret market information in a threatening way, then my expectations will be neutral. And I will be in an objective state of mind, leaving myself open to whatever it is that I've perceived about the nature of market movement, meaning that I'll be able to perceive all the patterns that I've learned about. Won't define a risk in advance of getting into a trade. If anything can happen and every moment is unique, am I going to get, if I believe that, am I going to not predefine my risk? I define the risk, but won't take the loss because it, and it turns into a bigger one. The only way that I could, I, could, I could not take my stop out of the market, let's say, or not execute a losing trade based on where I, where my, let's say, my predefined risk point would be because I have convinced myself that I know what's going to happen next. Is there any other way I could do that? I, I pull my stop or not execute a losing trade only because, one reason, Every error that you're going to make, all these errors right here, every single one of them, we're going to go down the list, and any other ones that you could think of are all going to be the result of thinking you know what's going to happen next. Thinking, assuming, or believing that you know what's going to happen next is what causes the errors. These five fundamental truths that I just gave you about the nature of the market break that, it does, I shouldn't use the word break, it stops that whole process of thinking, assuming, or believing you know what's going to happen next. Because you've learned that you don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money. And you don't. Really, what is trading when you think about it? You, you break the act of trading down, it's really simple. What is it? Not just yeah, not just an educated guess, but what is it? You you yeah, an educated an edge. Define the risk and execute the trade. It either works or it doesn't. That's all trading is. That's it. You don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money in this process. That isn't part of the process. The process is define an edge. How do we define an edge? A higher probability of one thing happening over another. Not I what going to happen for sure a higher probability of one thing happening over another. Define the risk, an educated guess. 
or it can be precise, whatever, use a mechanical system, it doesn't matter. All I'm saying is that this is the process. Define an edge, get an edge, define the risk, execute the trade. That's trading. That's trading. There's nothing in that process that has anything to do with knowing what's going to happen next. When you get right down to it, it isn't any different than pulling the handle of a slot machine, only you've got the edge in your favor. The pattern either works or it doesn't. You, and you've got a way to, to take your profits, but otherwise that's, that's going a little bit beyond this discussion at this moment. All I'm saying is that you know, either works or it doesn't, you go to the next trade. Either works or it doesn't, you go to the next trade. Either works or it doesn't, you go to the next trade. If you're the kind of person who likes to use their intellect to determine what's going to happen next, you're going to have a problem being a trader. That answers your question too. That's someone who needs to know what's going to happen, who needs to have that kind of certainty that I don't act until I know what's going to happen next. They're, they have problems being traders. You have to be really comfortable with uncertainty, that it doesn't matter. Because what do I need to know? I, first of all, I don't have to take responsibility for what the market does. I don't know what the market's going to do. It's a collection of individuals who are going to act in some particular way. I know the market's going to do something. I know it will do something. That's the expectation I have when I get into a trade. I think it's going to do something. What? I don't know. I don't have to know. I don't care. What do I know? What do I know? What, what do I have to know? Come on, what do I need to know? What? You have an edge and there's a random outcome. I need a red edge and what else do I need to know? What well, my risk is, right? Your risk. Yeah, that's it. That's all I need to know. And how I'm going to take my profits. That's what I need to know. That I know every time. If I don't know that every time, I don't get into a trade. As long as you get into trading with this idea that you've got to know what's going to happen next, you think you're going to know, you're always going to be susceptible to these errors. You're always going to be susceptible. I'm not saying you won't make money, because you know what? You can make money whether you make these errors or not. Remember? It does, you don't have to know anything about the market. You don't have to know anything about yourself. You don't have to know anything about what we're talking about to make money. And you can make all these errors and still make money. Yes or no? Yes, you can. Will you make consistent money? No, you won't. That's a fact. So we're kind of getting to the point where we're getting an idea as to what we need to do here, right? Are we getting an idea of what we need to do? What do we need to do? Stop trading. Stop trading. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> what, what do we need to do? Where do you think we're going? Where do you think we're going in the next two days on, on Saturday and Sunday? Where are we going? What are we doing? Go ahead. Somebody. Go ahead. David, what? Reinforcing these these notions. Notions? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right, Dave. It's all right. I love it. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, that's exactly that's ex Yeah, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We are going to learn enough about the nature of beliefs and how they function in our mental environment so that we can effectively install these beliefs inside our brain at a functional level 
without any conflict. That's what we're going to learn in the next two days. Besides also learning how to, how to identify and neutralize self-sabotaging beliefs and what to do about euphoria. This is what this workshop is all about right here. When you've got those in your brain at a functional level, you will stop the errors. They cannot, they cannot happen. And to the degree to which they do happen is just an indication as to how much work you need to do to get those in your brain at a functional level. And if you really want to if you really want, if your desire is strong enough to create consistent results, you'll do the work. If it's not strong enough, you won't. It's, it's kind of that simple. And you don't feel you don't have to feel obligated to do the work, like I said in the very beginning. It may take it might take a long time to get to the point where you're really willing to do what you need to do to get those beliefs in your mental environment at a functional level. Because you may have other agendas about other agendas about why you trade that are in conflict with these particular beliefs. There may be a lot of other reasons why you put on trades that have nothing to do with what it means to be consistent. Can anybody think of reasons why people trade that have nothing to do with being consistent? What might be some of those agendas that I'm talking about? Every feeling in the world. Every feeling in the world? Okay, well, yeah, but anything specific. Revenge. What? Revenge, getting back for a trade you lost. No, that, that's an agenda, sure. Revenge. That, that's not, that's not going to promote consistency, I don't think. Uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty inconsistent with, with what it means to be consistent. Anything else? Addictive behavior. What? Addictive behavior. Okay, addicted, you know, it could be addicted to random rewards, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. That would be an agenda that would be inconsistent with what it means to be consistent. Anything else? Entertainment. Entertainment. Perfect. Anything else? Boredom. Boredom. <laughs> That's part of entertainment, but you know, you entertain yourself when you're bored. <laughs> Don't some people like to be heroes? I work with a lot of traders who, who generate losses just so they can work their way out of a hole. Floor traders especially like doing that. They got sort of a cowboy mentality. Self-destructiveness. Yeah, right. The attention too. Some people they uh, right. they have big losses. People gravitate to them and say, "I'm oh, sorry about that." Right. And, and you, you probably did you get that on the tape? You, oh, okay, good. You're talking kind of kind of low, so I didn't uh, okay. pick it up. Gotcha. Masochism. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there could be just just any number of reasons, like you said. Just all the, the range is really great, but but you know uh, that's why the, those agendas will be reasons why people won't do this kind of work. Not till you resolve, not until you resolve that what you really want first and foremost is to create consistent results. And that's why I said in the very beginning, you know, a couple of hours ago, that that it really has a, has a lot to do with the way you, you want to live your life. But I will say that, that if you do the exercise I'm going to give you to install those beliefs, and if you do it diligently, and if you do it until, until you can do it without any internal conflict or, or argument, you will have succeeded in installing those beliefs. It does work. Good. But like I was going to say, it's a matter of wanting to do it. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of how much time we got, by the way? Where are we? In terms Four, of nine. Four or nine. Four nine. This is going to take a few minutes. Um, is, is this whole idea of, of, of being addicted to, to random rewards. Um, it's really a powerful addiction, by the way. There are, number of, there are a number of studies that have been done, especially on primates. Where if you if you start primates out, you know, with, with teaching them to do a task, and you reward the task 
where you give them a reward for the task on a consistent schedule. So they do the task, they get the reward, they do the task, they get the reward. If you stop giving them the reward, what do you think happens? Stop doing the task. They stop doing the task. But reward them on a completely random schedule, okay, completely random, and from their perspective now, they don't know that you've decided they're never going to get rewarded again. Okay? That's what you've done. You've decided you're never going to reward them again. It's really <laughs> And what scientists have found is that it depends on the personality of the monkey. Because some people are more, more let's say, susceptible to addictive behavior than others. I think there's probably some, you know, probably some <coughs> sort of chemical makeup that has a lot to do with it. But there are some monkeys who will, who will do the task indefinitely. They never get rewarded again, and, and they keep on doing it. And that's why there's some people that can get addicted to you know, pulling the handle of a slot machine or not pushing a button. But. And, it, and you know, it has a lot to do with just that kind of euphoric high that we get when we get this unexpected surprise. And trading can, no matter what, no matter how we handle our trades, whether we handle them very professionally or whether we handle them very haphazardly, we can always get that unexpected surprise. <laughs> and that can be really addicting. But there are other, other problems too. And that's, and that's, you know, one of the things that, that um, um, this is in trading in the zone where I kind of related this, where I was, at a, I was speaking at a conference and uh, I was talking to an editor from one of the one of the major publishers in our industry, and he asked me, you know, he said, you know, why do people who are so accomplished, you know, in their in their lives, in their other part of their lives, in their professions, you know, can fail so miserably at, at trading? You know, what is it about about trading where so many people are we all doing the wrong things, and um, and yet we're so you know, and yet people get into it, and and we're really attracted to it. And uh, the way I answered them was that, was that I said that you know, people really are attracted to trading because what it really offers us is this unlimited freedom of creative expression. It's like it's completely, it's an endeavor that is sort of outside all the normal social structure that we all grow up with. So for an example, when you consider that each of us are born into some sort of society, so a family, you know, a, a region, a state, a city, a country, whatever, and all these societies have rules about how we need to behave. And the problem is, is that when the, people can be born into these social structures where, there, where just there's naturally a high degree of correspondence between the, the child and the rules that already exist. And yet, and then other kids can be born into the social structures where there's a very high degree of, of a lack of correspondence, meaning that whatever the kid is naturally attracted to, now you think about it, Regardless of, of, of a child's, let's say, um, inherent behavior characteristics, there is one characteristic that is common to all children. And what is that characteristic? Curiosity. Curiosity. Curiosity is a characteristic that is common to all children. Leave children alone, and they are naturally, they will naturally explore their environment. Quite naturally. Now, are all children naturally attracted to the same things. So in other words, there is some sort of selective process going on, isn't there? In other words, out of all the things that are available in the environment for a child to be attracted to, children will naturally select. And this goes all the way back to like, you know, when the, when the kid's an infant. So there is some sort of force inside of us, inside of each of us, that naturally selects what we are attracted to in the environment out of the, of the vast array of things that, are, that we can be attracted to. Some societies, meaning families, parents, whatever, support these natural attractions to some degree or another, and some do not. The problem is that when they're, when they're not supported, meaning when we're denied our ability or denied, let's say, uh, the experience that we're that we want as a result of these natural attractions, meaning that our parents are saying no, no, you can't do that, or whatever. 
it, it builds up what I call these denied impulses. In other words, if you think about it, I think like, like our mind in some ways is like when we're attracted to something, it's like when a child, you know, take a child that, that's, you know, they're curious, they're playing with something, and you take it away from them, and what do they do? They start crying. Why? They're not done experiencing, okay? It's like, it's like the desire for a certain type of experience creates like a vacuum in our mind. And that vacuum has to be filled with, with the experience that, we're, that we desire. Deny it, in other words, as an outside force, deny that experience, and, and the child will naturally cry. And crying is a natural mechanism to, to let's say, uh, put the child's mind back into balance. What scientists have also found is that tears are composed of negatively charged ions, and crying, I think, is a simply a natural mechanism to put our minds back into balance because what happens is that, is that, that the, ex the lack of experience, I mean, the, child being, the lack of the child being done with that experience didn't fill up the vacuum, and the crying reconciles the imbalance so that the child can be in a state of relative balance and go on with their lives. However, many children are not even allowed to cry, right? Especially males. And so therefore, as a result, we end up growing up with a buildup of these, of these denied impulses. So that when we, as adults, when we get to the point where we discover trading we find our sort of panacea of freedom, where we basically make all the rules. The only rule is that you have enough money to open up an account. Other than that, you decide when to get in, you decide how long to stay in, you decide how, when to get in, I mean, to get in with how much, and when to get out, right? In each, in each moment, the market does offer us as traders this opportunity to get into, to add to, detract from, or exit a position every moment. And we make all the rules. The problem is we have this natural, we grow up with a natural aversion to making rules because we've been trying to get away from them all of our lives. And that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to even do the kind of exercise that I'm going to, going to suggest on Sunday is because it does require making and adhering to certain rules. And you probably will find there'll be a natural resistance to even do doing the exercise regardless of the benefits that you perceive that you'll derive from it. And that's all right. And that's what I said before. It might take a long time to get to the point where you're ready to do this. because it's a two-edged sword when you, when you look at it. I mean, it's like here we've got freedom, but with freedom comes responsibility because, because or, even the, the, or even not wanting to take responsibility because of the ways that we, the painful ways in which we learn about what we're responsible for, what we're not responsible for, but also with freedom comes the potential to damage ourselves. So we have an unlimited environment where we can do an unlimited amount of damage the way to prevent ourselves from way to prevent damaging ourselves is to institute some regimen or some rules, but what we have are a backlog of denied impulses where we weren't allowed to express ourselves as we grew up, giving us a natural aversion to creating even our own rules. They're not somebody else's, they're our own. So it's like, hey, I found this on this panacea of freedom, unlimited, I can express myself in any particular way, possibility of unlimited riches, but oh, I've got to create some rules, and not only, not only do I have to create them, I have to learn to abide by them. Whoa, hey, huh, no way. Which makes it easy to trade randomly. Because see, when you trade randomly, meaning when you're using virtually an unlimited number of variables to either enter or exit a trade, not a limited set, but in essence an unlimited set. What I mean by an unlimited set of variables? Okay, you know, listening to the news, 
uh, or listening to a friend or you know maybe in combination with some technical advice or, or technical, technical uh, uh, signal that you might get. Nothing that's systematic. Because see, by trading randomly, you can easily take credit for the trades that work and easily do what? Sep yeah, distance and separate yourself from the trades that didn't. Psychologically distance yourself. In other words, not take responsibility. Trading is the you know, hardest easy money that you'll ever make. <laughs> Trading is simple, and it can be easy. When you get the right mindset, it, it is easy. So it's almost 9 o'clock. As far as I'm concerned, we're done, unless you guys have any questions. And also, before we split up, I just want to, want you to, want to know that what are we going to do tomorrow? What do you think we're going to do? What are we going to get into and why? This is really important. What are we going to get into and why? Mental vision of where we trade at now. A what? A mental vision? Well, our okay. men, what our okay. mental state is now. Okay. And the inherent weaknesses and how we do that. Okay. Uh, but can you say it more specifically? Where we're screwing up now. Okay, yeah, we know that. We already did that. We did that tonight. Okay, but what are we going to get into tomorrow? What, what specifically are we going to get into? Stalling beliefs. Yeah, we're going to learn about the nature of beliefs. Because in essence, this is what, what this is all about, right? It's really all about what we believe. Because what controls our interpretation of information? Maybe I wasn't clear about that, and that's why I'm asking. And I'm glad I did. What controls our interpretation of information? Something has to. Or what we believe, exactly. That's, without really saying that, that's in essence what I've been saying all along. When I said, if, if I believe that anything can happen, then 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 that will control my interpretation of information in a way that will cause me to act in a way that's consistent with what I believe. Something has to control the way we interpret information. We don't all interpret it the same way. There has to be some mechanism. So that's the mechanism that we're going to learn how to work with in a way so that we can interpret market information in a way that's consistent with the realities from the market's perspective. In other words, how do we interpret market information in a way where we keep our minds objective and neutral? Market gives me an edge, I find the risk, I take the trade. Edge, define the risk, I take the trade. If you want trading to be more than that, then you probably don't want to be here. Because that's really all trading is. It ultimately becomes an exercise in just accumulating money based on your ability to objectively <coughs> perceive an edge, define your risk, have a plan for taking profits, the trade either works or it doesn't. And you just keep on doing that over and over again. How do you reconcile some of that with being an intuitive trader where you just you know take the trades that come along? You're way ahead. We'll get on that on Sunday. That's a good question, but where you just you know, this is basically just an introduction. So yeah, we're gonna talk about trading intuitive. Remember I said I was gonna put this into a context, trading mechanically, subjectively, intuitively? I'm, we're gonna definitely gonna do that. But we definitely don't want to talk about that right now. That's way ahead of ourselves. Anything else? Does everybody have uh, stereo headphones, stereo tape player and headphones? We're going to use them tomorrow. If not, you can buy a cheap one at a drugstore somewhere. Yes? So we're bringing in the Walkman tomorrow? Yeah, bringing in the Walkman tomorrow, right. Is everybody, yes, everybody got that? Okay, well, tomorrow morning. 7.30? 7.30. Well, 7.30 there'll be like some, like a continental breakfast. We'll, we'll, start. Start. we'll start around 8. When do we uh, need the uh, tape players for? I don't know yet. Well, I, that's, I, I don't know. Okay. It'll be sometime, probably tomorrow afternoon sometime. Okay. Is anyone coming in here tonight? Uh, I, don't think, I think they're going to leave all the equipment. I, I think the so door's going to be locked. Here and, yeah, I would, think, I would say you'd be able to leave everything you want. Because you can make money without any skills. So when you say make money, yeah, that's great. 
but really consistent money, consistent money is a byproduct of the kind of skills you've acquired. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately because all these skills are mental. They're not physical skills. They're not muscle memory skills. It's not like you can hire a tennis coach or hire a golf coach and show you how you know to make the proper swing and just practice at it over and over and over again. And eventually you'll get it in your muscle memory and, and you know be able to be able to swing the racket correctly or swing your club correctly. But still, even with that, a consistently good score in golf is a function of what? Now yeah, what's going on in your brain? Because you can learn how to swing the club absolutely perfectly, but not do it every Watch time. And the reason why you're not going to do it every time is because there are going to be distracting thoughts flowing through your brain, causing you to focus on something other than what you need to be focused on in that moment. And it's the same thing with trading. If you're focused on the money, then you're not focused on the skills you're trying to acquire. In other words, really what I want you to do is get to the point by Sunday afternoon and say to yourself, the only reason why I'm going to trade Monday morning, the only reason why I'm going to trade is to use my trading as a means or a vehicle to acquire certain mental skills. The skills that you know that will promote consistent results or that will, re that will result in a consistently rising equity curve or a rise, an equity curve that, that rises on a nice consistent basis. What did we learn yesterday? What sticks out in your mind? Beliefs. Oh, beliefs, okay. But anything, anything more specific? You don't need to know what's going to happen next. You don't need to know what's going to happen next. Good. However, what, that, that's, but that's a problem, isn't it? Why, why is that a problem? What is it about the way our minds are wired that, that caused that particular thought or notion, as Dave would say, to be a problem? <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> Associations, exactly. Yeah, not, not only do we want to know what's going to happen next, our minds, by the, by the way that they're wired, our minds are wired in a way. They're hardwired like the motherboard of a computer. It doesn't mean we can't change it. It just means that, that at the moment, until you do change it, until you do something specific to cause your mind to think differently, it will automatically and without any conscious thought on our part, meaning we don't have to think about this happening, it will happen automatically. If the now moment, which we've learned is unique, and why do we know it's unique? When, when these patterns, in other words, what we want to do is technical analysis helps us identify patterns in group human behavior. The patterns repeat themselves over and over and over again. The outcomes to the patterns, however, do not. And the reason why we know that the outcomes to the patterns don't repeat themselves, at least in relationship to the last trade or the trade before, is because there are always different people involved in the, out, in other words, in the outcome of the pattern. So the pattern can look exactly the same, it can feel exactly the same, it can measure exactly the same, and because of those similarities, our minds will automatically associate what's happening in this now moment with something that's in our brain as a memory and cause us to think as a result of that that we know what is going to happen next based on our memories not on what's happening in the market in that moment or what the market's potential to move is in that moment or what the market might be telling us in that moment. This is an automatic process. We don't have to think about this happening. It's automatic. Basically, what you have to do is render this process, this automatic mental process, kind of dysfunctional. Make, make it not function any longer. You can do that. The best traders at some point have, in one way or another. They may not have done it you know, systematically or methodically, but the way that we're doing this now in this workshop. Usually it takes some catastrophic, <coughs> emotionally catastrophic experiences for someone's mind to be wired differently. Meaning that one of the consistent 
themes that runs through every great trader's life is that they've always, every single one of them usually has lost one or more fortunes before they got to the point where they became consistent. It's these kind of catastrophic, and that doesn't happen to have to, have to, have to you, Greg. Okay, that doesn't have to happen. Okay, I know, that's what I'm saying. I, I, but you know, you probably read a lot of stories and thinking, okay, when, when's that gonna happen to me? <laughs> it doesn't have to happen, what? <laughs> anyway, um, go ahead, what were you gonna say? Yeah, I was just saying, one of the thoughts to me, the longer you're in, a lot of us also have transitioned from other fields. The longer you've been in other fields, you come with more baggage, it takes you longer to, uh, quote, get rid of your, uh, you know, the, the, this baggage because you work in other industries, take you longer to uh, cleanse your mind? Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, think about it. I mean, it, 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 let's put it this way. You take somebody who grows up in a trading family, whose, whose father, let's say, trades, or his uncles or his brothers trade, and, and they, they know, they understand let's see, the inherent nature of what trading is all about. And one of the first things they teach them is, you know, let's say, especially in Chicago, where, where there are a lot of trading families, where there are generations of traders that, that, that trade on the floors of the, of the futures exchanges. I mean, one of the first things they're gonna teach them is that, you know, let, let's learn how to cut our losses. First, let's learn how to scratch a trade, and then let's learn how to cut our losses. <coughs> and so if you want, the first thing if you understand is, okay, if, if, if an inherent part of being a successful trader is, first learning how to cut a loss, then you know, it probably won't, won't take that long for you to learn how to do it. And, and, and all the, let's say, all the thinking implications that go with doing that, as opposed to coming from a situation where you know, you're, you're coming from a profession where you're expected to know what's going to happen next. You're relied upon, you're relied upon to know what's going to happen next. And even if you don't know what's going to happen next, you can say and act like you do, and people are going to believe you anyway. Right? That's right, because that's what people want. And if you're wrong, it doesn't matter, because you can intimidate people to make them act like you're right. <laughs> and, and that's one of the reasons why, well, it's also another reason why it is so difficult to adapt to the trading environment. Because many of the skills that we learned to get what we want, in other words, to fulfill our expectations. Remember we talked last night about expectations? An expectation is what we believe projected into some moment, some future moment in the environment. And when the environment shows up the way we expect, we all feel good. So one of the ways that we've assured ourselves of having our expectations fulfilled is through our superior social skills. And what do I mean by superior social skills? Being able, getting ourselves into a position where we can control other people. Whether they agree with us or not, whether their beliefs are in harmony with what we want or not, if we can, you know, if we can rise above, let's say, them in a way that causes us to have uh, control over their behavior, then we can assure ourselves of getting what we want. Most of the people that gravitate towards trading that don't start out that way when they're, you know, let's say, you know, when they're early 20s or something or out of college are professionals that come from those kinds of superior social skills and find it extremely diff difficult to adapt to the trading environment because of it. Because the market just is going to do what it's going to do. And there isn't a damn thing you're going to do about it until you can trade at a level that, you know, you can basically cause prices to move in your direction. And even then, it's going to be difficult to ha make it happen for very long. And so the only thing you have, you're going to find you have control over is the way you think. That's the only thing you're going to have control over. You can control the way you think. You can control how you perceive information. You can control, I'm going to say it again, you can control how you perceive information. But it's a completely different process. Now you're working inside yourself instead of working out there. Yeah. You can control the way you perceive information. 
And that's really what this workshop is all about. That's why we're going to talk about the nature of beliefs, because there is a mechanism by which we interpret environmental information. There has to be. If you look, about the, you look at the nature of the environment and, and the, way that, the ways that it can express itself, the environment can express itself in a virtually infinite combination of ways. And yet we don't perceive all those ways in any given moment. And not only do we not perceive all the different ways that the environment can express itself, we can, we can be standing virtually in, in the same position and looking at the same event and interpret it in completely different ways. Now, wh why is that possible? How is that possible? How can two people interpret the same event in different ways, completely different ways? And we've all been in these situations. It's the source of many of our most violent arguments. That's right, different beliefs. In other words, we're, we're perceiving the situation from different beliefs, different perspective. In other words, different beliefs are operating on our perception of information in a way where the, the information is interpreted in, interpreted in a way that's consistent with the beliefs we're operating out of in that moment. So when I say we can control how we perceive information, we control, we control that process by changing the beliefs we're operating out of. We operate out of different beliefs and we're going to perceive the information differently. Because the problem is this association mechanism that I've been referring to causes us to think that we know what's going to happen next. In other words, if the moment is similar, I've got a pattern. Not only is it similar, it's virtually identical to the last one that, that, that showed up five minutes ago or five days ago or two hours ago. <coughs> Two hours ago, it was a winning trade. Now, if I let this association mechanism, you know, influence the way influence the way that I think, or how I see things, I'm automatically going to think that I know what's going to happen next. Automatically, without any conscious thought about it, and as a result of thinking that I know what's going to happen next, I will behave in a way that's consistent with what I think. And that behavior might, in fact, be a trading error. What, remember the errors we, we put up yesterday? That, that is a list of all the things we can do, but those are the major things that we do that cause us to, what, detract from our ability to create consistent results. So I may hesitate. I might not, I not, might not predefine, my, predefine my risk. I might not end up taking profits. There's, there's any number of things I could end up doing because I think I know what's going to happen next. When the reality is, what's the reality? I, I don't know. I, I, th for me to know what's going to happen next, really, now think about this. For me to know what's going to happen next, I would literally have to be able to read the minds of everyone who's participating and everyone who has the potential to participate. So that I would know how, how when they cast their vote by putting on a trade, you might say, you know, how that's going to influence direction overall. Yeah, that's all it really is. It's just a guess. Whenever you're putting on a trade, it's just a guess. And the more you look at it that way, the less, the less significance you'll put on any particular trade in a way by just knowing that in really what you're doing is just kind of pulling the handle of a slot machine and but you've got the odds in your favor. You're, you're the house. Because of technical analysis, you're the house. But only if you can execute properly every single time. That is the key. Execution without errors. Every error, other than self-sabotaging beliefs, every error you're going to make as a trader will be the result of thinking that you know what's going to happen next. Every single error. And the problem is, sometimes you will. Sometimes you will think you know what's going to happen next, and it will come true. And sometimes it'll be two times in a row. And sometimes it'll be three times in a row. But I guarantee you, guaranteed, 
there's that trade out there with your number on it that's going to cause a catastrophic loss if you continue to think that you know what's going to happen next. Because, again, I'm going to repeat, you can make money whether you don't make these errors or whether you do make these errors. You can make these errors and still find yourself in a winning trade. But if you want to create consistent results and not inflict psychological damage on yourself, then you're going to have to take your mind through a process that, that let's say, renders this association mechanism dysfunctional or non-functional, not dysfunctional, but non-functional. You're going to have to keep your mind focused in the now moment, meaning what's the market telling me now about its potential to move in any particular direction based on the pattern it, that it's displaying in this moment. Not, not based on my memory of the previous trade or the one before that or the one before that, because this moment is truly <coughs> unique. It may end up being exactly the same. But if you allow yourself to think that, you are putting yourself in a position where you have the potential to make errors. So are we kind of are we kind of together about where we need to go with this? Where so where do we need to go? What do we need to learn right now? How to get rid of all the old thinking. How to get rid of all the old thinking. Yeah. Okay. So you can make room for the educated guess. Right. So you that you're just making educated guesses. And where and 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 where would you say kind of be more specific about how to about when you say get rid of all the old thinking? In other words, look at it this way. You guys, you're sitting here, and, and you have this opportunity, let's say, to, to expose yourself to certain, certain, let's say, categories or kinds of information. But what you end up exposing yourself to really is a function of your desire. Now think about this. It's really a function of your desire. What do you want to learn right now? Change what do you want to learn? Tell me what you want to learn. How to change my beliefs. Okay, you want to learn how to change your beliefs. Great. Do you want to learn that, John? No. No? Okay, so there you go. What do you want to learn? I want to know. I want to know it's all right to take a loss rather than fearing it. Okay, and what do you think you have to do to, to learn that? I mean, some of it's mechanical, some of it's knowledge base, but it gets back to that I know what the market's going to do next, and so I just sit there. And so what do you think you're going to have to do to get to the point where, well, where you know it's all right to take a loss? We can go back to changing beliefs then. Oh, okay. Changing beliefs. Okay, <laughs> good. Anybody else? What do you want to learn, Mark? Well, uh, not back to comment earlier. I don't think you can, you can purge your mind of the previous process. I think what we have to do is to create switching points that make us play <coughs> a different track rather than the old track. Exactly. Yeah, because one of the things we're going to learn as we start discussing the nature of beliefs is that I don't think it's even possible to change a belief. It's hard if you, you know, you said a lot of the traders you talked to have blown up. I've been trading for four years, and I've just got, I've blown up twice big, and, uh, you know, you make a lot, then you blow it up, then you make a lot, then you blow it up. And I think there's a certain point you reach where the pain is so much, so, so strong that you do change your beliefs and that it does get rewired. Right. And in my previous career, I spent the whole time controlling and negotiating. I always liked it. When I was trading two years ago, I'd pick the <coughs> biggest, baddest stock out there and I'd reverse it. So I wanted to negotiate with that stock. And the more it went up, the more I'd put on because damn it, I'm going to beat it. And Because that was what I did in my previous career. And eventually you get to such a level where the pain is just, and, and it's it's not even just for, or not even just financial. It's embarrassing because you got other traders saying, what the hell are you doing? Right. You know, it's, it's that kind of stuff. And then you get to that point, and I think that's when you can finally switch and realize what you're talking about. But prior to that, it's hard. Yeah. Because you have to trust the mark. Don't you, get to, don't you get to a point of replacement, though? I mean, isn't some of that that when you're taking a loss, you're supposed to put yourself in a mental environment where if you were out of the trade, 
what the reward of that is. I'm not sure if I know what you're getting at. When you say the word replacement, you're right. See, when I said you're using the words, you know, change of belief, what we're going to learn in terms of at least the way I look at it is that, is that I don't think you can actually change the structure of a belief that once it exists, it'll be in our minds till the day we die. But what we can do is draw the energy out of it. What we're going to learn about the nature of beliefs is that they're basically energy structures. And, and that you can draw the energy out of, an, out of a belief that, that let's say, we, we find is non-functional or dysfunctional. Not non-functional, but it doesn't serve us. In other <coughs> words, there are ways that it causes us to look at information and behave that doesn't serve our purposes. It doesn't serve our desires. And so what we can do is we can draw the energy out and, and replace it <laughs> with another belief that we put energy into. But see, well, anyway, I'm, I'm going to get to that stuff later. But yeah, that's what you're doing. Is, so when you talk about replacement, so you can go ahead and now finish what you were saying. I think that old track's always there, but you just indelibly superimpose the new track. And the more you do it, the more apt you are for making a mistake. But you're always going to be well, possibly. Yeah, no, no. Track. But see, no, Louis, no, here's the thing. The, the old track is always there. Okay. However, what we're, you're going to learn how to do today and tomorrow is take the energy out of the old track so that it doesn't have any potential. So that, so that there literally is no more potential for you to behave in that way. Or for you to see or perceive in a way that's consistent with that belief. That's how you know you've really done the work. Is when your thoughts are never drawn back to or you, you don't feel compelled to behave in that old way. What's that? Belief. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, the, and see, yeah, in, in the discipline trader, is that the discipline trader trading in the zone? I'm not sure which. Trading in the zone. Trading in the zone. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. Anyway, look at it this way. That's a, that's a perfect example. I mean, I'm sort of getting ahead of myself a little bit, but it's a perfect example. If you can draw the energy out of one belief, if it's possible to do it with just one, it's possible to do it with any. And a perfect example is, I grew up believing in Santa Claus. Now, do I believe in Santa Claus now? <laughs> what? Yeah, only my trade, right. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> now, can you, now listen, to me. can you say that I believe in Santa Claus now? We don't know you, you don't know me, you know, well, I don't, okay? But here, <laughs> the scene, but, that's a good answer. But, but here, here's what's really important about this, is that I would, in, in the course of my conversation with you, and the words that I would use, I would actually use words that don't really represent what's going on, just because of that's the way we talk. So I would say, no, I don't believe in Santa Claus. But what we're going to learn in a little bit, as a matter of fact, when we, when we get started with this, is that actually the, what I'm saying to you is that my belief in Santa Claus still exists in my mental system. There is a belief in my mental system that says Santa Claus exists. But I have another belief in my mental system that says that Santa Claus doesn't exist. It's a matter of which has the most energy. When I was five years old, the belief in Santa Claus had all the energy, and I didn't think any other possibilities existed. So therefore, if somehow or another I could transport myself back to that five-year-old mentality, and somebody knocked on the door and said, Santa Claus, or all of us, for example, who grew up with that belief, and said, Santa Claus is out in the lobby, how would that belief act on my perception of that information and my behavior? What would happen? I would sprint to the lobby. My perception of the information would be that it's true, it's true, it's real, and the energy in that belief would cause me act on my behavior in a way where I would do, I would, you know, be jumping over you guys to get out in the lobby. I don't think so. I think I might have just changed the mode to get fest. What's that? To suddenly realizing you're in the guild fest. Yeah. You are so close. <laughs> if you have to produce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so who's that fool down the lobby? Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so now if someone knocked on the door and said Santa Claus is in the lobby, how would I behave? How would I perceive the information? Yeah, right. I, yeah I, it would be irrelevant to me. And, and as a result of it being irrelevant, 
how you know of me perceiving interpreting that information as in, as irrelevant how would it act on my behavior i would just keep on standing here i wouldn't change it now these two beliefs are contradictory beliefs they're two contradictory concepts that exist in my mental environment side by side let's say but there's no from a functional perspective there's no conflict you see from a functional perspective I don't have a conflict at all because one has all the energy the other one has virtually no energy at all that's what we're going to end up doing we're going to end up identifying those dysfunctional beliefs in other words that cause us to perceive market information in what what's what do we want to do we want to perceive market information or or a lack of perceiving it from as threatening right remember the up and down ticks here, the up and down ticks, they're neutral, aren't they? From the market's perspective, it's just neutral information. That form into patterns. The patterns give us an indication there's a higher probability of one thing happening over another. What causes us to perceive these up and down ticks in something other than a neutral frame of mind? Our fears are one, but basically our interpretations, right? That, then, that, that tap us into our fears. Our interpretations that tap us into our fears. Say again. What causes us to perceive these up and down ticks as anything other than neutral? Our interpretations that tap us into our fears. Here, I'm long this market. The market is giving me exactly what I want. I get two or three down ticks in a row. My interpretation taps me into my fear that the market's going to take my money away. Now, the, the, the down, these ticks are no longer neutral. So far, these ticks haven't given me any indication at all that, let's say, whatever trend this is forming has been violated. Or even based on my rules that say, you know, I've got to let this, lot of let, got to let this play itself out to tell me, you know, what the possibilities are. Am I willing to, am I willing to, to uh, accept the risk of finding out? Well, obviously, if I'm ready to jump out of this trade right here, then I have really not accepted the risk. But the point that I'm making is that now the down ticks take on something other than a neutral let's say valence. Now they're either overly negative or negative or maybe even overly positive. How many of us have been in winning trades that think that, you know, we just, it just it's never going to end? How does that happen? Even after the market has given us ample, ample information to tell us that the, the trade is over with, okay? Here, you get so enthralled over the fact that the market's going up, 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 up. You forget about the fact you've got significant reference points with this high, this high, this high. The market gives you an isolated high, starts reversing, and you know what? You didn't take any profits. You're down here at your original entry point. Next thing you know, you're losing money on the damn thing. Didn't take a dime out of it. And why? Because the neutral... In other words, from the market's perspective, these neutral up and down ticks took on an overly positive significance in your mind. Based on your interpretation. So if we want to create consistent results, we're going to have to, let's say, be able to trade from a carefree, meaning lack of fear, a noticeable absence of fear, carefree, objective state of mind. And what do I mean by objective? 
Remember we talked about that yesterday too. We're going to go over it again, but just what do I mean by objective? Do you remember the example I gave you yesterday? <coughs> Anybody tell me? Having access to everything you've learned? Because when you're operating out of a state of fear, what happens? Do you remember the principle? What's it? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. What? You, you look at the uh, information that you can... Uh, yeah, fear does what? It narrows your focus of attention, right? To what you Even fear the most. Right. Percent. Narrows your focus of attention. Now, the interesting part about in, in, our normal, in our normal daily lives, we'll, if we're afraid of something, our, our focus of attention will narrow to the point where we are focused exactly on what we're afraid of. But in the market, since the market, it's a little, it's a little, it's kind of it's a little bit different in the markets because the markets give us both upticks and downticks. And if I'm afraid of one of those, if I'm afraid of the downticks for whatever because I'm, you know, because I'm long, then in this case, what fear does is cause me to place an inordinate amount of significance on the upticks. So in, in essence, what I'm doing is avoiding the significance of the downticks. My mind will do that for me automatically. I don't have to think about this. This is an unconscious mechanism. It isn't any different than the example I gave you yesterday. This is a hot burner. I accidentally put my hand on it. My hand comes off. I don't have to, there's no internal arguments. I don't have to think about this. I don't have to make a decision about it. It happens automatically because of the way our minds are wired. So what we're doing is we're becoming conscious of these mechanisms so that we can do something to compensate for them. If it is our desire to create consistent results or fulfill the potential that we know exists in the market. In other words, to become a, let's say, greater version of who we are because that's in essence what we're doing. By accumulating more money based on our trading, aren't we becoming greater and greater versions of ourselves? Aren't we becoming more and more of who we once were? Because as you accumulate more money, what are you going to do with it? You might hoard it, but then again, you might spend it. And as you spend it, you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're creating something different. You're creating something other than who you once were based on the ways you can express yourself that you may not have been able to express yourself in those particular ways because you didn't have the amount of money that you have now. Is there something about this protection? <clears throat> and maybe it's just me, but are you up a horse? Chances are not, yeah, John. <laughs> in that example there, you're up a horse. What's that? You, what? There seems to be, in my mind, you protect the money you, you made. It seems to be like something precious versus, you know, you're down and I'll, I'll take a nickel or a dime, you know, loss and get out of the trade. But something about it, already I've, I've got a quarter already on this trade. It's this, I hate to ever come out and say, you know, if I'm up a quarter, let's say I get out at 15 cents as an example because it, it falls through. Mm -hmm. And many times I get out of the trade because of that. It's, it's, does that feed into your fear of your issue uh, well, it seems it, more it, it, for me. What's that? It seems. You know, I, I I get it. I'm just saying that if I'm up on this trade, I try to protect it more. Uh huh. And you know, I miss out on the bigger trades as a result of it. It seems like. Yeah, that's really hard. It's it's really hard to learn how to take profits. Out of all the skills that, that you're going to learn, I mean, one of the most difficult is really learning how to take profits. But I'm going to give you a way to do that. I'm going to give you a mechanism on Sunday that'll that'll do it for you automatically. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to really think about it in the way that you're thinking about it now. And it's simple and it's easy. It's, 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 it's an easy, it's just basically learning how to scale out. But, you know, it, as much sense as it makes, you, it, it, it always amazed me how resistant people are to doing it. You just divide your position up into fractions and start scaling out as the market gives you money. I give myself money as the market makes it available.
then if it comes back, or it comes back your entry point even, you know, it's like you still have a fraction of your position on, and you can let it see if it's gonna just bounce right back off support again, and go right back up, or go through it, and then maybe it might take a small loss on the last portion of it. But then again, since you don't know how far it's ever gonna go when you get into a position, you want to you want to be able to set the whole your whole t profit taking regimen up, regimen up in a way where you can take maximum advantage of whatever the move is, whatever the move ends up being. I think I had a little breakthrough. Um, I got out here that I had wrote out you know on the plane yesterday what I wanted out of this. One is I wanted to be more patient. And two is I wanted to uh, basically let go of the fear so that when I'm buying it on the bid as it comes in in your example, um, <coughs> that when I buy it I don't just immediately bail out when it goes down another tick. And I think what I got was, um, what you said was I didn't accept the risk of the trade in the beginning. Right. So it's basically if you just accept the risk of the trade, I can be more patient and I can allow it to jiggle against me or hold it and go from there with it. Right. And so that was my breakthrough. And what does it mean to accept the risk? What exactly does that mean, Greg? I guess it means uh, to just adhere to my stop loss, and that's okay. The, 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 part that, the part that I was looking for was that's okay. What does it mean to accept a risk? What does it mean to accept anything? I'm not sure I understand. Well, and that's why we're doing this, okay? What do you think it means to accept anything? What are the implications of acceptance? Whether it's in the market or anything else in your life. What are the implications? Okay, understanding. Realizing that we can say. Well, it's predefined that you accept that. No, I'm not, I'm doing more, more generic, and not, not the market. What does it mean to accept anything? Whatever happens, you're comfortable with it. There you go. When I said okay, whatever happens, you're comfortable with meaning you're at peace with whatever happens. It's, it, in other words, the situation is completely reconciled in your mind. You, if you're going to risk a penny on that trade or risk a dime or whatever you're going to risk, that you have genuinely accepted. Genuinely meaning you're at peace with the fact that you're willing to spend the money. And there's no internal conflict. So just although we're getting way ahead of ourselves, but we're in this moment right now for Greg, okay? Thanks. It's all right. It's just, so, so, <laughs> so what would it, Greg, what would it mean if you're not at peace with it? I guess if I'm not at peace with it, I got fear. And then and what are you going to do? Okay, fun. what are you going to do then? You're not, a, you're, you see, so now you realize, now, now, you're, now you're looking at this chart, you say, okay, I've got to risk a dime. That's what the market's telling you, right, based on the pattern. Yeah. Based on your previous experience at this pattern, say, this pattern warrants risking a dime to find out if it's, if it's going to work, right? But you, now you're learning to monitor yourself and realize that, you know, you're, you're uncomfortable with that dime. You're not at peace with it. It's not reconciled. There's conflict. And you can know that in many, many different ways. One would be just the amount of hesitation you might have to, you know, to, to hit your keyboard or pick up the phone. Now, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to find some way to deal with the fear. I've got to do a little more breathing. Uh, I guess I've got to acknowledge that the fear is there and then, and then reevaluate, do I want the risk? Okay, good. Now, and, and, what, and what, what might the solution be? Tell my solution and say, yeah, okay, I can live with that and go on. What if, you really, what, what, if you're just, what if you're just kidding yourself? What if you're lying to yourself? Because if you're uncomfortable in the first place, chances are just by you saying, okay, I can live with this, isn't going to do it. It may, but chances are it might not. What would really do it? What would really get you comfortable? I guess just trust in myself that I know that if it goes down the dime, no. You know, no, no. What's going to get you comfortable? Only if it goes in my way. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, scale back until you are comfortable. 
So if you're trading 1,000 shares, trade 500. And if you're not comfortable with 500, trade 200. If you're not comfortable with two, trade 100. I don't like that answer. Yeah, or don't put the trade on. Okay, the, the best thing would be, in that case, is just don't put the trade on. If you can't get comfortable with the risk, where you're completely reconciled, then either don't put the trade on or scale back okay. until you are comfortable, until you make it a carefree situation. You know, at 1,000 shares, risking a dime, you know, I mean, that's only 100 bucks. I mean, that's not, I mean, I, realistically, we're not, we're not, these numbers are probably not what you do, but at a thousand shares, <coughs> risking a dime, it's uh, you're uncomfortable, and you can't get comfortable. In other words, you're being honest with yourself, and you can't get to that you can't get to that really carefree space. And so, if you scale back to let's say 750 or 500 shares, and it be becomes virtually meaningless to you, like that's probably why you don't like it because it's virtually meaningless. But at least you're in a carefree state of mind. And you're participating, and you are participating. It's also a good way to reinforce whether or not your your idea will, will play exactly. out. Exactly. What difference should it make, right? <coughs> whether you're trading five hundred or a thousand or ten thousand, really? Because if you're thinking about, if you're really thinking about what skills I need to acquire and trading properly, it shouldn't make any difference at all. Right. So scale back until it's carefree, until it's meaningless, because that's exactly what it has to be. Because when it's meaningless, then you've eliminated your potential to define and interpret those up and down ticks in anything other than a neutral way. Because why? Because why? Because you don't care. You don't give a shit. Yeah, good. So that does make sense to you? No? You don't like it. I don't know. <laughs> I guess, you know, um, I want to argue with you. I guess because I've been, you know, scaling back. I've been in trades where you got a hundred shares and you're scared, and been in trades where you got five thousand shares and you're scared. And I can I can see situation. I can completely agree with you. You you got a hundred shares and you're scared because because you don't trust the pattern, even though you're only trading a hundred shares. You're in a 5,000 shares because you're scared because 5,000 shares you're risking too much in relationship to the amount of equity that you have. In any case, you're still, you know, you're, you're well, let's put it this way. You still have the potential to make trading errors because you're afraid. Now, I'm not saying the, none of these trades are going to work out. Any one of them could work. Well, I, I think maybe what it is is because I've been burned for 10 points in a minute and a half and you can't get out of 100 shares. So and you know, and, and, and would that be in a market that is in a in a stock that's pretty liquid or illiquid? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, trading illiquid stocks. Yeah, but you okay. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Or, or scare. Or let's put it this way: if there is an in between, you're 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 aware of it, and and you're constantly monitoring yourself. But we're getting we're getting way ahead of ourselves right here. We really are. Yeah, so, what? You can start off being a carefree state of mind, right? Yeah. Let's say you've actually got to that point. Where you okay. Can trade. And you can right. handle the risk. It's predefined. You accept it. Then something happens, like as uh, this is John. Greg. Greg. Greg says, and all of a sudden, you know. The market really moves against you. You can't get out. How do you stay carefree under the circumstances? I mean, you really like taking a beat. You you may not. You, you, you may not be. I'm not saying you. First of all, Drake, you, you you can't. When you say how do I stay carefree, it's not a matter of, of how do I do it in the moment because it'd be extremely difficult. In most cases, it's probably impossible. What you do is you set up you you set up the circumstances in your mind in advance. So when these situations occur, they don't affect you in the way that they used to. In other words, it's the kind of training that you go through. So for an example, this isn't any different than, than pilots or people in the military or people that, 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 are, that their, their profession is inherently dangerous, 
where they have to do rescue missions or something like that. What they do is they train over and over and over again so that what would be catastrophic to a, a normal person is just everyday circumstances to them. He's handling it. Yeah, so, not, so, you don't, so you can handle it from a relatively, if not, completely carefree state of mind, confident, carefree state of mind. It's a matter of how much, how much you know, training and work you want to go through to get yourself to the point where a circumstance like that wouldn't affect you. It's possible, Jake. It really is. It's just a matter of how much effort you want to put into it. If you believe your edge is, if you believe you have an edge too, then the vacuum one, sometime in the future it's going to go the other way. That's right. You'll Go get vacuums in your and... favor too. Right, exactly. You will. You'll get vacuums in your favor. That's right. <clears throat> but, but I think the downside of what you're saying is you control the amount of capital you risk in that particular trade. Because my partner's in the training and he's been sitting four weeks and it's still closed. So wait, wait. Say this again. Your partner what? He, he was in a trade where the stock ceased trading. Uh -huh. well, <laughs> the, probability, <laughs> uh, the probability is if they have some sort of violation of the policy or whatever, and, and he'd probably lose all of it. So you've got right. to Enter any trade with the idea that that right. That's right. Exactly. Like the you exercise. That, that's right. But the, the exercise that we're going to set up tomorrow, the, you know, like the trading in 20 trade sample sizes, you know, we've got to set this up in a way where, where the amount of money that you would need to risk to do this exercise is equivalent to losing on all 20 trades. If you took 20 losses in a row. You've got to be able to accept the risk and set it up in a way where you can accept the financial, the financial value, dollar value of losing 20 trades in a row. The likelihood of that happening is very remote, but it could happen. At least from my perspective, I get caught in these vacuums because I, because I'm trying to guess the market. You know, I'm trying to find the bottom, and then the market. You know, I, I know this is the bottom. And then it just, the market just starts you know, screeching down further and I'm caught in it. So if I did the quote unquote risk analysis uh, and I didn't have that belief that I knew what the market's going to happen, I wouldn't get into these, most of those fixes anyway. You know, just personally. You also try to find tops? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 that's, that's, what you know. <laughs> that's when the market rolls and you get caught in it, you know, for the most part. <laughs> Uh, how are we doing time wise? What time is it? So almost nine. You know, ten to nine. Okay, so again, I'm going to ask you guys, where are we going with this, and and why we need to, why do we need to go there? <clears throat> it goes back to. Uh, changing your perception of your beliefs or uh, I guess rewiring your beliefs. And the reason we need to go there is you're not going to achieve what you truly want to until you address that. Okay. So you learn to think in probability. Right. So you learn to think in probability. Right. Because that is the nature of the way the market moves, right? See, when we're dealing with people, interacting with, with our family and our friends, you know, based on what they believe and what we've learned about the nature of, of the way they express themselves, we can pretty much count on what they're going to do and under what circumstances they're going to do it. And, and, when they, and when they deviate in their behavior, we can chastise them for it, can't, can't we? Right? And we can, and, you know, like sort of like a rubber band and snap them right back if, if, if that's what we, you know, if that's what we think is appropriate. And... and uh, we're inclined to, to think that way. But with the markets, it's different. The markets really do, I mean, really, everything exists from a probabilistic perspective when you get right down to it. But, but the markets, for sure. The markets are, are the most immediate environment where, where there is no doubt that everything is really probable. And all we're really learning to do is, is get our thinking to conform with or be in harmony with the way the markets exist. That, that's really all we're doing here. We're just we're taking these conscious steps 
to train our minds to be in harmony with the way the market exists from its perspective. So that when we're in harmony with it, we can flow with it. And we can better able to take, to, you know, to take, take advantage of the opportunities that the market is constantly making available in every time frame. That's all we're doing here. We're adapting the way we think to conform with the market environment. Because we know that the way we think now doesn't work real well. It doesn't mean we can't have winning trades. It doesn't mean that we can't even create you know, some, some uh, level of consistent results even. But it just depends on what your goals are, what your desires are. How much, how much do you want to create for yourself? Because at some point, you're going to find that if you don't think objectively, and if you are trading with fears, it's all going to catch up with you. And then it starts to get really frustrating or exasperating. Or, you know, the most exasperating thing that you could think of in terms of the way it's affecting your life. Because until you understand the nature of beliefs and how they, and how they operate, on our perception of information and behavior, all of it seems mysterious. It's like, oh, I don't get it. I don't get why I can't take advantage of something that, that is readily available right now, in this moment, and the next moment, and the next, and the next. It's all right there. I can see it. The opportunities exist. The patterns flow by all the time. Why can't I give this to myself on a consistent basis? It seems kind of mysterious, right? Well, it ain't going to be mysterious after Sunday afternoon. You'll know what you need to do. I guarantee you that. You will know what you need to do. And whether you do it or not will depend on the level of your desire. just like anything else. When you make up your mind to do something, what happens? That's right. When you really genuinely make up your mind. Now what does that mean when I say make up your mind? Uh, not necessarily. Just, when you make up your mind, basically the implications are you make up your mind with so much energy, with so much conviction, that you have literally wiped away all the other conflicts. Now think about what I just said. When we make up our minds about something, that's, that's what that implies. When we make up our minds about something, we're doing it with so much energy and so much conviction that we literally, I'm going to use the word erase, but that's really not what happens. We literally, let's say, take all the other conflicting energy that may exist in our mind and neutralize it so that we can now step into that experience without any conflict about any problems, because when there is no conflict, when we are acting out of a belief, an unconflicted belief, do we have any problems behaving? Do we have any problems doing exactly what we need to do? So if my desire is to step here, my desire and my belief and my ability to do so are in complete harmony, there's a complete level of correspondence, and therefore I can take that step. Makes sense, right? My desire and my belief are in complete harmony with one another. There's a 100% correspondence. If my desire is to step there, but I have conflicts about what it means to step there, well, what's going to happen? I might not be able to step at all. I might only be able to take a half step or a quarter step and think to myself, well, there's nothing there. There's, there's nothing there. What's stopping me? Why can't I go? Why can't I do the rest of it? Because mental energy is tangible. See, there might not be anything in physically impeding my progress. There might not be anything in the environment that says I can't do that. And that's why trading is so frustrating, because there's nothing in the environment stopping us. There isn't anybody saying no, 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 like when we were kids. Or in a corporate environment where you have ideas. 
and there's somebody above you saying, no, 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 that won't work, or that, that's ridiculous, that doesn't make any sense, I don't like it. See, there's none of that. And now we have direct access to the markets electronically. We don't even have to pick up phones anymore. We don't even have to listen to our broker anymore, say, oh, you really want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> it's point and click, point and click. Instantaneous feedback, instantaneous fills. Couldn't be better than that. It couldn't be easier. Can you repeat something, Mark? You said whenever you step into something with 100% conviction, you erase. Oh, you, you erase all the conflicts. All conflicts. When you make up your mind, make up, making up your mind implies, making up your mind implies that you're doing it with so much energy and so much conviction that you're basically erasing any other conflicting energy that's inside of you. So there's, so there's nothing in the environment stopping us. That's what makes it so mysterious. Because if you don't understand how beliefs function, then it will be like just, just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So that's why we're going to learn about beliefs. Or let me I'll give you another example. It would be uh, who who has seen situations where where uh, 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 like uh, scientists have done experiments with uh, fish, for an example. They'll put they'll put a they'll take a fish tank that's like this big, put a piece of glass in half the half the tank, so that the fish that are you know the fish that are in this half of the tank, there's nothing over in this half, and they leave the glass in there long enough and they take the glass out. Now there's no barrier, but the fish will stay in that, in that, in that half of the tank. Elect, same thing with electronic dog collars. Beliefs are tangible. That's what we're going to learn. Beliefs are tangible. They're real. So for an example, you put an electronic dog collar on a dog because you want them to stay in a perimeter. What you do is you bury a wire with a radio transmitter on the collar so that every time the dog gets near the perimeter and usually do it with some visual things too to reinforce it, the, they'll, they'll start getting uh, electric shocks. And the closer they get to the perimeter, the, the more intense the electric shocks get. You don't have to do this very long and you can turn the system off, even take the collar off, and the dog will stay in the perimeter. And also, I think conceivably, feel the electric shocks. That's why they stay in the perimeter. See, there isn't anything physical calling, causing the shocks anymore. It's all inside their mind. I know people who have to literally carry, have done this, and have to pick up their dog and carry him beyond the perimeter to put him in the car. <coughs> it doesn't, doesn't work any different with people. It's exactly the same. Once we acquire a belief about something, that belief will limit the way we perceive information or how we behave in a way that's consistent with the belief, regardless of whatever, what other opportunities or potentials exist beyond that belief. And they're real. So let's take a break. And we'll <coughs> okay, so we're ready, right? Go ahead, Greg. I have a question. Ah, Greg has a question. Okay, good. <laughs> Break and, I believe, <laughs> and I believe this too. You well, certainly don't tell me if you don't believe it. You say you got to develop this carefree attitude, and I agree that you have to be flexible. Uh, sometimes I've seen this in other people, and, and even with my own trading. Sometimes you don't get a feel until you have a little pilot position. A little what? Pilot. You, a little. You buy 100 shares to get a feel, is it going up or is it going down? Oh, okay. Just yeah. to get the feel. Sure. Somehow. You're probing the market in a way. In a way, yeah. but it also gives you a different connection with it because you can feel you're long and the thing's going down and it's doing something to your mental state that, oh, hey, I better be getting, I better be 
flipping this thing out, and it's really a sail, not long. Um, so how do you... You know, I've seen people, you know, arbitrarily, they don't, you know, they come back from lunch and they just immediately, within three minutes, put on a position because they want to get the feel again. Sure. How does that reconcile with the carefree attitude? Well, I don't care if it's going up or down. I, mean, I don't know. First of all, I don't really see a contradiction. Okay. But, but it's also a better question for tomorrow. All right. Okay? Because we're, that's the kind of question that, that, that's the kind of question that relates directly to what we're going to talk about tomorrow anyway. Okay. So if you, if you want to save it till then. All right. We'll just wait till, till John's done. Because right now we're going to talk about the nature of beliefs and get into that stuff. Since we know exactly why we're doing this, right? Everyone, everyone, we're all together on this. We know exactly why we're going to talk about beliefs. So I sure hate to talk about it when, when everyone doesn't know exactly why we're doing this. have like this burning desire to get into this material. <laughs> I feel this burning desire from everyone here. Let's do this now. <laughs> I have yet to encounter an audience that, <laughs> that had that burning desire to do what we're about to do. Anyway, <laughs> let's do it. Um, okay, we're going to talk about the nature of beliefs. Interestingly enough, <laughs> There probably isn't anything about that has more impact or influence over the way we experience our lives than our beliefs. And interestingly enough, if, if I were to say, well, you know, let's just let's just do an inventory. Let's just let's just start out writing down just exactly what what do you believe? Chances are your minds will go blank. And you wouldn't even be able to think of one belief. Now, I mean, you know, then you start thinking about political beliefs and religious beliefs and things like that. But the point that I want to make is this, is that, like I said, beliefs, there isn't anything that has more of an impact on the way we experience our lives and what we've learned to believe. And yet, we don't normally go about our lives thinking about the impact of what we believe on how the way in which we experience our lives, the way in which we experience our lives. In other words, think of it this way. We weren't born with any of our beliefs, were we? Right? Did anybody think that we were born with any of our beliefs? Every single one of our beliefs were acquired in some way or another. And regardless of how they were acquired, It's like they cause us to experience our lives and the world in a way that's consistent <coughs> with whatever was instilled in us. And in many cases, what was instilled in terms of what we believe was done so not at our conscious direction and certainly not, as, not, as, not from a conscious choice. But yet, these beliefs that were instilled still have this major impact on how we live our lives regardless of whether or not we want to live our lives that way. Because there can be a huge difference between what we learn to believe and what the way we want to express ourselves. So just, just as a little bit of an overview, it's like beliefs have this major impact and yet it seems like we know nothing about them. Now think about this. It seems like we know nothing about our beliefs. Not, I don't mean the specific, any specific belief that we might have about the nature of the way the world exists or our relationship to it. I mean just about the characteristics of a belief. We know, we know a lot about the physiology of our, our anatomy. We know how our eyes function and how our ears and, and our hands and our arms and our legs and our muscles and our internal organs. 
scientists have been dissecting bodies for years. And it just seems like it's only lately that even the psychiatric community has started to focus on specific beliefs instead of personality traits or personality characteristics. Because our behavior is definitely influenced by a combination of both. And you could say that personality characteristics are, in, in some cases, probably genetic. In other words, our behavior is a function of, of both camps, meaning environment and genetics, what we've learned to believe in relationship to the kind of inherent characteristics that we were born with. Because we're definitely born with certain filters about the way we interpret information. Those are just basic filters. Some children seem to need more attention than others. That's a filter. Some children seem to be more outgoing than others. That's a filter. Some children seem to be more inquisitive than others. That's a filter. So there are some kids, for an example, that you could give every ounce of attention that you could imagine <coughs> giving, and the kid that wouldn't be enough. And there are other kids you could do the same thing with, and they tell you to, you know, get away, leave me alone. It's one of the big problems with parenting, is making those kinds of adjustments to the unique characteristics that each kid is born with. And what's always kind of amazed me is, is too, is that is how when, when it's kind of the first reaction of, of parents uh, when they find out that their, their children are individuals, <laughs> that, that they really are individuals, and that, and that the next kid, if they have more than two, is different than the first. But that shouldn't really surprise us, right? Because how are our minds designed to think? Our minds are designed to associate. So what's going to happen is that when the second child comes out and into the world, our mind will automatically associate the second with the first, making the two identical because of the similarities, and then only to be shocked to find out that, oh, this is a different kid. In some cases, it'll be completely different. Does that all make sense now? Why parents would be shocked? Because, because of this automatic association mechanism. And everyone also, too, Keep in mind, because something I didn't say before is that, is that there, everyone's mind has a different, let's say, toleration levels, let's say, for what's similar or dissimilar. Meaning that, that we can take something that's going on right now in this moment that has similar characteristics or properties than something that's in our mind. How similar it has to be to make it identical in our mind is all different based on the individual. In other words, it seems to be different tolerances for that kind of similarity or dissimilarity when the two get connected in, in one and the same. But, but I'm going to go into more detail on that in a second anyway. So what I was saying before is that beliefs have certain properties and characteristics. It doesn't really matter what the belief is. They have certain properties and characteristics. And if we're going to learn to work with our beliefs, so that we can control our perception of how we perceive market information. Remember, we, what, that's what we want to do. We want to control our perception of information so that we no longer have the potential to perceive the up and down ticks as threatening. Then we've got to understand how they work. So we're going to get into like a mini psychology course here for the next couple of hours so that you have this kind of basic understanding of how beliefs function so that you, can, so that you know how to work with them. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how do they get formed? What are they and how do they get formed? Anybody got any ideas? Experience. Your experiences. Okay. Now when we talk about experiences, what are we really talking about? Let's look at the most fundamental level. Because that's what we have to do. Just life in general, day to day activity. Day-to-day -day activity, but look at it like, like when you talk about an experience, like what is an experience? What is it? Perception and feedback. Well, okay, perception and feedback, but, but aren't we connected to the external environment? In other words, you know, like anything inside my skin, let's say, or let's say I'm going to say inside my mental environment, is 
can be or is different than, I'm going to make a distinction between the two, our mental environment and the outside world. We're connected to the outside world through our five senses. I'm connected to this external environment through my eyes, my ears, my nose, sense of touch and taste. What happens, and the external environment acts as a force. So we could say, let's categorize everything outside, regardless of what it is, as a force, expressing itself. Everything outside is expressing itself. Everything in the external environment. It's so, like the, the hot stove, you know, you perceive it. Okay, but the, but see, you could say, is the hot stove? How is the hot stove expressing itself? Well, perception. It's no, no. Think it from the stove's stove's pers no stove's pers perspective. How is the hot stove expressing itself? Neutral. No, it's not neutral. No. But it doesn't care. It may not care, but it's not neutral. Not neutral from our perspective, anyway. How is the hot stove expressing itself? Giving off heat. As heat. It's energy. As heat. It's expressing itself as energy. That's what I want to, want to get at. There's this cause and effect relationship between ourselves and the environment. In other words, in other words, what you've got is a situation where all of the external forces that of nature, nature has an infinite, basically probably an infinite combination of ways of expressing itself. You've got humans, everything, everybody outside of ourselves and all the different people and all the different cultures and all the different ways that people believe about the way the world exists, they will express themselves in a way that's consistent with their beliefs. So that you take nature, plants, animals, waves, air, volcan volcanoes, whatever. Plants, animals, insects, people, and then everything man-made now think about this, and everything man-made, which also expresses itself, these are all external forces that can express themselves in virtually an infinite combination of ways. And there is a cause and effect relationship between ourselves and the external environment, so that we're connected to these external forces, so that these forces have an impact on our senses, and as a result, get transformed into electrical impulses of energy and stored in our mind and let's say in the beginning at least as a as as let's say in, a, in the case of an infant as um, not a, not just as a memory what's the word I'm looking for as a um, undifferentiated memory you might say so if we if we kind of kind of put ourselves in the mind of an infant an infant wouldn't have any way to categorize all these different experiences because the way we learn to categorize experiences is through, through a structure we call a language, which is like this abstract symbol system. Reference points or something. Yeah, a language would be like a reference point. But let's say, let's say what happens with an infant is that he has all these undifferentiated memories that just probably floating around in his brain without any way of categorizing what they actually mean. But what happens is that like I said, the environment acts as a force on our senses and creates, and, 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 our, we, and scientists know that these, these experiences get transformed into electrical impulses of energy, but then what happens to them after that? They become what we call memories. Now, are these memories, do they have any particular structure? Well, we don't really know because we can't get in the mind of an infant. But we do know that eventually they form into some sort of structure. They form into structures based on how we teach children to organize these experiences.
So what we have is when you look at a language, for an example, a language is, is nothing more than, like I said before, an abstract symbol system. So what we have are words that we have letters that form into words like this. What does that mean? Now we know it has meaning because it's something that we've learned, okay? We have, let's say, Now, by themselves, these letters that form into this word and these words that we can put together into concepts, by themselves, they are virtually meaningless. They're just scratches on a piece of paper. If this were a foreign language that none of us knew how to interpret, what would it mean to us? Absolutely nothing. If they were Egyptian hieroglyphics, what would it mean to us? Absolutely nothing. But these are words that, that have a meaning in each one of our minds. How do those meanings occur? Through your experiences. experiences. Reference points. Or your actions. Being taught. What's that? Go ahead. Being taught. Being taught. OK, yeah, exactly. In other words, someone making an association between certain environmental phenomenon, certain ways that the environment can express itself and act as a force on our senses, and associating it with this, these abstract letters, cold, hot, night, daylight, word. And these, these now these, now when the energy, now this is what's really important here. When we associate the energy of the experience with the word, it takes on a tangible reality or a tangible meaning. So it just isn't an abstract word any longer. It now has the potential to act as a force on our senses from the inside out. Most everyone just naturally assumes that the environment expresses itself as a force on our senses and that the energy flow is one way. The environment acts as a force. We perceive that force through our senses and as a result, affected by it. I touch an ice cube, it is cold. I touch something hot, it is hot. I see darkness and no sunlight, and it is night. But what allows me to recognize all this as cold, hot, night is the fact that the cause and effect relationship reverses, meaning that once, once something is let's say, installed in our mind and associated with these particular words or concepts, then the words or concepts take on the quality of the experience itself. Are you guys with me on this, sort of? So an abstract concept like word, just a word, it's just a word, right? Oh. You know, just, just a word. But it's not just a word, is it? It's now an energy structure in our minds that will have the potential to act as a force from the inside out. 
So for example, when we've, when we've learned to make distinctions in the charts in terms of how do, I, how do I even know that an opportunity exists? When these patterns come up, when we've learned to recognize patterns, it's like there has to be something inside our mind that, that causes us to even recognize the pattern in the first place. And it's, these, and it's these concepts or these structures that are created as a result of our experiences and associated with these words that act as a force on our eyes so that I can see what I've learned. Act as a force on my ears so that I can hear what I've learned. In other words, we learn to make distinctions in, this, in all these collection of forces that exist in the, in, the ways, in, the, in the various ways the environment can express itself. So that I know how to make the, I can, I can make the distinction based on what I've learned about. If I haven't learned about it, can I make a distinction about it? No. It, it literally can be invisible to me. Something that we haven't learned or experienced can literally be invisible and yet be right in front of our eyes in terms of a potential or an opportunity. We'll get into that, how that works in a second, more graphically. So what I'm going to say is that beliefs are energy structures. Now, can energy take on shape or for, take on a shape or form? In other words, when I say that a belief is, is structured energy or an energy structure, does that make any sense to anybody? Does it? I guess maybe in the context that it can take, give, um, create an emotional impact on you, if that's what you're referring to. Okay. Uh, that's not. That's good. That's not exactly what I'm referring to, though. Can anybody anybody think of uh, something in the environment that would be analogous to beliefs taking on our, our energy taking on shape or form? What's that? Oh well, okay, Adam. But but what do you what do you mean, Sean? The, the energy is there, and it's but it's not actually a form that you can actually see, but you know the energy is there. Okay. What would what would be what would be something analogous to that? A what match. Would you, what? A match. A match. I don't know about that. Lightning. What well, lightning? Well, but light. But yeah, you're right. Lightning is yeah. You're absolutely right. Lightning is not a made of atoms and molecules, right? Okay. Good. What else? Yeah. What? Yeah. Death. Yeah. Provoke I provoke a emotion. When you no, say when you say energy structure, I think of the can structure take can energy take on form. That's all I'm asking you. How can energy take on form? Yeah. How? What ways? Just tell me the ways that energy can take form. Electricity is good. Okay. And, but, but in what way? Within the light. Body. Within the body, it can change the chemical structure. Well. What's that? Within the body, it can change the chemical structure. That's true, but that's not what I'm getting at. I'm getting at something else. Are my words structured energy? In terms of sound waves? I'm not making these, hey, you know, I'm not doing that, right? It's struck, I mean, even that's structured, but, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that, that, that what you're hearing is energy, correct? And is it not structured in a particular way? What about all the information that's carried on microwaves? All our, all our phone conversations that's transmitted through the atmosphere on microwaves, is that structured energy? Radio waves, structured energy? Can light take form? Can light take form and structure and have dimension? Television. Television? Or what about, what about, uh, Flashlight. What, what's that? Flashlight. Flashlight? Flashlight. What about laser, uh, 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 um, Laser shows? What about holographs? You know, we're taking, you can project a holographic image. You got a three dimensional image. What if this were a three dimensional image projected into this space? You've got dimension, right? You've got, you've got uh, height. You've got circumference. You've got width. I can measure it. But is it made of atoms and molecules? No, not this. I mean, if I'm saying this is a holographic image. So the distinction that I'm making, this is really important, is that if it's not made of, that, of atoms and molecules, then it's not taking up any space. 
this is really critical. You have to get this concept. That beliefs are structured energy, but they don't take up space. Now, how do we know that beliefs aren't made of atoms and molecules? Why do we know that? Can't touch it. Well, no, I didn't think about this. Now, we no. How do we just know that they're not? How do? Why do? Why do? Why do? Can we make that assumption? You know, I'm I'm here. I'm making a statement, but but why can I even make that assumption in the first place? They're limitless. They're. Yeah, but why do we know that? Why can you make the? Why do you? Why are you saying what you're saying in terms of the limitless? Because it's um, substantial capacity. If they're in the brain, you can get as much as you want in there. I'm not going to disagree with that, but still, I, 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 is there any other? Is there any other tangible way to know that beliefs are not made of atoms and molecules? You can't see them. Yeah, you're okay. In other words, in other words, we know that 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 brains. Let's see, people's mental environments or brains have been dis dissected down to the really the, the, the atomic level. And we know, at least as far, as far as I'm concerned, I haven't read anything or heard anything where somebody has experienced somebody else's beliefs firsthand. Meaning in their natural form as they exist inside our mental environment. Even people's memories can't be <coughs> experienced firsthand. We know that scientists have learned that if you stimulate certain parts of people's brain, that they will experience certain memories that, that, let's say, that exist in that particular region of the brain. That's where they're stored. But the scientist doesn't experience the memory firsthand. The scientist only experiences the memory based on how the person related the memory to the scientist. And as of yet, no one has, has you know, experienced what someone's memories are or what someone's beliefs are as a first-hand experience that's something that's made of atoms and molecules. Brain matter is made of atoms and molecules. The synapses that cause us to think in the ways that we do and how information gets transferred from one part of the brain to the other uh, is made of atoms and molecules. But the actual information that's transformed back and, or transported back and forth into different areas of our mind don't seem to be made of atoms and molecules. Does that make sense to everybody? They seem to be made, I'm just going to say, of structured energy. Electrical energy. Yeah, electrical energy. Now there's a really, there's a real important implication here. That, that if the environment can express itself in an infinite combination of ways, and if beliefs and memories aren't made of atoms and molecules, wouldn't that imply that we have an unlimited capacity to learn? And what keeps us from learning everything there is out there to learn? What keeps us from making every possible distinction there is to make? Beliefs? That's right, our beliefs. What we've already learned. What's the force inside of us that says when we're, we're in, encountering something that we haven't experienced yet, but that's in conflict with something we already have experienced, say, I don't believe that. I don't believe it. What's that force inside of us that causes us to instinctively, I don't believe that? That's right, the force of the belief that you already have. In other words, that is an inherent characteristic of a belief, isn't it? To immediately, and without any conscious thought, resist any other information that might be in conflict with it. Regardless of how functional or dysfunctional the belief may be. It doesn't matter what it is. That's just the way beliefs operate. But that's not what I'm getting at at the moment. What I'm getting at at the moment is that you understand this nature of, of energy that takes on structure and form. Energy that takes on form. 
You have to get, you have to, in other words, I want you to make the nature of a belief as tangible as possible in your mind. The more tangible that we can make it, the easier it is, you know, the easier time you're going to have to work with them. There's something else analogous to uh, structured energy that, that's probably the best example that there is, and that's dreams. Aren't dreams structured energy? If dreams, let's say presumably, if they're taking place within the confines of our, of our skull, how, how, could that, how could that be possible if it weren't for the fact that energy can take shape but not take up space? Because in dream landscapes, dream landscapes can be as real as physical reality, they can have all the dimension of physical reality. We can be in rooms, we can interact with people, we can just we can be outside. And yet, how could all that be possible if it's all taking place inside of our mind if it weren't for the fact that energy can take form but not take up space? Does that make sense? <coughs> so, do you guys have any questions about this so far? I'm on page two of section four. So what beliefs do is once we acquire one, they reverse the cause and effect relationship that we have with the environment. Meaning that instead of the environment acting as a cause, as, it, as, as it's expressing itself. Remember, the environment is just energy. We can, we, can, we can really just boil everything that happens in the external environment as simply energy expressing itself in some particular way, whether it's nature or other people. It's just the environment expressing itself in some particular way, acting as a force on our senses. Once we acquire a belief, the cause and effect relationship reverses, meaning that now what happens is that energy gets interpreted, interpreted in a way that's consistent with what we believe. It gets shaped. In other words, the force on the inside, <coughs> the structured energy on the inside, acts as a direct force on our eyes so that we perceive information in a way that's consistent with what we believe. It acts as a direct force on our ears so that we hear information in a way that's consistent with what we believe on our sense of touch, taste, and smell. So that when I, when I touch this, I know that it's a marker. I can feel it. That's the concept, this structured energy in my mind of a marker so that I recognize what this is. And as a result, they also create our expectations. And remember what I said, what is an expectation? Belief projected into the future. Yeah, a belief projected into the future. Into some future moment, whether it's, a, whether it's a second from now, a minute from now, a day or whatever. It's that we're expecting the environment to show up in a way that's consistent with what we believe. Just so I understand, this concept of the, uh, the environment having, once you have a belief, the cause and, effect, cause and effect relationship is reversed. If I don't have a belief and you uh, utter a phrase to me, if I have a, it, it, they're just simply words. Once you attach a belief to that though, I can interpret that in a multitude of ways as opposed to just simply a phrase that's being projected at me. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at. If you're saying like a first time experience, Yes. Okay, like a first time experience, you'll just you'll just take it in a way that, that directly relates to the way the environment was expressing itself. Right. So it'll it'll be there'll be a direct one to one relationship. Right. But now there may not be a direct one to one relationship if there's any similarities to anything else that you might believe. So there could be part of it that could be brand new and other parts of it that you might interpret in ways that are consistent with something that's already inside of you. So right. that you'll start making connections immediately. Right. 
because that's what our minds do. They automatically, remember our minds are wired to associate, so we'll make these connections. Will, if there's any similarities at all, our minds will start making connections to what we already know. And the reason why is because it's uncomfortable to be in a state of confusion. See, information that we can't make any distinctions about creates a state of confusion until we've learned to make certain distinctions. What does it mean? What does it mean? Now when we know what it means, we're not in a state of confusion anymore. That doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that what we've determined it means is functional or that's going to help us in some way. But we'll get into that in a second. I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. So what do beliefs do? They manage our perception and interpretation of environmental information. They create our expectations. They determine what actions we take or how we decide to express ourselves. Now think about this. Behavior expressing ourselves requires energy. I am going to express myself and you are going to express yourself in a way that's consistent. Your outward behavior is, will be consistent with the energy that's inside of you. It's that simple. It can't be really any other way. And the energy is inside of you. How that energy is structured are what you believe, or is what you, or is what you believe. Now, you may not know what you believe, meaning that you may not have taken the time to say that or to extrapolate your behavior and say that, you know, for me to behave this way, this is what I need to believe. Or for me to, be to behave in this circumstance, this is what I have to believe. But that's not a very hard thing to do. In other words, in, in, you know, in the consulting, you know, coaching business that, that I've had for many years, that's exactly what I did do. You could just describe to me what you did, under what circumstances you did it, and it got to be very easy to extrapolate it into this is what you would have to have to believe to behave this way under these circumstances. It takes energy <coughs> to express yourself. And how we express ourselves is going to be consistent with the energy inside of us. To the intensity to which we express ourselves will be consistent with the energy that's inside of us. And, in, and, in, and in terms of our expression of our behavior, it will be a function of basically two broad categories. Our beliefs in relationship to these kind of genetically encoded behavior characteristics that we came here with and how they interact together. This is, is this making sense to everybody? Okay. So they determine what action we take and, and how we decide to express ourselves and also how we feel about the outcome. So if I'm interacting with the environment in some way, you can, you can say that there, I have a particular reason or purpose for doing so. Meaning that our desires, our needs, our wants, our goals, our aspirations, they're generated from within and usually fulfilled out there. Are you with me on this? No? Okay, what you want, what you desire, what you feel, believe you need, or what your goals are, all come from within here, right? Okay? from, let's say, a number of different factors that, that go into formulating what your goals are or what your desires might be. Your desires could also be you know, a combination of your, let's say, genetically encoded, genetically encoded behavior characteristics, those kind of filters that we're born with in combination with what we've learned to believe. Also, based, we're gonna add another dimension to this, and that's, that's our, our inherent capability of being creative and creative creativity comes from, let's say, let's, instead of going where it comes from at this point, let's just say that, that creativity is bringing, more, bringing forth something that didn't previously exist. Now, it doesn't mean it didn't exist somewhere else in the world or somewhere in someone else's life or in someone else's mind, but, but there, we do have this inherent capability of being creative in that our thoughts are not bounded by what we've learned to believe. 
In other words, we can think in any direction we choose. And therefore, as a result, we can also be inspired by certain thoughts and feelings that cause us to think of something outside of something we've learned to believe and therefore generate a desire based on that. All I'm saying is that whatever it is, desire, want, need, goal, aspiration, generate from within and usually fulfilled out there. Meaning I'm going to take a particular set of steps to fulfill my needs. I'm going to have to interact with the external environment to fulfill my needs. I'm going to have to interact with the external environment to fulfill, fulfill my desires. Your desire is to be, let's say, a consistently successful trader, to accumulate wealth as a trader. That's a desire generated from within. What do you have to do? You have to interact with the market to fulfill that desire, correct? And as a result, you are going to take a particular set of steps to do that, correct? Those set of steps are going to be based on what? What steps you decide to take are going to be based on what? A function of what? No, come on. The set of steps you take in any given set of circumstances to fulfill your needs, wants, goals, desires, whatever your agenda is, is going to be based on what? Beliefs. Your beliefs. What you think works, right? What you think works. What you have learned to believe works. And then how you feel about the outcome of whatever steps you took in interacting with these external forces is also a function of what? What I've learned to believe. So probably, you know, when you look at sports, the dynamics of, 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 uh, of, of um, successful athletes, you've got athletes who you probably all have read about things about, you know, certain athletes have, have certain styles of self-talk or, you know, their, their internal, the internal dialogue that goes on between them, okay? So when one athlete makes a mistake, they might criticize themselves and, and call themselves name and other athletes, you know, just shake it completely off and, and, and think very positive thoughts and, and get themselves refocused on what they need to do. That, those are based on beliefs that they have about what they think works or whether they even think it works or not doesn't even make any difference because a lot of times, this, certainly the self-criticizing beliefs were usually installed by other people anyway, and they won't really even have a choice in that, in that respect unless they've gone ahead and kind of cleared that stuff out, worked on clearing it out. They won't have a choice about what they're hearing in their mind anyway. But the point is, it is based on how they feel about the results of any particular action they take will be based on what they've learned to believe. So you can, regardless, see, so what I'm saying is that regardless of what outcome you get, you can learn, you can actually acquire a set of beliefs that allow you to think positively of yourself regardless of the outcome. It's just a matter of what you've learned to believe. What you've learned to believe about the nature of mistakes. Okay, so beliefs manage the way we interpret environmental information. <clears throat> they create our expectations, determine what actions we take, and how we feel about the results. You guys with me on all this? I'm going to give you some examples to, to really illustrate it. The, it's a, the, the best example I can give, the two of the best examples I can give you, one's in the discipline trader, one's in trading in the zone. But I really, like, I really like the one where I was writing the Discipline Trader. This would have been sometime around 1986 or 1987. And uh, I'd been writing all Saturday afternoon. And, and I took a break and, and turned on the TV. And there was some locally produced uh, TV program in Chicago called Gotcha Chicago. And what the news station did was, was hire people to play practical jokes on some local Chicago celebrities. But in one case, what they did is they hired a guy to go out on Michigan Avenue and they stuffed his pockets full of cash and they gave him a sign that said free money today only. That's what the sign said, free money today only. And his instructions were to only give money to anyone who asked for it. Right? That was the instruction. Give money to those who ask. 
He went out on Michigan Avenue. Okay, free money. Michigan Avenue is very busy. And how many people do you think asked for the money? You read the book. Yeah. I <laughs> for those who so, didn't read it. Street, street car, I guess. Yeah, well, only one person approached him and asked him for a quarter for bus transfer. <clears throat> now, remember I said a moment ago that you can tell what people believe based on how they behave in, in any particular <coughs> set of circumstances? What would... What would you, we can presume, let's make some assumptions. We can make assumptions, first of all, that people could read the sign that said free money today only. Okay. But yet nobody would ask. As a matter of fact, he became really frustrated because he didn't really understand what was going on. He thought that he'd be mocked. And, you know, and, and really under, under probably, uh, under circumstances in which people did believe that money was free, he was probably putting himself in, in, in danger. Because people can really get, you know, people can act pretty weird when it comes to free money. Really? You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he got real frustrated with this whole thing, and he even went up to somebody, some, some guy I assume was, was just, you know, he had, he had a suit on, he carried a briefcase, and he walked up to the guy and said, hey, would you like some money? And the guy said, not today. <laughs> And they screamed out, well, how many days has this happened? And the guy just walked around them. The other thing I noticed was that people were, were, people were taking, make, you know, going out of their way to take a wide path around this guy. Let's break down the dynamics. What's going on? People don't believe it exists. Yeah. yeah. It's like the same we give away free money. Yeah, well, can we can we assume that that the people that walked around him? First of all, <coughs> what, what what assumptions can we make about money? What does money mean? Doesn't grow on trees. You have to work what? hard. Doesn't grow on trees. Work hard. Doesn't grow on trees. Does the, the, can money have a, a pretty uh, can have a, let's say can money have a great deal of significance in most people's lives? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's a big attachment. Emotional attachment to most people. So, what can we assume now? In this case, we say like, okay, we say that 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 the environment was expressing itself in a way. In other words, what it was representing, the sign <laughs> represented the truth. The sign represented the truth. The money was free, and yet. This is what I was talking about, about how opportunities and certain distinctions about the nature of the environment can be invisible. The people that made the decision to walk around this person to actually take a wide path, what would that tell you about what they believed in that moment based on, based on how their beliefs were causing them to interpret that information? That's crazy. They believe there's no such thing as free money. There has to be a catch. That's right. Probably no such thing as free money, and the guy could be dangerous and crazy. In other words, if the money were really free, he would already be mobbed. Otherwise, this guy must really be a nutcase, and therefore, I should take a wide path around him to avoid the possibility of coming into contact. Now let's look again, let's break down the dynamics. <coughs> I don't believe that free money exists. Okay, that's basically what they're saying. In other words, the environment can express itself in an infinite combination of ways. Remember that? And even though free money is, is unlikely, free money is rare, in this case, it was real. It existed. And other than one person, nobody could perceive the existence of what was real from the environment's perspective. 
So if I'm operating out of a belief that free money doesn't exist, how will that act on my perception of information? Because what I have is, is, is a contradiction. I have a contradiction. I'm operating out of a belief that free money doesn't exist, and yet I see a sign that says free money. That is now I'm, now I'm dealing with information that's in complete conflict with my belief that free money doesn't exist. How do I reconcile the conflict? No, not, not in this no. case. No, no. Yeah, well, people right. aren't going to go on the street and start to start changing their beliefs. That's for sure. How are they going? How, yeah, how are they going to reconcile a conflict? Interact. Or interact? No. Go and no. take it. You, you already said it. You already decided the guy's crazy. Oh, no, they listen to their own beliefs. They yeah. Don't, they don't you, change. No, you guys are okay. I'm sorry. I'm not making myself clear. I've got a belief that says free money doesn't exist. That's my reality. I've got information in the environment that's in direct conflict with what I think is real. How do I reconcile this conflict between what's in front of my face, I can read the sign. You gotta ignore one of them. Changing energy? It's yeah, I've gotta rationalize it away in some way. In order to keep your belief? Not to keep my, nothing's gonna happen to my belief, believe me. That's, that ain't gonna happen. Now, my belief isn't gonna change at all. I mean, people's beliefs just don't change unless unless something very dramatic happens or they consciously do something about it. But I still have to reckon because I still have to reconcile the conflict. It needs to be you justified. Uh, what? You ignore it. I can ignore it, or I can again, like Jeff said, I can decide that the guy must be crazy because he believe free money could free money's big. I just can't walk away from free money. Well, what would happen if they decided to just take a chance that one day and go against their belief and really see if they're That's right. Them. We're going to get into that in a second, Sean. Okay, that's, yeah, but that's, you know. But, but right now, we're just dealing with the people who saw the sign, could read it. What do they do about it? What do we do about it? See, these, are, these, are, these shouldn't be hard questions to, to answer, guys. This is something we do all, every day in our lives. Every time we, we, we confront conflicting information from our, our friends, our spouses, or whatever, we find some way to, to either argue our way out of it, right? Or if we can't do that, what do we say? Well, you're crazy. Rationalize it away until you're... Yeah, until you're not in a state of conflict anymore. I've got a belief that says free money doesn't exist. I've got conflicting information I'm being confronted with. I didn't ask for this conflict, meaning that I stepped into it. Stepped into it inadvertently. I'm walking along the street, and all of a sudden I see this sign that says "Free Money Today Only." It completely violates what I believe to be true. What do I do about it? I say, "Well, it's not true." And as a result, this guy must be crazy. So, as a result, my belief that free money doesn't exist manage my perception of the information in a way that's consistent with what I believe. My expectation was one of possible threat or danger. The guy I decided was crazy. My behavior is I take a wide path around this particular person to avoid encountering him. And how do I feel about the results? Good. Good. Yeah, I did good, didn't I? Okay. I avoided a possible conflict with a crazy, crazy person. All of your actions. That's right. The belief ruled the whole process. It created an experience that was completely, let's say, um, out of touch with the reality of the situation. From the environment's perspective, the belief that we operated out of in that moment as an example, or the typical person that, 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 that saw the sign, the way the belief you know, impacted their perception, their expectation, their behavior, and how they felt about the results, created a reality for them, meaning an experience, a reality for them that was 100% or 180 degrees away from what was available from the environment's perspective. And interestingly enough, if you gathered those people together and asked them what they experienced, they would tell you 
what they experience based on what they remind them. Because their experience reinforced their belief. And if encountering the same situation again, what would they do? Same the same thing. Why? Because they didn't learn anything. Nothing changed. And so they'll experience, if they, were, if they encountered someone with a sign again, they would experience the exact same thing. Even if they had feedback? No, not saying if they had feedback. No, 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 we're not talking about feedback. We're just talking about, about how, what, I'm just talking about the impact that beliefs have on what we experience in relationship to what's available. The belief moves. The belief rules, exactly right. So now you can, you know, just, just a little side note, now you can start to see when I say that if I believe that I don't need to know what's going to happen next to make money, or I believe that anything can happen, or I believe that it only takes one trader somewhere in the world to negate the positive outcome of my edge, am I not going to put a stop in the market? Am I not going to predefine my risk? Can I possibly do that if I have those beliefs? <coughs> I couldn't do it. I couldn't make that mistake. I couldn't make that error. Or that every moment is unique, as long as I understand the real, the real implications of the word unique. This moment is not like any other, even though it may seem like it. See, this moment is unique, won't let me think that I know what's going to happen. It won't let me think that. And since I know I don't have to know, then it doesn't become an issue, does it? Think about that. This, this moment is unique, won't let me think that I know, and because I believe that I don't need to know, it's not even an issue. So that I stay in the now moment, meaning what's the market telling me about its potential to move based on the pattern that exists right now. I just wanted to do a little reinforcing. I just said, is that all right, guys? That's good, right? Reinforcing. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, again, if 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 all these people we, we gather we gather together all these people to you know get their feedback in terms of what they got out of this, they would relate the experience in a way that was completely consistent with what they experienced because the experience itself reinforced the belief creating a closed loop. The belief acts as a force on our perception of information in a way that's consistent with the belief. What we expect is consistent with the belief. What we do and what we, what we do is going to be consistent with the belief. Therefore, the experience that we have will be consistent with the belief. And therefore, everything gets reinforced and nothing that might, have, that might exist outside that circle even has the possibility of, of entering into to break the circle. <coughs> but like Sean said, let's say for example you've got somebody that just takes a kind of what if attitude. What if? What if it's real? Or what have I got to lose to find out? And so this person just goes up and says, okay, give me 10 bucks. And the guy reaches in his pocket, pulls out a $10 bill, and hands the $10 bill to the person. Now what? Now we should have the dynamics. Now what? What? Now she should ask for more. Well, yeah, yeah, well, I was going to get to that, right, wish you asked for more, right. Typical trader's mentality is ask for more. However, what, okay, let's look at the dynamics here. What happens? You get free money sometimes. Okay, you get free money sometimes. What happens to this belief about free money not existing? It, 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 That's an addendum to it. <laughs> Weak it, so. 
Yeah, we pulled some energy out of it, didn't we? In fact, when you look at the nature of this particular concept and how definitive it is, we can say that what we've really done is pretty much neutralize it. Because you can't say it doesn't exist. Because it does exist. It's not black and white. It might not be common, but it does exist. And so what happened? In essence, we used the vernacular, he changed the belief. We really didn't change the belief. We've got two contradictory beliefs inside of his mental system. One that says money doesn't exist, free money doesn't exist, one that says it does. Which has more energy? Probably the one that says that it does, because under similar circumstances, is he going to hesitate asking for the money? Not at all. He'd be the first one in line, right? Oh, I remember, I remember that. Okay? Yeah, okay. I know what's happening. I know what's happening here. And interestingly enough, when you have this kind of experience where you have, let's say, been pleasantly surprised. with an experience that contradicts a limitation, you might say, because this is a limitation, and pleasantly surprised, what are you going to do? You're going to want to share that with everybody, right? Not everybody, but most everybody. You're going to go home. You're going to go back to the office. You're going to be maybe even jumping up and down. And virtually the same three words will roll out of everyone's mouth when you confront, let's say, whoever it is that you want to tell. What are you going to say? What's, how, are you going to pre, how are you going to start your story? What three words are you going to use to start your story? You won't believe. Yeah. You won't believe. Right. You won't believe. You're saying, hey, you won't believe this. And you're what? You're right. They won't. <laughs> <laughs> you want them to believe it. <clears throat> but you're right. They probably won't. And why won't they? It goes against their belief. It goes against their belief that free money exists. And so they will interpret your story as being a fabric of your imagination or just maybe something you're trying to pull over on them. Whatever, whatever way they might interpret why you're saying what you're saying, they will find a way to rationalize it away so that they're not in a state of conflict by the fact that you're confronting them with information that completely contradicts what they believe to be true. You guys with me on this? And interestingly enough, let's look at, let's look at the state of mind. This is the critical factor here, state of mind. The relative degree of positiveness or negative energy that's rolling through our brain and body. OK? Because essentially, or let's say eventually, by tomorrow afternoon, what we're going to learn about the nature of consistency is that it's really a function of your state of mind. Not specifically not a function. Or how much money you accumulate as a trader is not a function of how much time you expose yourself to the opportunities. Not at all. It is a function of your state of mind. That's a big one. That's a tough one to have to Can you say that again? That the amount of money you accumulate as a trader is not a function of how much time you spend exposing yourself to the opportunities as most people think that it is. In other words, the more opportunities I expose myself to, it would make sense that the more money I should be able to accumulate. And I'm saying that it's, that is expressly not the case. The amount of money you accumulate is a function of your state of mind while you're trading. If you're in the most conducive state of mind to be making money, you will make and keep more money whether you trade in five minutes a day or five hours a day, 
if you can stay focused in the most appropriate state of mind. And so the whole idea is that if you're not in the most appropriate state of mind, then again, don't train. It's like putting money in the bank. And that's basically what I meant yesterday. But let's look at the state of mind. What time is it, by the way? Okay, but let's um, let's look at at, at at the state of mind that each one of these <coughs> each one of these beliefs produce. The people who believe that free money didn't exist and and walked around that particular person, you could say that there are varying degrees of discomfort based on how crazy they thought the person was. The crazier they thought the person was, the greater the degree of discomfort. So you could take someone who really thought the person was crazy, and instead of just taking five or six feet, you could, there's a one-to-one -one correlation. You can even measure it, basically. How far away they would go out of their way and alter their path would be in direct relationship to the degree of discomfort, meaning the degree of negative energy that was in their belief about how crazy this person was, to the point where somebody might even just cross the street just to stay on the other side of the street. And so their experience of the situation was, let's say, close to, if this was terror, okay, and this is confidence, you could say that someone could actually create for themselves an experience of fear or terror. But that's not what existed at all. Go ahead. Now, what we were talking about before we broke, we went on break, was that we were talking about various states of mind and how whatever beliefs we're operating out of in any given moment will basically control or determine what state of mind that we're in. In other words, the energy of the belief that we're operating out of will correspond with the state of mind that we experience. So for an example, the people that, that decided based on their belief that free money didn't exist, that the person had to be crazy, and what does it mean to interact with a crazy person, well, who knows? But if anything, at the very least, it, it could be threatening or dangerous. And therefore, once it was decided, based on that kind of thought pattern that I just went through, that it was threatening or dangerous, they experienced a state of mind that corresponded exactly with what they believed. Because when you think about it, just for a moment, what we're experiencing in any given moment is a state of mind. Are we not? That's what's real. What's real in any given moment is our state of mind. What we're going to find is that the beliefs that may have tapped us into any particular state of mind may not have any relevancy whatsoever to the actual conditions that existed in that moment from the environment's perspective. So you've got one person or a number of people who thought he was crazy and therefore their experiences of the situation were, if this is neutral right here, were on this side on the negative side, varying degrees of, 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 of a negative state of mind. And as a result of feeling that negative energy, they reinforce their belief. Whereas the guy who operated out of the what if question and decided to try the experience out and ended up with $10, what did he experience? 
excitement. And excited to the point where he wanted to share that excitement with everyone he knew. And therefore would go and, you know, the people that he knew that he'd, he'd, you know, encounter, he'd say, hey, you won't believe what happened to me today. But as Louis pointed out, the moment that he encountered somebody who said, well, if that's the case, then why didn't he ask for 100 bucks? What's going to happen? Or if it occurs to him that he should have asked for $100, what's going to, ha what's going to happen to his state of mind? Change. Change from what? Positive. Positive from excitement <clears throat> to regret. regret. Okay? Instantaneously. Because of what? Because of a belief about missing opportunities. Right? Right. right? right. What if you didn't have a belief about missing opportunities? Meaning, what if you didn't believe that missed opportunities didn't exist? How could I even say that, right? Is it possible to even believe that missed opportunities don't exist? Sure it is. Because if you're capable of taking advantage of whatever it is you perceived was available at any given moment, you'd have done it. And by the mere fact that you didn't or didn't take advantage of it to the extent that, that you would have liked to only indicates something that you need to learn. So it was an opportunity to find out what you need to learn. So you really didn't miss anything. You gained something. Now if you really believe that, would you flip into a state of regret? No, you wouldn't. And you, stayed, you would stay positively focused, right? And then ready for the next opportunity. And ready for the next opportunity. And ready to do better. What was that talk that you should do? <laughs> Get it on the tape. <laughs> try to write it down right now. Go ahead, try to write it down as best you can. I'll repeat it for you later, but I want you to try to write it down. Just start out with, what if missed opportunities didn't exist? Start out with that and see what you come up with. So does everyone understand the dynamics involved? Are we, are, we getting, are we getting there about the nature of beliefs? And see, when you think about it, I'll go back to the very beginning when we started this. This whole idea, free money exists, free money doesn't exist, it's, it's an abstract concept when you think about it. It's, these, it's these, just these letters, these, these, these symbols that form into a word, that form into a concept that in essence become a reality whether it corresponds with what's actually available from the environment's perspective may, not, you know, may or may not correspond at all is what I'm saying, but the point is, is that just that concept, this energized structure inside of our minds caused them to experience something that was completely 180 degrees contradictory, or, or 180 degrees different than what was available. And yet, and yet we would walk away from the experience believing thoroughly believing that what we experienced was the true reality of the situation and would argue that and would defend it. Exactly. But it doesn't really, you don't have to be a religious fundamentalist, Sean. Every belief works that way just about, unless they're open-ended beliefs. So I'm going to give you another example that really that ties all this together by also bringing, bringing how fear causes us to narrow our focus of attention on the object of our fear. And, that's, and this one's in, in uh, the trading in the zone. The example I like to use is, is a first time experience that a child has with a dog. Now when you think about this, 
I want you to think about it in terms of dogs have a range of expression. I'm just going to do it down here. Can you guys see this on the video? Dogs have a range of expression. And it's not infinite, is it? Do dogs have an infinite range of expression, ways they can express themselves? No. No, it's finite. So we can say that this line could represent all the different characteristics and properties of the way dogs can behave. And we can even divide this up into positively charged ways and negatively charged ways. Meaning dogs can be friendly, dogs can be loyal, dogs can be loving, dogs can be playful, but dogs can be mean and nasty and dangerous, right? All these things from, this, from, from the positive end to the negative end and back again. This line now represents all the distinctions that we can make about the nature and characteristics of dogs. Before a child has this first time experience with a dog, dogs don't exist. Are you with me? How could they exist? You can't know about something you haven't experienced yet. Okay? So in the child's mind, let's say this is a little toddler. In the child's mind, dogs don't exist. And the child now has a first time encounter with a dog. In other words, remember the environment can express itself in an infinite combination of ways. The child encounters a dog for the first time. It just so happens this particular dog is having a bad day, mean and nasty, whatever, but the child gets bit and gets bit pretty bad. It turned out to be a, you know, a, really, a really bad situation. Now, does the child have to understand the nature of language to be afraid of dogs? Does, does, in other words, does he have to associate this particular experience or memory that he has now with words? He will eventually, even if he doesn't, even if when he has this experience, if he hasn't learned to talk, eventually he will relate this experience to certain words that describe the reality or the nature of dogs based on his internal experience of them. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. What I want to get to, however, is that he has a first time experience and that first time experience is transformed into a negatively charged energy or negatively transformed into a negatively charged memory I'm sorry negatively charged memory so that the next time he encounters a dog in the environment what is going to happen and why yes he's going to associate based on the similarities of the second dog he's going to his mind will automatically associate the second dog with the first dog making them identical, correct? And as a result, what will his state of mind be? Fear. Fear or terror, right? Now, it turns out, let's say from the environment's perspective, this second dog that he encounters could be the friendliest dog in the world, could just be wanting to play with the child. From a dog's perspective, dog sees child, dog thinks play, and dog approaches child wanting to play. Child thinks he's being attacked. Dog never touches the child. From the child's perspective, was he attacked? Yes. yes. He was attacked. You know why? Because it tapped him into all of the energy of that first experience, and he felt it as if it were happening right then and there in that moment and so what we have from the child's perspective is a first time experience that from the environment's perspective was real a second time experience that from the environment's perspective was not real but that all the energy still got associated in his mind in a way where he reinforced the first time experience so that the energy of this memory grew so if he had, let's say, this much negative energy, now it's this much negative energy. And the next encounter with the dog, regardless of how friendly it is, is going to experience the same thing, and instead of this much energy, there's going to be this much energy. Even if it isn't a negative experience with the dog? It will be a negative experience every time. <clears throat> That's what I'm saying. You see, 
every experience will be negative because he's going to associate every dog with his memory so that the memories get reinforced. Psychologists would call this like a projection. I call it like an instantaneous association, meaning that, that what's really happening is that his, the energy in his mind is acting as a force on his senses to see a threatening or terrorizing circumstance or situation every time he comes into contact with a dog. What he's feeling inside is real. In other words, his state of mind is absolutely 100% real. How he got into that state of mind is not. In other words, how he got into that state of mind is basically dysfunctional. Because what happens is that he is making an instantaneous, like I said, psychologists would call this projection, he's projecting his internal energy onto that dog. Let's say this is a fifth or sixth encounter of him seeing a dog. And they've all been friendly except for the first one. And what happens is that his own terror gets reflected back to him. I don't want to say this. I want to say this differently. What's that? What? Yes, and his but he hasn't. We haven't talked about the actual concept yet. I'm just getting you know going from the memory itself. But but what happens is that as he as he because the dog is in his field of awareness, and because he's experiencing the terror, he will project that terror onto that dog, saying that it's that dog that's making me feel this way. You got okay. You guys with me on that? It is that dog that's making me feel this way that particular dog isn't doing anything to him. Nothing at all. There was no possible way you could convince the child otherwise. As a matter of fact, trying to convince the child otherwise is only, only does what? Enforces it. Enforces it and really frustrates them, right? Because what you're really doing is, is in essence, you're, you're, you would be, from the child's perspective, not, not honoring his fear, not supporting it, and, and trying to invalidate it in a way where he just wouldn't be able to even remotely understand. Because what he's, the state of mind he's in is real. That is 100% that is reality. You can't deny our state of mind. You can't deny your state of mind. You can't deny someone else's state of mind. It doesn't make any difference what you might say. If we're confident, we're confident. If we're fearful, we're fearful. That is the truth. How we got into that state of mind, meaning whatever belief or memory that flipped us into that state of mind may not be the truth at all relative to what the environment was offering. After the first instance, Right, after the first incident, right? Yes, exactly. Because what happens is that as this experience, as, as this experience gets reinforced, as this memory gets reinforced, his senses become particularly attuned to picking up the sights and sounds of dogs that otherwise wouldn't even exist in his field of awareness. So you can imagine a situation where he walks on his front porch, there's kids in the park playing across the street, his friends, he, that's an opportunity. He desires to be with his friends and to play with them and to have fun, right? He walks out on the porch and off in the distance he hears a dog bark. What's he going to do? React. And go back in the house, right? This is something that he would have been oblivious to if it weren't for the fact that fear causes us to narrow our focus of attention onto the object of our fear so that we create the very experience we're trying to avoid. So in this case, he's trying to avoid dogs because he believes that they're inherently dangerous. And what does he do? He created an experience of fear where it otherwise wouldn't even exist. The dog could have been two blocks away, three blocks away. It wouldn't have made any difference. 
And yet, from his perspective, this is a real experience. A valid and real experience. So what he ends up, when he gets to the point, when he gets old enough, where he's taught these words and concepts, he will, he will, let's put it that way. Now let me do it this way. He could very well create a belief Eventually, he will learn to associate those memories, those particular memories, with these particular words and create a concept about the nature of the way the world works in relationship to dogs. This is called a belief, and it is structured energy. It is an abstract concept by itself, but once all the energy from his memories, this is, what's, this is really important. You need to get this. This is, this is critically important. Once all the energy from his memories get attached to these words, these words become reality. That will cause him to experience the world in a way that's completely consistent with these words. So that every time a dog comes into his field of awareness, he will experience the energy, the extreme negative energy that's in this concept. That's the state of mind he will flip into instantaneously. Now, in relationship to the environment or what we know about the nature of dogs and the ways that they can express, all the different ways that they can express themselves, we know that this particular characteristic exists over here on the extreme end. And every other characteristic about the nature of dogs, this child is oblivious to. Remember, friendly, loving, loyal, playful. Remember that, those characteristics? Has, does this child have any capacity to perceive these characteristics? No, none, no capacity whatsoever. They do not exist in this child's mind, anyway. In the environment they exist, in the child's mind, they do not. In fact, it's impossible. Wouldn't even be considered. Can you think of a situation in which how, well let's put it this way how does a child does he live his whole life like this? He what? He may. It's possible, right? It's very possible. What's likely to happen at some point? It gets changed. Um, I don't know about how likely it is. There's something else that can happen that would be more likely. What? Gets tempered. Gets tempered. Yes. Okay. Maybe he has a positive experience. Maybe he has a positive experience. Depends on what you mean by that, because there are, there are degrees of positive experience. Because his experience is extremely will be, his ability to experience anything positive will be extremely limited. And why? Because remember, every time a dog comes into his field of awareness it instantaneously taps him into this belief. Right? right? So how is he going to get out of this closed loop? He doesn't even know it's a closed loop. Remember that. He doesn't know it's a closed loop. You can tell him that, that all dogs aren't dangerous, and he will not believe you. And this is another area where parents get really frustrated with their kids when their kids are exhibiting what they consider to be an irrational fear and they get mad when their kids don't respond to the fact that they tell them, well, you shouldn't be afraid. All they do is get madder. Go ahead. Would it be likely that if a child ran into a dog who wasn't dangerous, they would do something to invoke the dog to become dangerous to prove they were right? 
Uh, and I, well, unlikely only because they wouldn't be able to interact with the dog. They wouldn't even be able to interact with it. Take it out of a child in an adult situation. Maybe if the dog, if the dog, if the adult felt powerful enough. Well, not even you know, a dog. You, know. you have a certain belief that causes you harm. Oh yeah. And you oh sure. An environment that doesn't. Well, you absolutely. Sort of back to self sabotage. Sure. To prove that you're right. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. So can we think of any circumstances in which, the, first of all, that, that, that the, as John said, the, the belief might get tempered a bit. Tempered meaning, I only mean by tempered, he might even be able to perceive other possibilities. Because we're getting to a real critical concept here that you guys need to have for your training. Remember, he's going to avoid dogs at all costs. There's no other possibilities that exist for him other than terror. You see somebody else with a dog having a different experience? Yes, okay, he might see somebody else. In other words, let's say he's under, in a circumstance where, where he's with his parents, he feels relatively safe and comfortable, and, and just without any, uh, pre, without any foreknowledge, encounters an experience, or encounters a situation, put it that way, where, and I'm gonna use, I'm gonna be specific, where kids his own age, are playing with dogs and obviously having a great deal of fun. Maybe he walks around a corner or something. And all of a sudden he's confronted with this scene where kids, maybe two or three other kids, maybe kids that he even knows, his own age, that are playing with dogs and having a great time. <coughs> now, the dynamics. Based on what we've learned so far, what happens? First thing that happens. Maybe a little energy gets taken out of that belief. Not that's not the first thing that happens. What? Uh, that's still not the first thing that happens. You guys really now just think of your no. Uh, well, that's still not the first thing that happens. Come on, yeah, well, come on. Just think. Of, don't think of this kid. Think of your own experiences. What happens when you encounter information unanticipated from the environment that completely contradicts what you believe to be true? What happens? Confusion. Confusion. That is a natural state. Confusion is a natural state. That's what happens when we encounter information that conflicts what we believe to be true. We are confused. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Now at some point the confusion will kind of wear away a bit as he contemplates what it is that he experienced. And he at that point realizes that other possibilities exist beyond the limitations of his belief. Now a bunch of things can happen. He can, one, decide that he wants to be like the other kids, meaning he wants to be able to play with dogs. He perceives the possibility of friendliness, which was impossible or even non-existent to him before this, virtually non-existent and unperceivable. Now think about the implications of what I just said. Non-existent and unperceivable until he inadvertently encountered this situation with undeniable information. In other words, the kid was very relatively normal, could not deny the fact that these kids were having fun and they were not getting mauled or bitten by these dogs. Whenever we encounter information that conflicts what we believe to be true, that we find virtually undeniable, we go into a state of confusion. until we can sort it out. So he realizes that other possibilities exist. Now what? What do I do? I want to be like the other kids. I want to be able to play with dogs. Okay, he makes up his mind in, in a sense, he, not to the extent like we talked about with the kind of conviction about what we talked about earlier, but he decides, let's say, I want to, I want to, I want to be able to play with dogs. Is he able to do it? Probably not initially. Not right away. Yeah, right. Not right away. 
He's going to have to go through a well, no. He's going to have to go through a process, a step-by-step -step incremental process, just the same kind of step-by-step -step incremental process you're going to have to go through to instill those five fundamental truths about the nature of the market that cause you to think in probabilities. Anything can happen. Every moment is unique. I don't need to know what's going to happen next. I don't, uh, to make money, uh, there's a random distribution between wins and losses and any given set of variables to define an edge. I guess it's the same concept of starting off with 100 shares. Yeah, right. Incremental, step-by-step -step process. How is this step-by-step -step process likely to occur? See, here's what's important here. He has a desire. He <coughs> inadvertently, let's say, acquired a desire that is in direct conflict with what he believes to be true about the nature of reality. Now, just because he now is able to perceive a possibility that otherwise didn't exist, does that mean that all his fear has been dissipated? And if his fear has not been dissipated, then what we have is a classic conflict between what he desires and what his other belief about the nature of dogs would argue as being true and real. Okay? Uh, we have a classic conflict between his desire and what his beliefs say is true and real. So he could say, I want to play with dogs, but when he encounters another dog the next time, he might find the closest he could get to one might be 10 or 15 feet. That would be, in a sense, a positive encounter because nothing happened, right? In other words, what we have are two contradictory beliefs. One that has an enormous amount of energy. All dogs are dangerous. And another Dogs can be friendly and playful, okay? We have two contradictory beliefs. One has enough energy, enough positive energy, that allows him to perceive the existence of other dogs without running away. That's about it. It allows him to perceive the existence of friendly dogs without running away. That's as far as it goes. But the next time he encounters another dog and nothing happens from a distance, it'll grow a little bit and this one will come down a little bit. And the next one, this one will come down a little bit and this one will grow a little bit. Come down, grow, come down, grow until let's say they're about even. And then I get bit by another dog. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully he, won't, he won't encounter any other dangerous dogs or unfriendly <laughs> dogs. But there will come a point at which these are relatively even. And at that point, if it, once his desire, let's say, is one degree greater than, one degree greater than this particular negative belief, it will allow him to touch a dog, to have a direct in other words, instead of a distance experience, but have an actual direct experience with a dog, touch it, and if it turns out to be you know, a positive experience, what will happen is this belief, this, all the negative energy in this belief will basically collapse, dissipate, and this belief will go way up in positive energy, and he'll be able to interact with dogs. And at the same time, have the full range of distinctions about what dogs are all about, from positive to negative, from negative to positive. And at some point in his life, maybe he's an adult in his 40s or 50s or whatever, he might run into a situation where he sees some kid who's terrified of dogs, and he'll, in, in the way he'll describe that, he'll say, you know, I remember when I used to be that way, but he'll say, I grew out of it. Isn't that typically what people say when they, when they transcend a fear, a childhood fear? I grew out of it. In other words, he went through an inadvertent process, meaning he wasn't 
really conscious of what he was doing. He didn't really know that he was going through a process of collapsing one belief, one concept, and energizing another, more functional. Because in relationship to the nature of dogs and what's possible, was this particular concept, could we say that it was dysfunctional? Is this a dysfunctional concept or not? Well, the process of getting to it after the fact is. Well, no, even, no, is this a dysfunctional concept or not? You can oh, see, yes. the reason what makes oh, it yes. dysfunctional is this right here. Yes. Oh. That's what makes it dysfunctional, okay? Right. See, we could say dogs can be dangerous, but what makes it dysfunctional is this word. Right. Which brings up another issue, is like, well, what's the truth? You see, if our if our beliefs, if our beliefs limit what we what we are aware of and what we can experience in relationship to what exists, then what's the truth? What is it? What's the truth? Some dogs. Are no, I mean, you know, I mean more philosophically, what's the truth? How the external environment interacts with what you believe. Well, close. Believe yeah. True. What? It's whatever you believe to be true. Well, yeah, everyone believes that what they believe is the truth, but how do we know what the truth is? There's a way of knowing. There's an easy way of knowing. There really is. It's anything can <laughs> Whatever works. Whatever works. Right? Now think about this. If what I believe causes me to interpret, perceive, and interpret information in a way that's consistent with what I believe, if what I believe determines what I expect, if what I believe determines what I do, the decisions I make, and how I behave, in relationship to my desires, my goals, my needs, my wants, which cause me or literally force me to interact with all these external forces to fulfill my goals, my needs, and my wants, and my desires, then the particular set of steps I take to fulfill this will is going to be based on what I believe is true in, the, in, in any given set of circumstances or situations, right? So I interact with these forces based on what I believe is true. If I feel satisfied, then whatever I believed must have corresponded with the environmental conditions as they existed. And so whatever I believe must be true because it worked. If it didn't work, or the degree to which it didn't work, then you could say that my beliefs were to some degree dysfunctional in relationship to the environmental conditions and what was available from the environment. I didn't know the appropriate set of steps based on the environmental conditions or what I wanted wasn't available or wasn't available to the quantity or degree to which I believed it would be available. Does that make sense? In any case, what I believe will determine what I perceive. If I perceived it to be available and it wasn't, then it's not the environment's fault. You guys with me on this? That's right, exactly. Because everything we do is based on what we believe, and therefore, and since we do it and we experience whatever we believe, we reinforce the belief. That's why a trainer's very first <clears throat> two or three trades is going to dictate what he does for the next. So Could, absolutely, through. sure. But you're saying that if, it, if your belief works, that's a closed loop? I would think that opens a loop. Well, it doesn't mean your belief's going to continue to work. See, most beliefs create these closed loops. For an example, I have a belief, I have a belief in the structural integrity of this chair. Okay? And as a result of my belief in the structural integrity of this chair, I will sit out and not have any problem, not even think about it, right? But what's interesting is that 
because the environment or because the universe is constantly expanding and because everything that's made of atoms and molecules is in motion, my beliefs can remain static in relationship or will remain static unless I do something to change that energy or change the concepts. My beliefs will remain static in relationship to a constantly changing environment, meaning that this chair is deteriorating over time. It doesn't seem like it now. I cannot perceive it being actually deteriorating. But if we could come back, this chair would stay here for the next 1,000 years or 2,000 years, especially if it's made out of wood. We would come back, and it still might be standing just the way it is, but if I were to go sit on it based on my belief in its structural integrity, I would sit and fall to the floor, would I not? And you're saying it's only then when you, when you open up that closed loop before it... See, the belief loop. worked. The belief works now. It won't work over time. But you're saying there has to be a counter-reaction for that belief to have to alter, otherwise it... You know, well, yeah, the counter-reaction, well, the counter, we're going to get into the counter-reactions, yeah. You, you, there, it takes energy to move energy. Now, that energy can come from different sources. It can come as, like I say in the discipline trade, of a forced awareness, meaning that I sat down in the chair, it collapsed. The environment forced me to become aware of the fact that my belief was dysfunctional. Or we can do it as a result of a conscious choice. We can make an assessment. I mean, you wouldn't be here in this moment right now if you if you, you may not have thought of it this way. But you wouldn't be here at this seminar if your your beliefs about the nature of trading were working. Would you? They might be working to some degree, but not be working to the degree to which you are satisfied with. <clears throat> or like I said, you just wouldn't be sitting here. Now, this is the, the important concept that I wanted you to get out of this, however, well, there are many, but, but right now I want you, to, I want you to, to really pay particular attention to the fact that he had a desire that was in conflict with what he believed to be true. What won out in terms of his ability to express himself? At least in the initial stages until, until the energy started balancing out. What wins out? The belief. belief. The belief. Whatever, whatever has the most energy. Put it that way. Whatever has the most energy is what wins. We will express ourselves in a way that's consistent with whatever has the most energy, regardless of what the conflict, in other regardless of, of what you may want. Meaning that it is possible to acquire a desire that is in conflict with what we believe to be true. And we may not even be aware of the belief that's in conflict with our desire. We may not even be aware of it. It may have been something we learned in our childhood. But what we're going to learn in a moment is that it doesn't matter when we learned it. If there's energy in it, it will have the potential to act on our perception and on our behavior, regardless of what our desire is. I just want to make sure I got that. Okay. What you're saying is, um, if my desire is strong enough, it can it can cause me to look at my belief or take some of the energy out of my belief. Yeah, desire is the key. Yeah. The, the intensity of your desire. Your desire is strong enough. Remember, I said if you make up your mind with conviction, you can move energy. I, I didn't say it that way earlier this morning. I said that you can, you can neutralize the conflicts. Right. That's in essence what I was saying. If you're, you make up your mind with such, a, with such a strong degree of conviction, you can actually neutralize conflicting beliefs just by merely making up your mind. In some cases, that'll happen. It really will. 
there are things that you know you will you will look at in relationship to you know your sense of dissatisfaction and say you know what I get it now and I'm you know I'm just this is it I'm just this is this is not who I am anymore this is not who I am And resolve that from this moment forward, this is who I am. And if it's strong enough, it'll be enough to move that negative energy out, or that energy period, and that other, and the, and what I'm just going to call a, a non a dysfunctional belief. Dysfunctional only in the sense that, from the environment's perspective, in relationship to what you want, it doesn't work. What we're going to be learning later on this afternoon is that you don't have to you don't have to attach so much importance to what you learn to believe. Meaning that, you know, people, people have this sense that their beliefs are their identity. And you don't have to look at your beliefs as being so much a part of your identity, but simply something that, that might be useful in the moment. So for example, this particular sweater was useful, I put it on. When it's no longer useful, I take it off. When it really becomes dysfunctional, I throw it away. And believe it or not, you can look at your beliefs the same way. You weren't born with any of them. You've inadvertently changed some of them throughout your life. All you're doing now is, is altering some of them based on your desire to fulfill certain desires and goals. That's all you're doing. And if you believe it's all right, the process will go a lot easier. <laughs> if you don't believe it's all right, that's one of the first beliefs you're going to have to work on, is why it isn't all right to change a belief. Because there are people who really, ardu you know, ardu arduently believe, yeah, that it's not all right to change a belief. It's not all right. So therefore, that would be the first thing they'd have to work on, is making it all right, is drawing the energy out of the belief that says it's not. And if this makes any sense, which it should, is that, is that the stronger you believe that it is all right to just alter your beliefs, when it suits your purposes, the faster it goes and the easier the process is. Right. Okay, where are we? How, what time? What time is it? 20 to 12. 20 to 12. Oh, okay. I know what I got to do. Um, now, and this will finish us up just before lunch, too. We got, we got the child, the circumstance in which the child desires to be like the other kids. And so he, he goes into, let's say, an active process of transformation, but doesn't really understand it in the way that we're I'm organizing it right now. What about, the, what about the kid that, let's say, doesn't care about being like the other kids or cares about even playing with dogs? What happens to him? Now again, I'm going to ask you to answer this question or try to answer it based on your own personal experiences. <coughs> try to put it within the context of your own personal experiences. You've got a situation. He has a negatively charged belief about the nature of the way dogs exist. Conflicts, he, he confronts inadvertently, is confronted with information that contradicts this belief, making it, in essence, not true. Meaning, not true in the sense all dogs are not dangerous. The all is what's the critical, is the critical active word here. But also, at the same time, has no desire to interact with dogs. Now, his experience allows him to now perceive the possibility of interacting with dogs on a friendly basis but he has no desire to do so. So what we have in this person's mental environment is an active contradiction 
that will probably remain that way for his whole life. He will be able to perceive the possibility of act, interacting with dogs, but the way he'll rationalize his inability to do so, and I say his inability because what will determine his ability to interact with dogs? What has the most energy? That's right. What has the most energy? So he will rationalize his inability to interact with dogs with, I just, I know they're not dangerous, but I don't want to touch them anyway. Okay? I don't want to touch them anyway. I don't like dogs. The example I use in, in, the, in trading in the zone was a trader that I work with from Brazil that uh, had a terrified of snakes, doesn't remember why, doesn't remember any particular experience, just always knows, or always, always just, as far as his recollection goes back, he's always been afraid of snakes. His wife went, went to uh, New York to visit some relatives. Uh, he was left taking care of, I think at the time, she was maybe two, two and a half year old daughter, three, I don't remember exactly how old. Went over to a friend's house that he didn't know, who also has a two and a half or three year old daughter, but didn't know that the friend had a snake. The two kids go into the room, and I guess, I don't know if there was supervision or not, but came out of the room and his daughter had the snake wrapped around, him, wrapped around her. And he saw this and literally jumped across the room. I mean, he just flew. And his first reaction, other than being terrified of the fact that, that he was confronted with a snake, was the fact that it was wrapped around his daughter and the fact that she wasn't afraid. That perplexed him, deeply perplexed him, thinking that that's his daughter, that somehow or another she should also be afraid of the snake too, right? But because she's had no personal experience with snakes that's <coughs> negative, it was just pure fascination to her. Now, how would he explain his behavior? Is he, can he make, does he know that, that, that there are obviously dangerous and non-dangerous snakes? Well, I mean, yeah, one was wrapped around his, his, his three-year-old kid. So he knows that snakes aren't dangerous. Could he touch that snake? No. The way he'll explain that is that, I don't want to. That's just an active contradiction. In other words, there's enough energy inside his mental environment to be able to perceive the existence of non-dangerous snakes, no desire to change it, and so he'll just live with this active contradiction for the rest of his life. Is this making sense to everybody? Now, the, the next example I want to give is, let's take somebody, let's take a kid who's never had a negative experience with a dog. Never ever experienced a non-friendly dog. Can you tell this kid that he can get bit? You can tell him. Is he going to listen? Yeah. No, he's not. And, and why should he? Now, you think about it. Why should he? He, he never experienced a negative, had never had a negative experience with a dog. He has an energized concept, a powerfully energized concept that says that all dogs are fun, or all dogs are friendly, or there's no threat whatsoever. He wouldn't even use the word threat because it, it doesn't even enter, wouldn't even enter into, into his, his, his frame of mind about the nature of dogs because they're all non-threatening. Now, let's say he does encounter a non-friendly dog and gets bit. What happens? What are the dynamics involved here? What's going to happen with him? Transformation. Okay, go ahead, John. What do you get to say? Just well, I mean, you're, you're going in the inverse there. You have, a, you have a belief that was held to be true. Right. You have an experience that diminishes the energy of what that belief was, and your counterbalance is open for the first time. <coughs> that loop opens. That loop opens. And its seesaw effect is where Good. now you can start to see where one and gain strength and one loses strength. Good, excellent. Would, would this experience cause him to not ever interact with dogs any longer? Not yet. No. No, no, under normal circumstances, you're right, it won't. But I can think of a circumstance in which it would. But I'll tell you about that in a second, okay? Just that what's gonna happen is exactly what John said. Just, just gonna have, he's gonna now be able to perceive the other side of the continuum. 
where that side was virtually non-existent to him, he's now able to perceive the possibility of and make the distinction between dogs that are friendly and dogs that aren't, where before he couldn't make that distinction at all. But it isn't necessarily going to cause him never to interact with dogs again. He's just going to be more careful. But I can certainly think of a situation where he could not ever interact with dogs again. Based on another belief. Anybody think of anything? Based on a belief, not Based on another belief, another belief that comes into play. What if he has a highly evolved belief in betrayal? From other experiences, having been betrayed, this opens up the possibility that this could That's right. Well. In other words, if he has a highly of good, John, this is great. If he has a highly evolved belief in betrayal, what will happen, or what could happen, is that he would say, you know what? If one dog can betray me, all dogs can betray me. And all that positive energy that he had about the nature of dogs will now get switched into a belief that is completely negative. And he will no longer interact with dogs. Everybody see what happened? And it can only take one experience. That's all, just one. You mean like you never got bit? Well, that'd be exactly. pretty hard to deny. Well, I'm, I'm saying in a, in a, yeah. not in that situation, but yeah, there there are there are things definitely the things that we we just we can you know more, I guess. Think, yeah. Well, no, no denial is is a real state of mind. The implications of what we're experiencing are too difficult to deal with in the moment. Any questions about this? It seems like you guys are getting it. Are you, are you getting it, Daniel? Are you all right? OK. Jeff? <coughs> if there's no questions, we'll go to lunch. <coughs> it's almost 12 o'clock anyway, right? Yeah, it's like, yeah. 10 to 2. 10 to that's fine. And you know what? Uh, we, we should probably make sure you're back by at the latest by, let's say, 20 after 1 or something like that. One of the things that I want, I want you to contemplate just for a moment, in terms of when you look at the kind of nature and characteristics of beliefs, that doesn't really matter what the belief is. But think for, just think for, for, for a moment that if you were born into a culture or a social structure that was, let's say, vastly different than the one you were born into, there's very little in common with what you have, with, with, you know, with the beliefs that you have right now about the nature of the way the world works. Do you think that it's it's that you would hold those beliefs any less strongly than the one that you have right now? No, 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 really. Just it, it would it would be probably I mean, hard to gauge how much energy might be in those beliefs. But the point is, is that those beliefs would be as real to you as the ones that you're holding right now. So what does that suggest? about the nature of beliefs. What, what would be a characteristic that you could infer as a result of this kind of observation about the nature of beliefs? They're environment bound. They're environment bound, okay. Anything else? Your experiences shape your beliefs. Okay, well your, and then your beliefs shape your experience, right? Yeah. yeah, really, that's important. Your experience shapes your beliefs, and then your beliefs shape your experiences. 
Do you like to sit up at night and think of these? Uh, <laughs> go with that tomorrow. That'll wow them. <laughs> <laughs> How does hip heritage uh, How does heritage? Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't see. I don't see how it does. I thought you referred to that earlier as being the you know, heritage line, meaning, meaning your descendants or genes. Since it's so, uh, I think that there's. I think that there's. Uh, I think certain cultures or, or cultural heritage can have an effect. On, on the kind of beliefs that, kind of maybe characteristics or beliefs that people have. Uh, it's hard to really, well, I don't know, I really want to take that back. I don't want to take that back. I'm sorry. There, because there, there are certain ideas that I have about that, 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 uh, that you know, people born of, of certain cultural heritage can have certain tendencies that, that, are see, that seemingly are genetically encoded. But, but basically, but but basically, basically we, what we can get into is a lot of a lot of kind of cultural racial jokes that you know <laughs> that that may have some validity or truth to them. <laughs> but in the, but, but in, the, in the end, it's the experience that one goes up. No, we're not going to go there. <laughs> Probably might have to edit that out of the video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, in the end, it's, it's still even. Influences from your childhood are acquired. Not, they don't. They don't come that way. As you said earlier, when the child is born, born with no beliefs. Right. Yeah. There's no way a child could be born with a belief because we're defining a belief as based on the basically based on the definition that we have of a belief that we're working with. Based on that definition, there's no possible way a child could be born with one because a belief is simply a concept about the nature of the way the world works. It's an energized concept. Okay. It's, it's a group of abstract words that form into a concept that is energized. What, what do you mean? Yeah. 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 That's as I understand in there. Okay. Yeah, it's an energized concept, and I don't know if there's any possible way that, that a newborn child could could have an energized concept. You know, mother talking to the child in the womb or something like that, or, I don't know, I mean, I would rule it out. So what were you getting at? I'm sorry. I was just thinking about the way to And this is going to be the work done, the friends of the child recognize his mother's voice, and that's the general soothing to him when he's born, so, so that, you know, there are some experiences in utero. Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely, and and what and what they you know to me what they become are like these these undifferentiated memories that just that seem like you're probably floating around unattached to any particular mental structure. We start organizing the memories how we how we're taught to organize memories. There might be other ways of organizing it. I don't know, but because we speak in a language, it seems like we structure everything based on that language. And so all these experiences, all these memories of experiences, and all the energy then get put into this context of of words and concepts. And so we're defining a belief as simply an energized concept about the nature of the way the world works that will then impact the way we perceive information and how we behave. And so what we're basically saying is that since the environment can express itself in an infinite combination of ways, in other words, there's those external forces that we have to interact with to fulfill our needs, wants, and desires, in other words, we have to step into an experience. We actually have to initiate and step into an experience to be able to fulfill ourselves. We're going to find that some of our beliefs work, meaning they cause us to perceive information, environmental information, in a way that's consistent, where the, where the environment is actually consistent with what we want to accomplish, or cause us to perceive information in a way that's consistent with what's available from the environment's perspective so that we can decide to take the appropriate set of steps that we need to take to fulfill our goal. Because when you think about it, if, if, I, if I've got a goal or a desire or some aspiration to do something and I've got to interact with all these external forces to do it, I'm going to decide to take a certain step. And that step can be in this direction or it can be in this direction or it can be in this direction, right? And, and whatever, whatever choices that I perceive as being available to me, and in some cases I might not perceive any choices at all other than one. 
that would be operating out of, let's say, a, a fairly limited belief, you might say, if you only maybe see one possibility. When from the environment's perspective, there could be many possibilities. We've demonstrated that with all the examples that we've used. But I'm going to make a decision about, about taking a particular step into an experience, and if I find I'm experiencing satisfaction, okay, I'll go back to, let me get this one, hold on, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, if I'm experiencing satisfaction, that's my reality in this moment, let's say. Okay, I've taken, I've made a decision, I've taken a step, I got an outcome. Okay? And that's one thing that's nice about trading is that what we do is we get immediate outcomes. It's very hard. It's very difficult to shift the responsibility. Although we may try, it's very difficult to shift the responsibility of that outcome to something or someone else because we're the ones that made the decision to get into the trade or get out of the trade when we did. So we know it's us. And the market has no, really, when you think about it, the market has, has no power to cause us to, to uh, perceive its information in any particular way. So if I'm experiencing satisfaction, that's my state of mind in this moment. That's a nice state of mind to be in, right? Satisfaction, joy, happiness, excitement. What would that tell me about the nature of my beliefs and relationship to the environmental forces that existed in that moment? In what? You're in, in harmony. Yeah, exactly. You're in harmony. There's, and, no, there's no conflict to deflect you. Another yeah, there's no conflict. There's no conflict either internally. Now think about this. There's no conflict either internally or externally. And that could be described in some cases, in some ways, as the zone. Because you're operating in perfect harmony, not only within yourself, where you're completely reconciled about what you're doing and why you're doing it. You're completely reconciled. That's, the, that's our definition of acceptance. There's no inner conflict. And there's also no conflict with whatever it is that your, whatever your agenda is with the external environment. That would be the zone. You're in perfect harmony. Does that make sense to everybody? Any degree less than that, and we could say that whatever beliefs we're operating out of are not completely functional in relationship to, one, our goals, two, the environmental forces that exist in that moment in terms of the way they can express themselves or the way they are expressing themselves. So if you recognize the dynamics within this context, as I just explained it, then, you know, what we're, what, you know, and if you're not satisfied with your outcomes, what are you going to do? I'm, I'm going to change my beliefs. Normally, the way we, what we learn how to do is to try to change the external circumstances. If I'm not getting what I want, if I'm feeling disappointed, things aren't working out the way that I want them to, what we try to do is control the external forces that are in conflict with our beliefs, desires, or expectations. Now, if the environmental situation has to be controlled, meaning that you have to exert some sort of force on the environment to shift it in a way that it conforms with your expectation, and normally what we're talking about is other people, then you're, you're naturally going to get a consequence that's going to reflect the fact that nobody likes having to behave in a way that's inconsistent with what they believe to be true. Because if you're operating out of a place of superior power or expertise, and people feel like they're being used or they're being uh, forced to do something, they always find a way to retaliate. And we know this just based on our own experiences and feelings. People don't, if there's, if there's harmony between two people, nothing need to be done when you get right down to it. If two people's belief system are in harmony, then there's no point to manipulate, there, there's no point in manipulating them. There's no point in exerting any kind of power or control over them at all. And if they're not, 
and you're exercising some sort of power over somebody, they're going to find a way to retaliate. That's a consequence that we're going to experience if we're in the position of power. And you're going to find eventually that it doesn't work. It works for a while, but eventually it won't. Does anybody disagree with that? To me, the best way to do it is change your beliefs. Not that technically beliefs can't be changed, I don't think, but we're going to talk about that in just, just a second. I, I use those words because I don't know any of the words to use, but you know, just as long as you understand the context in which I'm using it. So ultimately, what you want, ultimately, I would think that what you want to do is to get yourself in, in perfect harmony with the market, meaning be in that state of mind, that's the zone. The problem with being in a psychological zone is that you can't will yourself into it. You can set up the conditions, set up the mental conditions that are most conducive to spontaneously finding yourself in it. But to will yourself into it, I don't think it's possible. Because any act of, of, of force at all, will implies force. Any act of will uh, works against that kind of, it, it, you're, not, you're, not, you're not in harmony. If you, have to, if you have to exert any force at all, then you're not obviously not in harmony that there's conflicts. And as a result, you're not in the zone. Because when you're in that zone, everything you're doing, everything you're seeing, Everything you're seeing and everything you're doing is virtually perfect in relationship to the conditions. <clears throat> and often, many of the things that, that, you, that people find themselves doing are things they've never done before. Like, so you can take great athletes, for an example, that, that make these really terrific moves. They're in the zone in the moment. And it's not like something they contemplated beforehand. It's something they look back on after they did it and said, wow. Whew, man, that's, that's really something. And then everybody else, if it happens to be on tape or something, everybody else looks at it, they dissect it, they break it down to, you know, to the smallest incremental steps into a learning process and then try to teach other people how to do it. But the first time it was done by the athlete, it was spontaneous, meaning it was creative. It, wasn't, it didn't come from the intellect. It didn't come from an intellectual thought process. I mean, the best example that I like to use of, of let's say, someone being in a zone, although we all know of, of seen and seen in many circumstances with like great sporting events, but, but you know, back, what, 20 years ago with that soccer player, Pele, or whatever his name was, where I, I am, I, without ever having met the guy or talked to him, or even read much about him, I am absolutely sure that the first time that he decided to do one of these back flips and hit the ball over with his feet over his head, you know, he didn't think about doing that. He just did it. Yeah. So with Roger Bannister, the four minute mile was probably a classic example of the fact that no one brought Yeah, sure. I, yeah, it would have to be because it had never been done before. And in, and in essence, it would be creative. So what's interesting, with, what's nice about trading is that, see, what, what you have is with, with great athletes, these are people who virtually devote their lives to something. And, and even though there are many people and athletes who devoted their lives to their profession, there's still only a small percentage that, that get into that zone or consistently get into that zone. And I think one of the primary characteristics that, that's necessary to, let's say, consistently get into the zone is that, is that you eventually have to develop a, a pretty firm belief that mistakes don't exist. That mistakes are just experiences that point the way. Because see, if you're afraid of making a mistake, that's going to keep you from getting into the zone. That's 
Yeah, well, that, that you're talking about cultural upbringing. You're talking about a cultural upbringing that you know that that for all virtually all of us, all of us have learned about mistakes in painful ways. And so you're you're talking about undoing a, a lot of negative energy. See, so you take like a guy like a Michael Jordan who gets to a point. And see, a lot of this, and see, a lot of this can, can happen inadvertently. Now, I'm not saying that Michael Jordan didn't go up, grow up with the same kind of beliefs about what it meant to make a mistake as everyone else. But see, eventually, as he reached a certain stature in terms of where he was at with the rest of his players in the NBA, he probably got to a point where, where he just didn't care anymore because he was so big, he was so famous, and he had so much money that it didn't matter. And when it didn't matter, <coughs> is when it was much easier for him to just flow, spontaneously find himself doing things that, that he otherwise wouldn't have even thought about, couldn't have probably never thought about doing, at least at a rational level. And it's the same way as traders. What's interesting, like I said, what I was about to say is that what's really, what's really so nice about trading is that it gives all of us, it gives every single one of us the opportunity to be that great athlete. And we don't have to get picked in the draft by the NFL or the NBA or the NHL. All we have to do is open up an account. <laughs> and we have the opportunity to experience states of mind, or let's say states of, of development, that you know, some, in many cases, only some of the most accomplished people in the world have, have uh, you know, attained. It's available to all of us. But like I said, you can't will yourself into it. It's something you can set up the most conducive conditions to find yourself in that state of mind. And normally, when you recognize, the moment that you recognize you're in a zone, chances are you're going to pop right out of it. In other words, the moment that you recognize at a rational level that you're in that state of mind, you will probably pop right out of it. Until you get to the point where you have trained your rational mind to trust and accept what's going on in that moment. Because see, much of what you're going to be doing or thinking while you're in a zone cannot be verified rationally. It is not in, is not in let's say, your repertoire of what you know at a rational level. Because at a rational level, you only, it's only your past. Everything you know at a rational level is your past. When you go into a creative state of mind, you are bringing forth something that didn't previously exist, meaning it isn't in your rational mind to verify. Now, if your rational mind is mistrustful of information that it can't verify, meaning creative information and creative states of mind, then you're going to have a problem. Because your rational mind is going to go, whoa, hey, hey, whoa, wait a second. You, know, you find yourself going in this direction spontaneously. You're in the zone. Your rational mind kind of turns on and says, hey, what's going on? No. This is what's going on over here, based on your memories. This is what's going on right here. And so it pops you right out. You change your direction, only to, only to have this experience where the outcome is far diminished. Not saying it's a bad experience, but in, you know, greatly diminished in relationship to if you'd have stayed on this path right here, which was the perfect experience. That's normally referred to, at least with trading, would be, would be trading intuitively, where you get an intuitive impulse, an intuitive hunch. And, and, I, and everyone has the capability of being intuitive. Everyone has the capability of accessing intuitive information. Again, information that can't be verified at a rational level. The problem is, especially for most men, is that most men are so rational that, that they have a very difficult time trusting intuitive information. And women seem to be, based on their makeup, seem to, me, seem to be more inherently intuitive. But, but males have done a lot to try to, you know, try to kind of, in, in essence, beat it out of women. Uh, because you know, if they don't trust it for themselves, they certainly aren't going to trust it for them. 
And so because of our male dominated society, it's probably caused a lot of caused a lot of women not to trust their own intuition. So that's a whole process that if you want to trade intuitively, which we're going to get into more tomorrow, trade intuitively, then you're going to have to train your rational mind to accept creative information, creative based information. Okay, so where we're at is on page, uh, page three of section four. <laughs> And we're going to get into the specific characteristics of a belief. First of all, it is my contention, I have a notion about this, that, uh, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> it is my, <laughs> that beliefs have to be, that the energy that beliefs are composed of have to be conscious in some way. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Like, like they have to have some degree of conscious awareness because beliefs seem to take on a life of their own. And how else could beliefs cause us to recognize in the environment something that's similar to, or in many cases seemingly identical to, something that we already believe? It's like there has to be some sort of conscious awareness there. And the only reason why there has to be some sort of degree of conscious awareness I'm not saying a great degree of conscious awareness, but at least some degree of it, is that how would, how would our beliefs know that, that, we're, that we're being confronted with information that is in conflict with what we believe? And at the same time, why would they compel us to instantaneously reject any information that's in conflict with what we already believe to be true? So there seems to be like a degree of consciousness there. And the other thing, too, is that when you look at the common characteristics of beliefs, like, like you, you could say there's, there's universal, it, it, like there's, there's some universal um, properties there. It's like, is there anyone in this room that does not like to be believed? Do you like to be believed? Does it feel uncomfortable to be disbelieved? You see, this is universal. Uncomfortable to be disbelieved. Regardless of what the belief is, it doesn't feel good. Do we feel more comfortable being around people who share our beliefs? Just naturally feel more comfortable with people who share our beliefs. And uncomfortable around people who what? Don't. So I think there's some, like, some degree of consciousness there. And as a result, I'm saying that beliefs seem to take on a life of their own. And the reason why I state it that way, is that they take on a life of their own, is because we have this capability of thinking in any direction that we, that we choose to. We can think outside of any limitation imposed by any belief. We can draw any bizarre thought we want to our mind and contemplate it. And, and it doesn't matter if, if the conflicting thoughts or conflicting ideas or information is coming from the external environment or coming from our own willingness to think outside the belief. What we'll find is that if we're thinking something that's in conflict with an energy structure that's inside of us, it will do something to protect itself. So one of the characteristics is that beliefs seem to resist any force that, that would alter its present form. <coughs> And they also seem to resist extinction. Now that would make sense, wouldn't it? That beliefs seem to see to resist <laughs> extinction. And why do you think that would make sense? Why would I say that? Anybody got any ideas? Yeah, they don't want to disappear. They don't want to disappear. Okay. Now we don't know why they don't want to disappear. You know, you think, they don't want to die. <laughs> yeah, we don't know why that that might be the case. Of the fact that we can observe that is probably so. And the, the way that I thought about it was that if most people consider what they've learned to believe an inherent part of their identity, and if the sum total of our identity would resist extinction, meaning that if someone threatened us, we'd, we'd fight for our lives, just naturally, right? And not only would we fight for our lives, but, but 
virtually every war and every conflict throughout the whole history of humanity is based on what? Conflicting beliefs, right? Is that what we're talking about here, conflicting beliefs? Every conflict, every war, every argument is based on simply conflicting beliefs. So if the sum total of who we are would, would resist extinction and fight to stay alive, it just seemed to me that it was, it was OK to infer that the, that the individual parts would, too. If the sum total will, so will the individual parts. Meaning that, this is really important, when you're working with your beliefs, fighting your beliefs doesn't work. OK? No matter what you may find in terms of in your mental environment as a belief, and no matter how distasteful you might think having that belief might be, or how dysfunctional, or how it might have messed up your life in some ways that are, that are uh, not very pleasing to you, directing any negative energy whatsoever towards your beliefs will only cause them to become usually more powerful at the very worst, and at the very least, fight you back. The only thing that really works in terms of an attitude, as far as I know, when you're working with your beliefs, is complete acceptance. I accept what's there. I understand it. I accept it. And as a result of my acceptance, it allows me to render that belief non-functional. In other words, it makes it easy for me to draw the energy out of it. I can retire it. But if I do something to fight it, it'll fight back. How, how would you fight a belief? Can you give me an example? Um, <coughs> direct negative energy toward it? Yeah, just direct negative energy toward it. I mean, people. How, how would, you do would you give me an example? It's kind of abstract. Fear of snakes. What's that? Trying to convince someone about the fear of a snake. Um, well, in a, a, see, uh, well, that's, you know, you're talking about an internal process. Um, and I'll give you a good here. Let's, man, crap. And that leads you to the question of how do you disempower somebody? Yeah, we're going to get into that. Uh, I don't. I don't have it with me. It's up in my room. Uh, there's uh, what I was gonna. What I was gonna do for an example is give you or read to you uh, an exercise that uh, uh, of a trader that I worked with a while back. And um, one of the things that one of the things that we did. He had a particularly difficult childhood where his father was really abusive, and as a result, it, it he he ended up acquiring some um, some really troublesome beliefs. Um, about power and about lying and about not not believing he deserved things. Now, the way, if, if for example, if he approached trying to change those beliefs from the perspective of, of like, I hate this, I don't want this inside of me any longer, I don't accept this as being me. What you're what you're going to find is that is that those beliefs won't be de-energized as a result of taking that kind of an approach. Does that make sense? In other words, in essence, what you're really doing when you, when you fight your beliefs or approach them from a negative perspective, in essence, almost what you're doing is you're denying that they're a part of your identity. And see, once a belief exists, it will, it will always exist. In other words, it will always be a part of who we are. It's just a, the, the, the determining factor is just how much energy is there. And so you, what you, when, you, when you're using the techniques that I'm going to give you later on about how to draw the energy out, all I want to do is preface all this with, with, with that you have to be vigilant and careful over the fact that you're doing this from a more accepting and loving perspective as opposed to one where, you know, 
it would sure would have been nice if this didn't exist and uh, and I you know or I don't understand it or uh, you know I just really want to deny that it's even there and as a result just you know just kind of like what people have a technique of kind of shoving things into the back of their minds and they can they can create some sort of separation between their consciousness and 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 what they're trying to get rid of and in some ways maybe get some temporary relief but but ultimately it's just like putting a you know putting a uh, kind of an effective band-aid on a wound it doesn't work And, and another characteristic is that is that I I don't beliefs beliefs don't have the power to dismantle themselves. See, once an experience is etched in our memory, it's gonna whether we remember the the pathways to that memory or not, it's there. The difference is between whether we can or we can't remember something is just a matter of, you know, just a matter of how many times we reinforce the memory and 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 our desire to even remember it in the first place. Because I've found that there are many things that you know I just don't pay attention to, and as a result, it completely escape my, in some cases, seemingly escape my awareness. But when I need the information, it pops into my brain. And it pops into my consciousness, put it that way. So it's there. It's the same way with the belief. Once it gets etched, once it sort of gets etched into our mental environment, it'll it'll be there forever. But it doesn't have to affect us forever. That's the difference. So did I answer your question, John? Okay. Okay, so beliefs seem to naturally resist any force that would alter their present form. They seem to take on a life of their own. They have some degree of conscious awareness. And the next characteristic is all active beliefs demand expression. Now, what does that mean? What do you think that means? All active beliefs demand expression. Act in accordance with your beliefs. Uh, yeah, you will act in accordance with your beliefs. But, but don't think of it in terms of, of the total you. Think of it in terms of the individual beliefs. If I said all active beliefs or any individual belief will demand expression. I mean, first of all, I've got to, I, I use, pay attention to the fact that I use the verb, or, or not a verb, but a, uh, yeah, uh, what would that be, a pro, or an adverb, active. It's like, it's like that would imply that we could have active and inactive beliefs, right? Uh, what would be an example of an inactive belief that we've already talked about? Yeah. Santa Claus. That's an inactive belief. It exists in my mind or in yours, but it doesn't have any energy, or it doesn't have enough energy to cause, to have any impact whatsoever on our perception of information and our behavior. That's an inactive belief. If it's an active belief, it implies that it has energy. And as such, what I'm saying is that it will demand expression. Now, by saying that, am I implying that all of our active beliefs are swirling around in our brain at any given moment? Yeah, exactly. Just just the ones that get triggered. But once they get triggered, if there's energy there, what happens? Our our consciousness is flooded with whatever whatever that belief and whatever energy is in that belief, not only in our mind but in our whole body. Then we experience whatever state of mind corresponds with that belief. And as a result, think that or assume that what we are experiencing is the true reality of the situation. Because keep in mind that our state of mind is always the absolute truth. Joy is the absolute truth. Satisfaction is the absolute truth. Happiness is the absolute truth. Fear, regret, dissatisfaction, anger, anxiety, betrayal. When we're in it, it's the truth. What may not be the truth is the belief that triggered the state of mind. Okay, there's, there, there's, a, there's a profound distinction here that I'm making. The state of mind we end up in is the absolute truth. The belief that triggered the state of mind could be completely dysfunctional. So the 
the end result is accurate. Yeah, the end result. Well, yeah, you can't so you can't deny the fact that you're in a particular state of mind. Right. But the trigger. The trigger may be completely dysfunctional. It's just like remember the boy and the dog example. As far as the boy is concerned, that dog caused him to experience terror. Was that the truth? No. No. No, and the reason why the reason why he believed that dog causes terror is because of this this instantaneous association that he makes between the similarities in the now moment to the terror and the and the dogs that exist in his mind, which make the two identical. It makes the now moment identical with the memory. Once he's the once the state of mind has been triggered, the terror that he's in is completely real. The belief that got him into the terror is completely dysfunctional. Because all dogs are not dangerous. See, so now that you can, you can make this separation between the actual belief that you may have learned causing the particular state of mind, you can say, hey, you know what? Yeah, the state of mind is definitely real, but you know, if I change my belief about this, I'm going to experience a different state of mind. And that's, and that's in essence what we're getting at. Change your belief and you experience a different state of mind under, under similar circumstances. Do you have the same kind of emotional response? You know, if I, if I, if I said, hey, let's all get out a coin and, and predict the flip of a coin. If you the same kind of emotional response you might have is doing the same thing when you put on a trade? That'd be nice. Completely different. Why? You're operating out of a different belief. You know why? You know, I know you're operating out of a different belief. You say it's completely different. You're operating out of a belief that the outcome of a coin flip is random. So therefore, all you're doing is guessing, and it doesn't matter. Right? Now, because you do analysis, because your intellect is involved, with the way you analyze the market, you have associated the fact that you're using your intellect with having to be right. When trading doesn't have anything to do with having to be right. Take trading out of a right or wrong context, put it into the random category in terms of outcomes, and you get the same emotional response as when you flip, predict the flip of a coin. You don't care. Change your belief, your state of mind changes. Did we skip it's a not, No. It's not exactly the same. I mean, if you flip the coin, it's told me that they could lose a thousand dollars. If I don't guess it right, my emotion I'm not going to be the same. No, that's true. When you've got something at stake like that, now I, I, I'm not saying the example is perfect, but you know, I just, I just. Just giving you an idea that that. No, I understand, but there, there is a lot more than just being right or wrong. It's a, it's like flipping a coin. It's like a paper trading. A lot of people do a paper trading. Uh, once you put money on the line, then they're not doing this well. Right. But if you believe that you're going to have a thousand flips and it was going to come out even, then who cares anyway? Right. Or if you can accept the risk, or whatever it is. That you See, the, the, whole idea, the whole, whole idea, Daniel, is to be able to get yourself to the point where you accept the risk and the cost of, what, of, of no, trading. I understand that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. It wasn't a perfect example. You're right. As far as no, the I, I, I wasn't trying to get you on a bad example. Yeah. I'm just trying to say that as a trader, I'm not going to catch all the 55% of that pattern that is going to work. Uh, the money makes me uh, more concerned about my ability to catch every one of the samples that are going to... Every one of the what? I did. Every one of the trades that are going to complete that percentage of this button. So the money has a lot to do with it. It's... Uh, oh, I know. I, I, I know I, it does. I know yeah. I'm explaining myself. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, I understand. You've got to get to the point where the money takes on less significance. 
where whatever money that you're expending is you're expending as a result of the cost of doing business. So we'll, 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 that's what we're, we'll get into the, that, that more tomorrow. Okay, John, you said something about skipping a step? All right. Okay. So, so the, the example that I like to use is that uh, in terms of active beliefs demanding expre expression, when, when the environment triggers something and, our, you know, and it, it, it floods our consciousness, it's like it wants to come out, doesn't it? And even if we know that we're in a, in a circumstance where it would be best or in our best interest not to express ourselves, it is extremely difficult to hold it back. It goes to your consciousness. What? It goes to your consciousness. Well, what do you mean? It would, it's, okay, you explain yourself a little bit more. Something from the external environment triggers an a active belief, whether you want to express it or not. It goes to your consciousness to think about whether you think it's appropriate to express it or not. Yeah. Okay. But th but all I'm saying is that it's difficult to hold it back. And and what you'd need to hold it back would be another set of beliefs that 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 let's say are stronger than that particular belief expressing itself. So the example I use is, let's say, a superior subordinate in a, in a boss-employee employee, employee relationship, you know, where the boss is saying something and the employee completely disagrees, thinks the boss is full of shit, and, but he's nodding his head, yeah, like this, right? But what's going on inside his mind? Is he agreeing? No, he's going like this, no, you're full of shit. But, it's, and, it, and, it, and the only thing that's holding him back is a belief that the energy of the belief that says I can't tell him the truth, I can't be, I can't be candid about what it is that I think about what he's saying. Well, there are some beliefs that you might even, you know, if he said something that was insulting, you might hold not hold it back. So you might sure. different degrees. Of different the degrees. Beliefs. You're absolutely right. The strength, like, you know, right. if he says something that smeared me, maybe I would. Sure. Do and there are employees who would who would tell him he's full of shit no matter what. Because that's, you know, that's just what they believe. It's like, I'm going to be candid and, you know, if I think the guy's got his head up his butt, I'm going to say so. But interestingly enough, if we hold back, and this is what I really wanted to get to, is if we hold back, what's going to happen? Let's say we, we did the nod, okay? Hold back. We, we held back expressing it. What's going to happen? It's going to build up. It's and we will find somebody else to unload on, right? <laughs> the next person that comes into, you know, our, again, our field of awareness that we feel that it's possible to unload on, that's exactly what we're going to do. The point that I'm making, of course, is that if it's an active belief, it gets triggered, it demands to be expressed. Now, there's some really powerful implications here. These are the implications that have to do with self-sabotaging beliefs as we start accumulating more and more money as traders. And some of these beliefs, like I said, we're, we're not even aware of any longer. There are things that we were taught years ago that seemingly don't have anything to do with our lives up until we get to the point where we start accumulating a lot of money and find ourselves doing some really, you know, making some really ridiculous trading errors that we may have left behind years ago or a long time ago. Because the more money that we're making causes those beliefs about our sense of self-valuation to start demanding to be expressed. Because here's the problem. I don't think anybody really grows up with, and maybe Gil Bill Gates might be an exception, but it goes, grows up with an, an un, what it means to have an unlimited sense of self-valuation. In other words, we seem to be taught inherent limits about what we think we're worth. And whatever those limits are, once we hit them as traders, because it can come real fast, it will cause those beliefs about what we're worth to demand to be expressed. And see, the problem is they don't have to be specific beliefs. What I mean by that is that what I found is that there are, can be any number of beliefs that fall into a category, a generalized category of, I simply don't deserve. And it kind of works like this.
If you were to inventory, if you were to inventory every experience in your life that was positive, and let's say contributed to a positive sense of self-valuation, where you feel worthy, where it made you feel worthy, and all the experiences in your life that contributed to a negative sense of self-valuation, what you'd end up with is a net sense of self-valuation, meaning if you balanced all the positive energy against all the negative energy, you would come up, let's say, net positive, net negative, or neutral. The problem is that if you're net negative, of course, it's going to be very difficult to accumulate money. And the, the other problem is a lot of these experiences may not specifically have been, let's say, directed toward a sense of self-valuation, but if they were painful experiences, either both physically or emotionally, many times what ends up happening is that, especially as children, these experiences get put into this broad, generalized category where, let's say, a parent might say, oh, you know, you, you, you hurt yourself, you fell, you skinned your knee you, or your elbow or whatever, and your mother just told you not to do that. She says, look, see, God punished you. And so then what happens is that what you do is start associating as a child every time that something like that happens with, oh, God punished me, and then the next step is, if God's punishing me, then I must not be a worthy person. So then every negative experience can get categorized. Can, I'm not saying it does, but every negative experience has the potential to get categorized into a broad, broad, let's say, category of I must be an undeserving person or this wouldn't have happened to me. So this can be problematic as traders. And, and other than the, let's say, inability to not think in probabilities causing trading errors, this is the thing that, that is most responsible for these kind of, uh, you know, doing all the hard work and doing really good and following your rules and being disciplined and, and everything you need to do and all of a sudden you just whack yourself. And you start the process over again and whack yourself again. Sense of self-valuation coming in saying, you, you don't deserve this. Remember, all beliefs demand expression. All beliefs seem to take on a life of their own. And regardless of whether or not your desire is to keep on going up like this indefinitely, if your sense of self, total sense of self-valuation doesn't correspond with any particular level, wherever it is, then it, it will find a way to express itself on your consciousness, meaning how you see the market, what you do in that moment to make sure that you lose the money. It's scary. It just is. It doesn't have to be scary. Is there a way to figure out what Oh yeah, sure. Oh well, no, I'm, you know, you're, you're going to leave, and and I'm not going to. You know, yeah, absolutely, sure there is, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> the upsell takes up. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the next workshop. <laughs> uh, so, so are we, you know. Are we kind of, is everyone together on this? It's, it's all kind of coming together for you a little bit, okay? And the last characteristic on page four is that beliefs keep on working whether we remember them or not. I've kind of already mentioned this. We do not have to have a conscious recollection of what it is that we've ever believed or learned to believe. The only determining factor as to whether or not a belief has potential to act on your, your perception of information and your behavior is if it has energy. If there's energy, it gets triggered. You don't even have to know, you, know, you really consciously you don't even have to know what's going on at all. Your behavior can be a complete mystery. 
you can even be conscious of your behavior being a complete mystery in the moment and be watching yourself screw up and still be powerless to do it. I'm sure maybe everyone in this room has had the experience of, experience of being in a situation, especially as traders, where you knew you were doing, doing something inappropriate. You virtually knew almost, I would say you knew consciously you were going to lose, but that you were losing and you were literally sort of like outside of yourself, watching the market take your money away and virtually powerless to do anything about it until something else got triggered in your mind where you finally blew out of the trade. Anybody not have that experience? You don't have to know where that behavior is coming from for it to happen. You don't even have to understand it. You don't have to have any understanding of it, any knowledge of it. It's just going to happen until you do get knowledge of it, till you do understand it and do something about it if you want. There was a guy I worked with at Merrill Lynch back in the early 80s that went out and left Merrill Lynch and went on to be a uh, floor trader at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the uh, S&P pit. And he was a really devout person, devout religiously. And one of the, we used to have conversations a lot, and this is before I really even became a coach, but we used to have conversations a lot about, about what I felt was an inherent conflict between him wanting to be a successful trader and his, and his religious beliefs. And he just refused to believe that there was a conflict there. And he was down on the floor for quite a while, and he was a one-lot trader, one and twos. And he barely eked out a living. I mean, you know, maybe he'd make a tick a day, you know, 50 bucks, or I mean, or not, I mean, uh, uh, well, t not maybe a tick a day. I mean, maybe like a, a quarter of a point a day or a half a point a day, like 50 bucks a day or $75 or something like that. And, and um, then he got on a, on, a, on a bit of a winning streak and started, started accumulating some money. And... He was in the pit one day and literally snapped. And by the time, and back then, where, where, where you didn't have to turn in your cards on the kind of frequent basis, where floor traders, you know, they got their trading cards, they, they record their trades. Now they have to turn them in, like, you know, practically every five minutes or something. But I don't know what it is. But there, they turned them in at the end of the day. Well, he was in the S&P pit. He had, like, on, I don't know, he had two or 300 contracts on. And by the time somebody from the clearing firm found out about it, you know, he'd lost about a million five dollars. About a million five, I mean. It just, the conflict got to the point where he just literally snapped. And he just kept putting on a larger and larger losing position until, until he forced himself out of the business to do something that he really, to do something else, which he was really a good college professor, and that's what he went back to doing, and, you know, and, and there was no conflict. Mark, would you clarify something? Sure. I think, I think you suggested that as you uh, de-energize the old beliefs, mm -hmm. they drop into subconsciousness. No, I didn't say that. No, that, and that's not what I'm saying there either. What I'm saying is that, is that beliefs can exist at, at two different levels. They can, they can, you can be consciously aware of your beliefs, okay? And they can drop down to a sub -level, sub, subconscious level of operation. <coughs> and, and the best way that I, that I have of explaining that is, that is using driving as an example. Things that we learn typically do drop down to a subconscious level of operation, which basically frees our consciousness up to do other things to pay attention to other things, what's going on in the environment, to learn, it, to learn something else, as a matter of fact. So for an example, what I noticed when I was in college, and you know, and people would drink a lot, is that there were, there were times where, you know, not only did I observe people driving completely drunk, but even myself, where I got from point A to point B and had no conscious recollection whatsoever of, of how I got there. Totally unconscious. Now, you know, I'm not saying the distance was great, but the point is, is that something must have been an operation that caused me to be able to drive that car to do what I did without having any, con having any conscious awareness of it. 
the skills that we learn do, do drop down to an, unlevel, an unconscious level so that we can pay attention to other things. So that when you're teaching somebody how to drive, like the first example or the first opportunity that I ever had in my life to do that, of course, the first thing you realize is all the things you take for granted. It's like, you know, there's, there's a lot to driving, that, so when you t try to teach a, a 15 or 16 year old how to drive, it's like there's all kinds of skills that they don't have. They don't, you know, the coordination between steering wheel and brakes and, and looking out the mirrors and everything else like that. It's like there's a lot of things they need to learn. But once they all, once they all get learned, like I said, they just drop down and they operate at that level. Now, what I think that for, them, for as many people as probably drive drunk in, in any given moment in our society or any society, the reason why there aren't even more accidents than what there are is because our skills do operate, whether we're conscious of them or not. But what ends up happening is that if the circumstances require a conscious decision, that's when, other than someone falling asleep, that's when someone's going to get into an accident. It's because they don't have the decision-making capacity to react fast enough or even make the appropriate decision. But if the circumstances are relatively normal, then you know you can virtually drive unconscious. That's even scarier. <laughs> That's right. So, so then what we hope to get <coughs> new tricks, new high, high beliefs that are so energized that even in our subconscious, they go all the yeah, they automatically work. It doesn't matter where they reside. It doesn't matter if they reside consciously or subconsciously. It just doesn't matter. Th that's an, that, as far as I'm concerned, this, this dichotomy between conscious and subconscious is, is pretty much uh, sort of man-made anyway. I don't really believe there has to be any kind of separation between conscious and subconscious. If you want access to this information, you can have it. There are any number of techniques available to get access to whatever information you know exists in what psychologists or psychiatrists call your subconscious mind. It's really just a function of desire and, and a willingness to ask questions. That's all it really is. And you can do this to the extent that you virtually erase this, this, this boundary. I think it's, like I said, an artificial boundary between conscious and subconscious. Like I said before, it's really a matter of what you believe. If you believe you can have access to all this, then, you, then you'll get access to it. If you don't believe it, you won't. Whether you believe it or not believe it, you're right. In both ways, it's gonna, either way, it's going to work. If you believe it's possible, it's going to work. If you believe it isn't possible, it's going to work. You're going to be right in both circumstances. So some of the techniques that we're going to go over have to do with learning how to get access to some of this information if you feel it's warranted and necessary. And like I said last night, if you don't want access to it, but you do think that there is a possibility that you know, there are beliefs that reside in your subconscious that uh, would have a negative effect on your ability to accumulate money, then you're going to have to compensate in the way that you trade. And basically that compensation is going to be you're going to have to trade mechanically. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to make sure that the only thing you do has very rigid rules so that you can make a clear distinction between what your rules say to do and what you might feel compelled to do as a result of self-sabotage so that you can make, that you, it is very clear in your mind what's happening in that moment. Because you know that any time, the first moment you start noticing that you want to break a rule, then what you know that probably what's happening is that you've got some sort of subconscious beliefs that are acting on your perception of information and your behavior. And you know, you can either refocus or not trade. You, are you guys, you're not getting overwhelmed, are you? Oh, okay, good. How do you find out which, you know, the subconscious beliefs? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> no, that's, that's, no, that's the next one. Again, that, that, that's also the next seminar, okay? <laughs> what time is it? 2.25. Okay.
Wait, so let's see where we're at right here. Okay, we're almost through this. Um, I'm on page six. I've already talked about what the truth is. What is the truth? How do we determine what the truth is? Whatever works. What's that? I like this because if you go to the market every day and you say anything can happen, and I can be right every single day. That's <laughs> if right. Anything can happen. If I believe that, it doesn't matter what happens, then I'm right. That's, that's that's just what is. That's right. See, you're, you're going to be right every day because as long as I believe that something is going to happen, anything can happen or something is going to happen, I'm always right. I'm, I'm never wrong. <laughs> but it's a truth. I'm expecting something to happen and I'm never wrong. Well, you're making money or not the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But at least I don't have this, but at least I've taken away this potential to define and interpret information in a painful way. My expectation is always being fulfilled. And that's exactly what you want to do. You want to, you, your expectations, you want your expectations to correspond with the realities from the market's perspective, from the characteristics of the mark, from the, from the market's perspective. The market can do anything. And regardless of what pattern may, it may be presenting in any given moment, the outcome could be anything, right? So therefore, it can do anything. I expect it to do something. The only thing that would, where I'd be disappointed is if it dead, just dead stopped, okay? That, that would not conform to my expectation. Other than that, unless it just stops, I'm right. And see, I've also taken away any responsibility towards or being responsible for what the market does. I am not responsible for what the market does. The market can do anything. All I need to do is be responsible for what I do, how I perceive things. Am I in an, in an objective state of mind? Am I executing my trades without hesitation or internal conflict? Am I making errors? Am I following my plans? Do I have a plan? Why am I here? That's right. Why am I here? <laughs> okay, so we know what the truth is, right? The environment can express itself in an infinite combination of ways, but beliefs limit our ability to perceive the environment from, in, from, the, from a, let's say, a, uh, from the perspective of it being able to express itself in a different combination of ways, then the only way we can really measure the truth is within the context of what we're trying to accomplish in any given moment. Now keep in mind, we're, we're, we're determining what the truth is based on what am I trying to accomplish in this moment? What am I trying to accomplish? Well. Well, yeah, ultimately, but you know, that's good to make money, but keep in mind something, John, okay? You want to keep money as a byproduct. What you're trying to accomplish are acquiring skills, okay? Acquiring skills will, will make money a byproduct of whatever skills you've acquired, as opposed to focusing on the money. So the truth is relative to what am I trying to accomplish and do my beliefs correspond with the, the characteristics and properties of the environment that I'm operating in at any given moment. What are you going to say, Louis? Mark said that we're making money wasn't our goal. Our goal is to be in the zone, and then money will come to be in the zone. Right. That's for sure. Use money as an objective. Ultimately, it can be an objective. No, that's not really true because no. we can set we can set money goals. That's we have to. Yeah. An occupation, you have to have some. You know, it's like Tony Robbins says, if you sit there and meditate all day, they'll suddenly take you out on your sofa because you haven't paid your bills. That's right. <laughs> so there has to be a certain level of financial stability to the occupation. Otherwise, right. acquiring skills and scratching every trade. Well, you're acquiring skills. I'm assuming you're not scratching every trade. No, I'm saying yeah. that the, at the very end of the day. Yeah, I agree. I, right? You're right. Because you can't. I, that's, the way I keep, that's the way I keep score. I love keeping score. Right. I do. I just, you know, I really do. 
you still be focusing on the money in the long run, but not necessarily in yeah, the that's, Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. In other words, you can set money goals for yourself. You can set even daily goals or weekly goals. As long as, as, long as you have these goals, um, how do I put it? Um, Saying. Setting goals, setting goals as traders, financial goals as traders can, can be tricky. It really can because the reason why I say that is because it's easy to get, to get ourselves inordinately focused on the money itself as opposed to the process that leads to the money. Normally what I do when we talk about financial goals is just say set the goal, focus on it, maybe meditate on it for three or four minutes, see your, see your account at that level, whatever, whatever your goal is, and, and whatever time frame it's in, and then just let it go. And just trust that, that whatever, whatever needs to be done and whatever you need to see to get to that goal will, will happen without focusing on the goal itself other than in that moment when you're, when you're putting it out there. Did that make sense to everybody? Okay, so I said that the truth, we determine the truth based, you know, relative to what we're trying to accomplish in any given moment, and that the truth is what works. If we experience satisfaction, it works. If we don't, to whatever degree we don't, then whatever beliefs we're operating out of, we're not necessarily the truth in those, in that, under those circumstances in that situation. I talked about objectivity, I think, a little this morning or last night. I'm not really sure. I'm on page seven. Is it possible to be truly objective? From, from a larger perspective or from the largest perspective, we could say that, that we could share a reality. In other words, where you and I would be perceiving exactly the same things, the same information, and the same possibilities inherent within that information if we had simultaneous awareness of everything going on at once. So in other words, if I could represent all possibilities as a finite line, and I can't, but you know, because it's infinite, but let's say I could represent all possibilities that exist in this, in this line that has finite boundaries between here and here. The only possible way that we could share an objective reality is if all of us had the capability of perceiving every possibility in every distinction in any given moment because we'd be experiencing exactly the same thing. Are you with me on this? We'd be experiencing exactly the same thing because all the information that was available we would be perceiving in the same way. We'd be perceiving all of it. Remember, beliefs limit what we perceive. Beliefs limit what we perceive. So if you and I are operating out of different beliefs, which we are, it means that although we assume that everyone's sharing our reality in every, any given moment, because each of us think that our reality is self-evident, now think about this, in any given moment, each of us think that our reality is self-evident and everyone else has to be sharing it, right? Why wouldn't we? Sure. Which of course is not the case. And the only way that it could be is if, again, we, were, we, we could have the capability of having simultaneous awareness of everything going on at once. If we have not evolved to that state of that place where we can have simultaneous awareness of everything going on at once, it means that we are perceiving something less than what's being made available. What we perceive in relationship to what's available is based on what we've learned to believe. If you and I have learned to believe different things, then we can assume that in any given moment we are not going to be perceiving reality in the same way. It's that simple. And so from a macro perspective, we really can't be objective. However, from the individual's perspective, the micro perspective, we are the micro or the macro, okay? From the individual's perspective, Whatever it is that we have learned to perceive out of what's available, 
we can be objective in the sense that are we in a state of mind where we have access to everything we've learned? Is there anything about what's going on in this moment that's being blocked by some mechanism inside of our mental environment? If there isn't, then we are being objective. To the capability or to the extent that we're capable of. We are being objective to the extent that we are capable of. To any degree that we are experiencing fear, it starts shutting down this perceptual process. The greater the degree of fear, the less possibilities we perceive. Until we get to the point where if we're in a state of complete terror, we may not see any other possibilities at all except what's going on in that moment. In a moment where, if, when, if you're in a state of terror, in a moment that seems to never end. It could be five seconds and it could seem like five days. To me, the best way to do it is change your beliefs. Not that technically beliefs can't be changed, I don't think, but we're going to talk about that in just, just a second. I, I use those words because I don't know any of the words to use, but you know, just as long as you understand the context in which I'm using it. So ultimately, what you want, ultimately I would think that what you want to do is to get yourself in, in perfect harmony with the market, meaning be in that state of mind, that's the zone. The problem with being in a psychological zone is that you can't will yourself into it. You can set up the conditions, set up the mental conditions that are most conducive to spontaneously finding yourself in it. But to will yourself into it, I don't think is possible. Because any act of, of, of force at all, will implies force. Any act of will uh, works against that kind of, it, it, you're, not, you're, not, you're not in harmony. If you, have to, if you have to exert any force at all, then you're not obviously not in harmony that there's conflicts. And as a result, you're not in the zone. Because when you're in that zone, everything you're doing, everything you're seeing, Everything you're seeing and everything you're doing is virtually perfect in relationship to the conditions. And often, many of the things that, that, you, that people find themselves doing are things they've never done before. Like, so you can take great athletes, for an example, that, that make these really terrific moves. They're in the zone in the moment. And it's not like something they contemplated beforehand. It's something they look back on after they did it and said, wow. Whew, man, that's, that's really something. And then everybody else, if it happens to be on tape or something, everybody else looks at it, they dissect it, they break it down to, you know, to the smallest incremental steps into a learning process and then try to teach other people how to do it. But the first time it was done by the athlete, it was spontaneous, meaning it was creative. It, wasn't, it didn't come from the intellect. It didn't come from an intellectual thought process. I mean, the best example that I like to use of, of let's say, someone being in a zone, although we all know of, of seen and seen in many circumstances with like great sporting events, but, but you know, back, what, 20 years ago with that soccer player, Pele, or whatever his name was, where I, I am, I, without ever having met the guy or talked to him, even read much about him, I am absolutely sure that the first time that he decided to do one of these backflips and hit the ball over with his feet, over his head, you know, he didn't think about doing that. He just did it. Yeah. So with Roger Bannister, the four-minute mile was probably a classic example of that that no one Yeah, sure. I, yeah, it would have to be because it had never been done before. And in, and in essence, it would be creative. So what's interesting, what's, you know, what's nice about trading is that, see, what, what you have is with, with great athletes, these are people who virtually devote their lives to something. And, and even though there are many people and athletes who devoted their lives to their profession, there's still only a small percentage that, that get into that zone or consistently get into that zone. And I think one of the primary characteristics that, that's necessary to, let's say, consistently get into the zone 
is that, is that you eventually have to develop a, a pretty firm belief that mistakes don't exist. That mistakes are just experiences that point the way. Because see, if you're afraid of making a mistake, that's going to keep you from getting into the zone. Yeah, well, that, that you're talking about cultural upbringing. You're talking about a cultural upbringing that, you know, that, that for all, virtually all of us, all of us have learned about mistakes in painful ways. And so you're, you're talking about undoing a, a lot of negative energy. See, so you take like a guy like a Michael Jordan who gets to a point and see, a lot of this, and see, a lot of this can, can happen inadvertently. Now, I'm not saying that Michael Jordan didn't go up, grow up with the same kind of beliefs about what it meant to make a mistake as everyone else. But see, eventually, as he reached a certain stature in terms of where he was at with the rest of his players in the NBA, he probably got to a point where, where he just didn't care anymore because he was so big, he was so famous, and he had so much money that it didn't matter. And when it didn't matter, <coughs> is when it was much easier for him to just flow, spontaneously find himself doing things that, that he otherwise wouldn't have even thought about, could have probably never thought about doing, at least at a rational level. And it's the same way as traders. What's interesting, like I said, what I was about to say is that what's really, what's really so nice about trading is that it gives all of us, it gives every single one of us the opportunity to be that great athlete. And we don't have to get picked in the draft by the NFL or the NBA or the NHL. All we have to do is open up an account. <laughs> and we have the opportunity to experience states of mind, or let's say states of, of development, that you know, some, in many cases, only some of the most accomplished people in the world have, have uh, you know, attained. It's available to all of us. But like I said, you can't will yourself into it. It's something you can set up the most conducive conditions to find yourself in that state of mind. And normally, when you recognize, the moment that you recognize you're in a zone, chances are you're going to pop right out of it. In other words, the moment that you recognize at a rational level that you're in that state of mind, you will probably pop right out of it. Until you get to the point where you have trained your rational mind to trust and accept what's going on in that moment. Because see, much of what you're going to be doing or thinking while you're in a zone cannot be verified rationally. It is not in, is not in let's say, your repertoire of what you know at a rational level. Because at a rational level, you only, it's only your past. Everything you know at a rational level is your past. When you go into a creative state of mind, you are bringing forth something that didn't previously exist, meaning it isn't in your rational mind to verify. Now, if your rational mind is mistrustful of information that it can't verify, meaning creative information and creative states of mind, then you're going to have a problem. Because your rational mind is going to, going to go, whoa, hey, hey, whoa, wait a second. You know, you find yourself going in this direction spontaneously. You're in the zone. Your rational mind kind of turns on and says, hey, what's going on? No. This is what's going on over here, based on your memories. This is what's going on right here. And so it pops you right out. You change your direction, only to, only to have this experience where the outcome is far diminished. Not saying it's a bad experience, but in, you know, greatly diminished in relationship to if you'd have stayed on this path right here, which was the perfect experience. That's normally referred to, at least with trading, would be, would be trading intuitively, where you get an intuitive impulse, an intuitive hunch. And, and, I, and everyone has the capability of being intuitive. Everyone has the capability of accessing intuitive information. Again, information that can't be verified at a rational level. The problem is, especially for most men, is that most men are so rational that, that they have a very difficult time trusting intuitive information. 
and women seem to be based on their makeup seem to me seem to be more inherently intuitive but but males have done a lot to try to you know try to kind of in, in essence beat it out of women uh, because you know they don't trust it for themselves they certainly aren't going to trust it for them and so because of our male dominated society it's probably caused a lot of caused a lot of women not to trust their own intuition So that's a whole process that if you want to trade intuitively, which we're going to get into more tomorrow, trade intuitively, then you're going to have to train your rational mind to accept creative information, creative-based information. Okay, so where we're at is on page, uh, page three of section four. <laughs> And we're going to get into the specific characteristics of a belief. First of all, it is my contention, I have a notion about this, that, uh, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> it is my, <laughs> that beliefs have to be, that the energy that beliefs are composed of have to be conscious in some way. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Like, like they have to have some degree of conscious awareness because beliefs seem to take on a life of their own. And how else could beliefs cause us to recognize in the environment something that's similar to, or in many cases seemingly identical to, something that we already believe? It's like there has to be some sort of conscious awareness there. And the only reason why there has to be some sort of degree of conscious awareness I'm not saying a great degree of conscious awareness, but at least some degree of it, is that how would, how would our beliefs know that, that, we're, that we're being confronted with information that is in conflict with what we believe? And at the same time, why would they compel us to instantaneously reject any information that's in conflict with what we already believe to be true? So there seems to be like a degree of consciousness there. And the other thing, too, is that when you look at the common characteristics of beliefs, like, like you, you can say there's, there's universal, it, it, like there's, there's some universal um, properties there. It's like, is there anyone in this room that does not like to be believed? Do you like to be believed? Does it feel uncomfortable to be disbelieved? You see, this is, this is universal. Uncomfortable to be disbelieved. Regardless of what the belief is, it doesn't feel good. Do we feel more comfortable being around people who share our beliefs? Just naturally feel more comfortable with people who share our beliefs. And uncomfortable around people who what? Don't. So I think there's some, like, some degree of consciousness there. And as a result, I'm saying that beliefs seem to take on a life of their own. And the reason why I state it that way, is that they take on a life of their own, is because we have this capability of thinking in any direction that we, that we choose to. We can think outside of any limitation imposed by any belief. We can draw any bizarre thought we want to our mind and contemplate it. And, and it doesn't matter if, if the conflicting thoughts or conflicting ideas or information is coming from the external environment or coming from our own willingness to think outside the belief. What we'll find is that if we're thinking something that's in conflict with an energy structure that's inside of us, it will do something to protect itself. So one of the characteristics is that beliefs seem to resist any force that, that would alter its present form. <coughs> And they also seem to resist extinction. Now that would make sense, wouldn't it? That beliefs seem to see to resist <laughs> extinction. And why do you think that would make sense? Why would I say that? Anybody got any ideas? Yeah, they don't want to disappear. They don't want to disappear. Okay. Now we don't know why they don't want to disappear. You know, you think, they don't want to die. <laughs> yeah, we don't know why that that might be the case. Other than the fact that we can observe that is probably so. And the, the way that I thought about it was that 
if most people consider what they've learned to believe an inherent part of their identity, and if the sum total of our identity would resist extinction, meaning that if someone threatened us, we'd, we'd fight for our lives, just naturally, right? And not only would we fight for our lives, but, but virtually every war and every conflict throughout the whole history of humanity is based on what? Conflicting beliefs, right? Is that what we're talking about here, conflicting beliefs? Every conflict, every war, every argument is based on simply conflicting beliefs. So if the sum total of who we are would, would resist extinction and fight to stay alive, it just seemed to me that it was, it was OK to infer that the, that the individual parts would too. If the sum total will, so will the individual parts. Meaning that, this is really important, when you're working with your beliefs, fighting your beliefs doesn't work. OK? No matter what you may find in terms of in your mental environment as a belief, and no matter how distasteful you might think having that belief might be, or how dysfunctional, or how it might have messed up your life in some ways that are, that are uh, not very pleasing to you, Directing any negative energy whatsoever towards your beliefs will only cause them to become usually more powerful at the very worst and at the very least fight you back. The only thing that really works in terms of an attitude as far as I know when you're working with your beliefs is complete acceptance. I accept what's there. I understand it. I accept it. And as a result of my acceptance, it allows me to render that belief non-functional. In other words, it makes it easy for me to draw the energy out of it. I can retire it. But if I do something to fight it, it'll fight back. How, how would you fight a belief? I mean, give me an example. Um, <coughs> direct negative energy toward Yeah, just direct negative energy toward I mean, people. Could you give me an example? It's kind of abstract. Fear of snakes. What's that? Trying to convince someone about the fear of a snake. Um, well, and let's see. Uh, well, that's, you know, you're talking about an internal process. Um, and I'll give you a good here. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Uh, I don't. I don't have it with me. It's up in my room. Uh, there's what I was going to. What I was going to do for an example is give you or read to you uh, an exercise that uh, uh, of a trader that I worked with a while back and. Um, one of the things that one of the things that we did, he had a particularly difficult childhood where his father was really abusive, and as a result, it, it, he he ended up acquiring some um, some really troublesome beliefs um, about power and about lying and about not not believing he deserved things. Now, the way, if if for example, if he approached trying to change those beliefs from the perspective of of like. I hate this. I don't want this inside of me any longer. I don't accept this as being me. What you're, what you're going to find is that, is that those beliefs won't be de-energized as a result of taking that kind of an approach. Does that make sense? In other words, in essence, what you're really doing when you, when you fight your beliefs or approach them from a negative perspective, in essence, almost what you're doing is you're denying that they're a part of your identity. And see, once a belief exists, it will, it will always exist. In other words, it will always be a part of who we are. It's just a, the, the, the determining factor is just how much energy is there. 
And so you, what you, when, you, when you're using the techniques that I'm going to give you later on about how to draw the energy out, all I want to do is preface all this with, with, with that you have to be vigilant and careful over the fact that you're doing this from a more accepting and loving perspective as opposed to one where, you know, it would, sure would have been nice if this didn't exist and, uh, and I, you know, or I don't understand it or, uh, you know, I just really want to deny that it's even there and as a result just, you know, just kind of like what people have a technique of kind of shoving things into the back of their minds and they can, they can create some sort of separation between their consciousness and, and, and what they're trying to get rid of and in some ways maybe get some temporary relief but, but ultimately it's just like putting a, you know, putting a uh, kind of an effective band-aid on a wound. It doesn't work. And, and another characteristic is that, is that I, I don't, beliefs, beliefs don't have the power to dismantle themselves. See, once an experience is etched in our memory, it's gonna, whether we remember the, the pathways to that memory or not, it's there. The difference is between whether we can or we can't remember something is just a matter of, you know, just a matter of how many times we've reinforced the memory and, and, and our desire to even remember it in the first place. Because I've found that there are many things that, you know, I just don't pay attention to and as a result, it completely escaped my, in some cases, seemingly escaped my awareness. But when I need the information, it pops into my brain. And it pops into my consciousness, put it that way. So it's there. It's the same way with the belief. Once it, get etched, once it sort of gets etched into our mental environment, it'll, it'll be there forever but it doesn't have to affect us forever. That's the difference. So did I answer your question, John? Okay. Okay, so beliefs seem to naturally resist any force that would alter their present form. They seem to take on a life of their own. They have some degree of conscious awareness. And the next characteristic is all active beliefs demand expression. Now, what does that mean? What do you think that means? All active beliefs demand expression. Act in accordance with your beliefs. Uh, yeah, you will act in accordance with your beliefs, but, but don't think of it in terms of, of the total you. Think of it in terms of the individual beliefs. If I said all active beliefs or any individual belief will demand expression. I mean, first of all, I've got to, I, I use, pay attention to the fact that I used a verb, or, or not a verb, but a, uh, yeah, uh, what would that be, a pro, or an adverb active. It's like, it's like that would imply that we could have active and inactive beliefs, right? Uh, what would be an example of an inactive belief that we've already talked about? Yeah. Santa Claus. That's an inactive belief. It exists in my mind or in yours, but it doesn't have any energy or it doesn't have enough energy to cause, to have any impact whatsoever on our perception of information and our behavior. That's an inactive belief. If it's an active belief, it implies that it has energy. And as such, what I'm saying is that it will demand expression. Now, by saying that, am I implying that all of our active beliefs are swirling around in our brain at any given moment? Just the ones the environment triggers it. Yeah, exactly. Just, just the ones that get triggered. But once they get triggered, if there's energy there, what happens? Our, our consciousness is flooded with whatever, whatever that belief and whatever energy is in that belief, not only in our mind, but in our whole body. Then we experience whatever state of mind corresponds with that belief. And as a result, think that or assume that what we are experiencing is the true reality of the situation. Because keep in mind, that our state of mind is always the absolute truth. Joy is the absolute truth. Satisfaction is the absolute truth. Happiness is the absolute truth. Fear, regret, dissatisfaction, anger, anxiety, betrayal. When we're in it, it's the truth. What may not be the truth is the belief that triggered the state of mind. 
Okay? There, there, there's, a, there's a profound distinction here that I'm making. The state of mind we end up in is the absolute truth. The belief that triggered the state of mind could be completely dysfunctional. So the end result is accurate. Yeah, the end result. Well, yeah, you can't see, you can't deny the fact that you're in a particular state of mind. Right. But the trigger. The trigger may be completely dysfunctional. It's just like, remember the boy and the dog example. As far as the boy is concerned, that dog caused him to experience terror. Was that the truth? No. No. No, and the reason why the reason why he believed that dog causes terror is because of this this instantaneous association that he makes between the similarities in the now moment to the terror and the and the dogs that exist in his mind, which make the two identical. It makes the now moment identical with the memory. Once he's the once the state of mind has been triggered, the terror that he's in is completely real. The belief that got him into the terror is completely dysfunctional. Because all dogs are not dangerous. See, so now that you can, you can make this separation between the actual belief that you may have learned causing the particular state of mind, you can say, hey, you know what? Yeah, the state of mind is definitely real, but you know, if I change my belief about this, I'm going to experience a different state of mind. And that's, and that's in essence what we're getting at. Change your belief and you experience a different state of mind under, under similar circumstances. Do you have the same kind of emotional response? You know, if I, if I, if I said, hey, let's all get out a coin and, and predict the flip of a coin. If you the same kind of emotional response you might have is doing the same thing when you put on a trade? That'd be nice. completely, different. completely different. Why? You're operating out of a different belief. You know why? You know, I know you're operating out of a different belief. You say it's completely different. You're operating out of a belief that the outcome of a coin flip is random. So therefore, all you're doing is guessing, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> right? Now, because you do analysis, because your intellect is involved, with the way you analyze the market, you have associated the fact that you're using your intellect with having to be right. When trading doesn't have anything to do with having to be right. Take trading out of a right or wrong context, put it into the random category in terms of outcomes, and you get the same emotional response as when you flip, predict the flip of a coin. You don't care. Change your belief, your state of mind changes. Did we skip it's a not, step? No. It's not exactly the same. I mean, if you flip the coin, it's probably that they could lose a thousand dollars. If I don't guess it died, my emotions are not going to be the same. No, that's true. When you've got something at stake like that, now I, I, I'm not saying the example is perfect, but you know, I just, I just, just giving you an idea that that. No, I understand, but there, there is a lot more than just being right or wrong. It's a, it's like flipping a coin. It's like a paper trading. A lot of people do well paper trading. Uh, once you put money on the line, then they're not doing as well. Right. But if you believe that you're going to have a thousand flips and it was going to come out even, then who cares anyway? Right? Or if you can accept the risk or whatever it is. You, see, the, the, whole idea, the, whole, the whole idea, Daniel, is to be able to get yourself to the point where you accept the risk and the cost of, what, of, of no, trading. I understand that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. It wasn't a perfect example. You're right. As far as no, the coin I, I wasn't trying to get you on a bad example. Yeah. I'm just trying to say that as a trader, I'm not going to catch all the 55% of that pattern that is going to work. Uh, the money makes me uh, more concerned about my ability to catch every one of the samples that are going to... Every one of the what? I did. Every one of the trades that are going to complete that percentage 
of this pattern. So the money has a lot to do with it. It's, uh, no, I, don't, I, I, I know I, it does. I'm yeah. like explaining myself. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, I understand. You've got to get to the point where the money takes on less significance, where whatever money that you're expending is you're expending as a result of the cost of doing business. So we'll, 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 that's what we're, we'll get into the, that, that more tomorrow. OK, John, you said something about skipping a step? All right. OK. So, so the, the example that I like to use is that uh, in terms of active beliefs demanding expression, when, when the environment triggers something and, our, you know, and it, it floods our consciousness, it's like it wants to come out, doesn't it? And even if we know that we're in a, in a circumstance where it would be best or in our best interest not to express ourselves, it is extremely difficult to hold it back. It goes to your consciousness. What? It goes to your consciousness. Well, what do you mean? It would, it's, okay, you explain yourself a little bit more. Something from the external environment triggers an a active belief, whether you want to express it or not. It goes to your consciousness to think about whether you think it's appropriate to express it or not. Yeah, okay, but, but all I'm saying is that it's difficult to hold it back. And, and what you'd need to hold it back would be another set of beliefs that, that, that let's say, are stronger than that particular belief expressing itself. So the example I use is, let's say, a superior subordinate in a, in a boss-employee employee, employee relationship, you know, where the boss is saying something and the employee completely disagrees, thinks the boss is full of shit, and, but he's nodding his head, yeah, like this, right? But what's going on inside his mind? Is he agreeing? No, he's going like this, no, you're full of shit. But, so, and, it, and, it, and the only thing that's holding him back is a belief that the energy of the belief that says, I can't tell him the truth. I can't be, I can't be candid about what it is that I think about what he's saying. Well, there are some beliefs that you might even, you know, if he said something that was insulting, you might hold not hold it back. So you might sure. different degrees of different degrees. Beliefs. You're absolutely right. The strength might, you know, right. if he said something that smeared me, maybe I would Sure. Do it and there are employees who would who would tell him he's full of shit no matter what. Because that's, you know, that's just what they believe. It's like, I'm going to be candid, and you know, I think the guy's got his head up his butt, I'm going to say so. But interestingly enough, if we hold back, and this is what I really wanted to get to, is if we hold back, what's going to happen? Let's say we did the nod, OK? Hold back. We, we held back expressing it. What's going to happen? It'll build up. It's going to build up and we will find somebody else to unload on, right? <laughs> the next person that comes into, you know, our, again, our field of awareness that we feel that it's possible to unload on, that's exactly what we're going to do. The point that I'm making, of course, is that if it's an active belief, it gets triggered, it demands to be expressed. Now, there are some really powerful implications here. These are the implications that have to do with self-sabotaging beliefs as we start accumulating more and more money as traders. And some of these beliefs, like I said, we're, we're not even aware of any longer. There are things that we were taught years ago that seemingly don't have anything to do with our lives up until we get to the point where we start accumulating a lot of money and find ourselves doing some really, you know, making some really ridiculous trading errors that we may have left behind years ago or a long time ago. Because the more money that we're making causes those beliefs about our sense of self-valuation to start demanding to be expressed. Because here's the problem. I don't think anybody really grows up with, and maybe Gil Bill Gates might be an exception, but it goes, grows up with an un, what it means to have an unlimited sense of self-valuation. In other words, we seem to be taught inherent limits about what we think we're worth. And whatever those limits are, once we hit them as traders, because it can come real fast, it will cause those beliefs about what we're worth to demand to be expressed. 
And see, the problem is they don't have to be specific beliefs. What I mean by that is that what I found is that there are, can be any number of beliefs that fall into a category, a generalized category of, I simply don't deserve. And it kind of works like this. If you were to inventory, if you were to inventory every experience in your life that was positive, and let's say contributed to a positive sense of self-valuation, where you feel worthy, where it made you feel worthy, and all the experiences in your life that contributed to a negative sense of self-valuation, what you would end up with is a net sense of self-valuation, meaning if you balanced all the positive energy against all the negative energy, you would come up, let's say, net positive, net negative, or neutral. The problem is that if you're net negative, of course, it's going to be very difficult to accumulate money. And the, the other problem is a lot of these experiences may not specifically have been, let's say, directed toward a sense of self-valuation, but if they were painful experiences, either both physically or emotionally, many times what ends up happening is that, especially as children, these experiences get put into this broad, generalized category where, let's say, a parent might say, oh, you know, you, you, you hurt yourself, you fell, you skinned your knee you, or your elbow or whatever, and your mother just told you not to do that. She says, look, see, God punished you. And so then what happens is that what you do is start associating as a child every time that something like that happens with, oh, God punished me, and then the next step is, if God's punishing me, then I must not be a worthy person. So then every negative experience can get categorized, can, I'm not saying it does, but every negative experience has the potential to get categorized into a broad, broad, let's say, category of, I must be an undeserving person, or this wouldn't have happened to me. So this can be problematic as traders. And, and other than the, let's say, inability to not think in probabilities causing trading errors, this is the thing that, that is most responsible for these kind of, uh, you know, doing all the hard work and doing really good and following your rules and being disciplined and, and everything you need to do and all of a sudden you just whack yourself. And you start the process over again and whack yourself again. Sense of self-valuation coming in saying, you, you don't deserve this. Remember, all beliefs demand expression. All beliefs seem to take on a life of their own. And regardless of whether or not your desire is to keep on going up like this indefinitely, if your sense of self, total sense of self-valuation doesn't correspond with any particular level, wherever it is, then it, it will find a way to express itself on your consciousness meaning how you see the market, what you, and I'm not going to, you know, yeah, absolutely, sure there is, Jeff. <laughs> the upsell tapes up. Yeah, that's, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the next workshop. <laughs> so, so are we, you know, are we kind of, is everyone together on this? It's, it's all kind of coming together for you a little bit? Okay. And the last characteristic on page four is that beliefs keep on working whether we remember them or not. I've kind of already mentioned this. We do not have to have a conscious recollection of what it is that we've ever believed or learned to believe. The only determining factor as to whether or not a belief has potential to act on your, your perception of information and your behavior is if it has energy. If there's energy, it gets triggered. You don't even have to know, you, know, you really consciously don't even have to know what's going on at all. 
your behavior can be a complete mystery. You can even be conscious of your behavior being a complete mystery in the moment and be watching yourself screw up and still be powerless to do it. I'm sure maybe everyone in this room has had the experience of, experience of being in a situation, especially as traders, where you knew you were doing, doing something inappropriate. You virtually knew almost, yeah, I'd say you knew consciously you were going to lose, but that you were losing and you were literally sort of like outside of yourself watching the market take your money away and virtually powerless to do anything about it until something else got triggered in your mind where you finally blew out of the trade. Anybody not have that experience? You don't have to know where that behavior is coming from for it to happen. You don't even have to understand it. You don't have to have any understanding of it any knowledge of it, it's just going to happen. Until you do get knowledge of it, till you do understand it and do something about it if you want. <coughs> there was a guy I worked with at Merrill Lynch back in the early 80s that went out and left Merrill Lynch and went on to be a uh, floor trader at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in the uh, S&P pit. And he was a really devout person, devout religiously. And one of the, we used to have conversations a lot, and this is before I really even became a coach, but we used to have conversations a lot about, about what I felt was an inherent conflict between him wanting to be a successful trader and his, and his religious beliefs. And he just refused to believe that there was a conflict there. And he was down on the floor for quite a while, and he was a one-lot trader, one and twos. And he barely eked out a living. I mean, you know, maybe he'd make a tick a day, you know, 50 bucks, or I mean, or not, I mean, uh, uh, well, not maybe a tick a day. I mean, maybe like a quarter of a point a day or a half a point a day, like 50 bucks a day or $75 or something like that. And, and um, then he got on a, on, a, on a bit of a winning streak and started, started accumulating some money. And... He was in the pit one day and literally snapped. And by the time, and back then, where, where, where you didn't have to turn in your cards on the kind of frequent basis, where floor traders, you know, they got their trading cards, they, they record their trades. Now they have to turn them in, like, you know, practically every five minutes or something. But I don't know what it is. But there, you, they turned them in at the end of the day. Well, he was in the S&P pit. He had, like, on, I don't know, he had two or 300 contracts on. And by the time somebody from the clearing firm found out about it, you know, he'd lost about a million five dollars. About a million five, I mean. It just, the conflict got to the point where he just literally snapped. He just kept putting on a larger and larger losing position until, until he forced himself out of the business to do something that he really, to do something else, which he was really a good college professor, and that's what he went back to doing, and, you know, and, and there was no conflict. Well, Mark, would you clarify something? Please? Sure. I think, I think you suggested that as you uh, de-energize the old beliefs, mm -hmm. they drop into subconsciousness. So no, I didn't say that. No, that, and that's not what I'm saying there either. What I'm saying is that, is that beliefs can exist at, at two different levels. They can, they can, you can be consciously aware of your beliefs, okay? And they can drop down to a sub -level, sub, subconscious level of operation. <coughs> and, and the best way that I, that I have of explaining that is, that is using driving as an example. Things that we learn typically do drop down to a subconscious level of operation, which basically frees our consciousness up to do other things to pay attention to other things, what's going on in the environment, to learn, it, to learn something else, as a matter of fact. So for an example, what I noticed when I was in college, and you know, and people would drink a lot, is that there were, there were times where, you know, not only did I observe people driving completely drunk, but even myself, where I got from point A to point B and had no conscious recollection whatsoever of, of how I got there. Totally unconscious. Now, you know, I'm not saying the distance was great, but the point is, is that something must have been an operation that caused me to be able to drive that car to do what I did without having any, con having any conscious awareness of it. 
the skills that we learn do drop down to an, unlevel, an unconscious level so that we can pay attention to other things. So that when you're teaching somebody how to drive, like the first example or the first opportunity that I ever had in my life to do that, of course, the first thing you realize is all the things you take for granted. It's like, you know, there's, there's a lot to driving. That's so when you try to teach a, a 15 or 16 year old how to drive, it's like there's all kinds of skills that they don't have. They don't, you know, the coordination between steering wheel and brakes and, and looking out the mirrors and everything else like that. It's like there's a lot of things they need to learn. But once they all, once they all get learned, like I said, they just drop down and they operate at that level. Now, what I think that for, the, for as many people as probably drive, drunk in at any given moment in our society or any society the reason why there aren't even more accidents than what there are is because our skills do operate whether we're conscious of them or not but what ends up happening is that if the circumstances require a conscious decision that's when other than someone falling asleep that's when someone's going to get into an accident is because they don't have the decision making capacity to react fast enough or even make the appropriate decision but if the circumstances are relatively normal, then you know you can virtually drive unconscious. That's even scarier. <laughs> That's right. So, so then, what we hope to get <coughs> new tricks, new I, I beliefs that are so energized that even in our subconscious, they all night. Yeah, they automatically work. It doesn't matter where they reside. It doesn't matter if they reside consciously or subconsciously. It just doesn't matter. That's an, that, as far as I'm concerned, this, this dichotomy between conscious and subconscious is, is pretty much uh, sort of man-made anyway. I don't really believe there has to be any kind of separation between conscious and subconscious. If you want access to this information, you can have it. There are any number of techniques available to get access to whatever information you know, exists in what psychologists or psychiatrists call your subconscious mind. It's really just a function of desire and, and a willingness to ask questions. That's all it really is. And you can do this to the extent that you virtually erase this, this, this boundary. I think it's, like I said, an artificial boundary between conscious and subconscious. Like I said before, it's really a matter of what you believe. If you believe you can have access to all this, then, you, then you'll get access to it. If you don't believe it, you won't. Whether you believe it or not believe it, you're right. In both ways, it's going to, either way, it's going to work. If you believe it's possible, it's going to work. If you believe it isn't possible, it's going to work. You're going to be right in both circumstances. So some of the techniques that we're going to go over have to do with learning how to get access to some of this information if you feel it's warranted and necessary. And like I said last night, if you don't want access to it, but you do think that there is a possibility that, you know, there are beliefs that reside in your subconscious that uh, would have a negative effect on your ability to accumulate money, then you're going to have to compensate in the way that you trade. And basically that compensation is going to be you're going to have to trade mechanically. You're going to have to, you're going to have to make sure that the only thing you do has very rigid rules so that you can make a clear distinction between what your rules say to do and what you might feel compelled to do as a result of self-sabotage so that you can make that you, it is very clear in your mind what's happening in that moment because you know that anytime the first moment you start noticing that you want to break a rule that what you know that probably what's happening is that you've got some sort of subconscious beliefs that are acting on your perception of information and your behavior and you know you can either refocus or not trade You, are you guys, you're not getting overwhelmed, are you? Oh, okay, good. How do you find out which, you know, the subconscious beliefs? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a, no, that's the next one. Again, that, that, that's also the next seminar, okay? <laughs> what time is it? 2.25. Okay.
Wait, so let's see where we're at right here. Okay, we're almost through this. Um, I'm on page six. I've already talked about what the truth is. What is the truth? How do we determine what the truth is? Whatever works. What's that? I like this because if you go to the market every day and you say anything can happen, and I can be right every single day. That's <laughs> if right. Anything can happen. If I believe that, it doesn't matter what happens, then I'm right because that's that's just what is. That's right. See, you're you're going to be right every day because as long as I believe that something is going to happen, anything can happen or something is going to happen, I'm always right. I'm, I'm never wrong. <laughs> but it's the truth. I'm expecting something to happen and I'm never wrong. Well, if you're making money, you're not going to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But at least I don't have this, but at least I've taken away this potential to define and interpret information in a painful way. My expectation is always being fulfilled. And that's exactly what you want to do. You want to, you, your expectations, you want your expectations to correspond with the realities from the market's perspective, from the characteristics of the market, from the, from the market's perspective. The market can do anything. And regardless of what pattern may, it may be presenting in any given moment, the outcome could be anything, right? So therefore, it can do anything. I expect it to do something. The only thing that where I'd be disappointed is if it dead just dead stopped. Okay? That that would not conform to my expectation. Other than that, unless it just stops, I'm right. And see, I've also taken away any responsibility towards or being responsible for what the market does. I am not responsible for what the market does. The market can do anything. All I need to do is be responsible for what I do, how I perceive things. Am I in an, in an objective state of mind? Am I executing my trades without hesitation or internal conflict? Am I making errors? Am I following my plans? Do I have a plan? Why am I here? That's right. Why am I here? <laughs> okay, so we know what the truth is, right? The environment can express itself in an infinite combination of ways, but beliefs limit our ability to perceive the environment from, in, from, the, from a, let's say, a, uh, from the perspective of it being able to express itself in an infinite combination of ways, then the only way we can really measure the truth is within the context of what we're trying to accomplish in any given moment. Now keep in mind, we're, we're, we're determining what the truth is based on what am I trying to accomplish in this moment? What am I trying to accomplish? Well. Well, yeah, ultimately, but you know, that's good to make money, but keep in mind something, John, okay? You want to keep money as a byproduct. What you're trying to accomplish are acquiring skills, okay? Acquiring skills will, will make money a byproduct of whatever skills you've acquired, as opposed to focusing on the money. So the truth is relative to what am I trying to accomplish and do my beliefs correspond with the, the characteristics and properties of the environment that I'm operating in at any given moment. What are you going to say, Louis? Mark said that I'm making money wasn't our goal. Our goal is to be in the zone, and then money will come to be in the zone. Right. That's for sure. Use money as an objective. Ultimately, it can be an objective. No, that's not really true because no. we can set we can set money goals. That's we absolutely have to, yeah. An occupation, you have to have some. You know, it's like Tony Robbins says, if you sit there and meditate all day, they'll suddenly take you out on your sofa because you haven't paid your bills. That's before. right. <laughs> so there has to be a certain level of financial stability to the occupation. Otherwise, right. acquiring skills and scratching every trade. Well, you're acquiring skills. I'm assuming you're not scratching every trade. No, I'm saying yeah. but the, at the very end of the day. Yeah, I agree. I, right? You're right. Because you can't. I, that's, the way I keep, that's the way I keep score. I love keeping score. Right. I do. I just, you know, I really do. 
you still be focusing on money in the long run, but not necessarily. At yeah, home. that's yeah. You're absolutely right. In other words, you can set money goals for yourself. You can set even daily goals or weekly goals. As long as as long as you have these goals, um, how do I put it? Um, Say. Setting goals, setting goals as traders, financial goals as traders can, can be tricky. It really can. Because the reason why I say that is because it's easy to get to get ourselves inordinately focused on the money itself, as opposed to the process that leads to the money. Normally what I do when we talk about financial goals is just say set the goal, focus on it, maybe meditate on it for three or four minutes, see your see your account at that level, whatever, whatever your goal is, and, and whatever time frame it's in, and then just let it go. And just trust that, that whatever, whatever needs to be done and whatever you need to see to get to that goal will, will happen without focusing on the goal itself other than in that moment when you're, when you're putting it out there. Did that make sense to everybody? Okay, so I said that the truth, we determine the truth based, you know, relative to what we're trying to accomplish in any given moment, and that the truth is what works. If we experience satisfaction, it works. If we don't, to whatever degree we don't, then whatever beliefs we're operating out of, we're not necessarily the truth in those, in that, under those circumstances in that situation.